Second World Chapter 351, Strategy Planning What kind of bullshit is this? Samuel exclaimed. You think just by occupying a position will yield us victory? Did you not realize that we are currently in a desert? Anywhere is just the same here. The Duke waved for him to be quiet, he then said to John, Can you explain the reason? Considering the orcs are already situated at our southwestern side, if we place ourselves here, they would move toward us and came to us facing northeast. We just needed to shift our position a bit to make sure they were facing east instead. Added with their tendency to have an honorable battle, I reckon if we face one side, they will align themselves to face us in a straight line. So it is imperative that we move out before them and assume our formation at this position before the sun is up. Afterward, we just wait for them to come, do not engage them before they are close. What's so special about this position? Commander Quintus asked. The wind and the sun, John answered. The others were still confused by it but the commander seemed to grasp something from it. Trust me, just arrange your men there and you will see the benefit. All right, I will do so, the commander replied. Samuel was surprised by the commander's approval. He quickly protested, Commander. Are you sure? It's our lives that are on the line here. How can you risk it just based on this ambiguous outworlder's suggestion? The commander has the final say in terms of our placement, you will do as is instructed. The duke reprimanded. Yes, your grace, Samuel lowered his head from the admonition. John was not affected by the protest, he continued, now this position might get us an initial benefit, but it will not provide us with a decisive victory. To do that, we need to strike the enemy's essential part. Which is? Their supplies, John answered. The desert is a harsh place. Impossible to acquire resources for a large army, if we take down their supplies, they will have no choice but to retreat. The commander shook his head. That's easier said than done. The resources will always be placed at the back. Before we can reach there, we would have been annihilated. That's why we will send small shock troops to circle around their back for a sneak attack. Are you dumb or something? This is a desert, the enemy will see you coming from a mile back. Samuel exclaimed. Still unfazed by the insult, John said, that's why I asked the army to place their position here. Apart from the elements which I mentioned earlier, there is another reason. Which is? These sand dunes, John pointed to a series of wavy landscapes on the map not far from where he had requested for the army to position the troops. A small contingent of troops can hide behind these sand dunes as they make their way to the opponent's rear. Other places will be too flat, but this place here provides enough coverage for a sneak attack. Commander Quintus reviewed the map while mumbling to himself, he seemed to be deep in thoughts. John did not let him think for long though, he continued, however, in order to assure the success of this sneak attacks, we will need to do one other thing. Which is? Lure the tiger off its mountain lair. The others simultaneously gave confused expressions. Noticing their faces, Jack quickly explained, I'm sorry, this guy likes to pretend to be a poet. It is just an idiom from our world. It means luring the dangerous opponents away from their positions. Exactly. John exclaimed. The shock troops will not be able to destroy the supply safely if the high-level leaders are still on standby. They will provide supports once the shock troops reveal themselves. Which is why I said this sneak attack is stupid, Samuel said. Which is why I need you to shut your mouth. John finally did not ignore the insults any longer. Samuel was stunned by the sudden outburst. Did all outworlders possess such bravado? Did they not realize how weak they are? He could send this low-level outworlder to death with one slap. John returned to address the others, now, in order to ensure the success of our sneak attack, we would need to trouble the ones around this table here. We? Commander Quintus asked. What do you want us to do? Reverse that custom where the powerful leaders fight later. I will need you to call out their strongest fighters to engage you all, 
so that the rear line is left unguarded. Try calling for a duel, since they value honor so much, I doubt they will reject such a challenge. This. Commander Quintus was hesitant. If we all go out to fight, the army would have no one in command. If something happened, the troops will have difficulty responding. That's easy, John said. Just transfer the command to me. You. Preposterous. This is going out of line. Samuel declared. I agree, you are getting out of hand, Lucia said. Halt, Commander Quintus said. Commander, you are not thinking. Although there are still many parts that need to be discussed in detail, I think we can try this strategy, Commander Quintus said. But, Commander. Do you have a better idea against this enemy that outnumbers us? The commander cut Samuel's protest. I. What about if we focus our strength to defeat the warlord? Samuel suggested. Killing the chief of an army will usually cause the enemy's morale to drop and thus ensure us a victory. We can trick him into a duel and then we find a chance to deal a killing blow together. Amazing, I never thought you can think of such a despicable plan, John said. But stupid though. You. Don't you slander me just because I oppose your plan. Mine had a better chance to succeed. Succeed my ass. Killing the chief might ensure victory if the enemy's soldiers only follow this warlord due to profits or fear. But from what Stormwind described to me just now, this warlord is an influential leader with many loyal supporters. I bet most of his soldiers are loyal to him. If you kill him in front of them, and even in such a dishonorable manner to speak of, you will not get a demoralized enemy army. You will instead get an enraged army that is bound on revenge. At that time, even if we destroyed their supplies, they will still doggedly come at us until either one of us perishes. Samuel wanted to retort, but he realized the truth in John's words. He lowered his head reluctantly. All right, if no one has any better idea, we will follow John's plan. However, for the dual part, Captain Salem and Lieutenant Bailey will not be joining. Captain Salem will take over the command of the army on behalf of me, with John as the advisor. Lieutenant Bailey of course will stay as the prince's protector. John shrugged. No problem, but I will need the full control of the shock troops. You want to join the ambushing team? Commander Quintus asked. Hell, no. I will leave that dangerous jobs to the less important persons. I will need 480 soldiers for the shock troops, which will be divided into 24 small teams with 20 soldiers each. I want them to be assigned to each of the 24 outworlders apart from me as their leaders. This way I will be able to command them directly using our special communication means. The heck, so I am considered as one of the less important persons. Jack thought with annoyance. Why do you need to command them directly? Things might change during the battle, and they will have little time to destroy as much of the enemy's supplies before reinforcement arrived. I'm sure once the enemy found out about the shock troops, a large portion of the frontline army will be pulled back. These 24 teams will operate separately to target as many supplies as possible in their limited time. They will need fast information to know where to strike for the most efficient ambush. All right, we will do as you say, Commander Quintus said. Commander, if we send out 480 soldiers, we will only have 2,520 soldiers to defend against over 6,000 enemy troops. I don't think that will be wise, Nicholas said. Not 2,520. We will defend with only 2,000 soldiers. John replied. What? I will need around 500 soldiers for another thing. That is insane. We will be fighting an enemy three times our numbers then. Don't worry. If you put the army in the position I advised, we will have no problem fighting such a number. At least for a few hours of time. This. We have agreed to use his plan, might as well follow it to the letter, Commander Quintus said. I have a request. Prince Alonso suddenly spoke out. Chapter 352, Preparation for War 
What is it, my prince? Duke Alfredo asked. I want to join the shock troops team, the prince answered. Out of the question. The duke rejected immediately. Such operation is too dangerous. Your safety will be at stake. Didn't you say that this expedition is for me to learn? This will be the perfect chance for me to learn. No. The duke was adamant. Sorry, prince, I can't agree as well, John said. If something wrong were to happen, I can't afford to be distracted to keep you safe. I need to prioritize the success of this mission, so I can only send disposable people on this mission. Number at number asterisk, Jack wanted to curse out. You need to stay with the main troops, Commander Quintus added. The orcs might know you are here if it was true their information came from the other princes. You might even be the primary target of the orcs, so you must stay safe. I even need to add more bodyguard details to be with you at all times. Bailey alone is enough, Prince Alonso said. Unwanted things might happen, I will assign more people for your protection. Suddenly a voice came from the side, allow me. It will be my honor to protect the prince. Jack turned to the voice and found that he recognized this soldier. It was Ronnie, who had come to him with the odd request in Thieswell. This guy was still trying to get close to the prince? What was his angle? Jack wondered. Jack had detected that he was lying when he made the request, but he was not sure which part the lie indicated. Probably he lied about his desire for the prince's safety, perhaps he was just trying to befriend the prince to promote his career. I can vouch for him, he had been following me for some while, Samuel said. His family is also a strong supporter of the prince. Commander Quintus looked at Ronnie, he was the aide from Samuel's side. All right, Bailey will pick the remaining bodyguards. When the Duke and I are absent, these bodyguards should never leave the prince's side. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Bailey affirmed. Commander Quintus turned to John. Let us talk more in detail about your plan. Jack was bored as they were discussing the details on the preparation, timing, and positioning of the troops. He just stood there helplessly. He wished he could practice his spell formation here, rather than wasting time in boredom like this. But the ones in front of him were big shot NPCs, so he did what he had asked from John, he behaved himself. He ended up chatting with Peniel about trivial matters. None of the military talks were entering his ears. He only took notice on the few occasions where John and Samuel butted heads. Afterward, he zoned out again. After a torturously long time, the 3D projection was shut down and everybody finally seemed to be leaving. Jack happily bid everyone farewell as he walked out with John. He said to him, You seem to be enjoying the discussion just now. I did, John replied. And you seem to be awfully not in sync throughout the discussion. Is it that obvious? It is, the Duke even felt bad about it and was about to dismiss you. Then why didn't he? I told him not to. You look to be so in peace in your reverie, so I think you would want to be left alone. You are the one to be left alone, you bugger. You know how bored I am inside there. John chuckled at his response. Don't worry will be plenty of action tomorrow morning. Not considering the guy's irritating attitude, Jack was again impressed by his ability to provide a plan that could move even those big-shot NPCs. He said, that was very impressive of you. You just took a look at the 3D map one time and you knew already exactly where the troops are to be placed. It's good that you are impressed with me, but I have known where to place the troops before I entered the tent. Hey? How do you know without looking at the map? It's always better to look at the real thing. What do you think I have been doing for the few hours since we started camping? Jack remembered now that John had not been around the camp. He had strolled off with two soldiers borrowed from Captain Salem. You have been surveying the terrain. He asked. You think? There is no need to be sarcastic, Jack said. How do you think I know where the wind blows at that spot otherwise? John then said in a serious tone, 
we will need to get everybody up to speed since we will be departing very early tomorrow before the sun was up. We will have to organize everything today before we rest. The commander gave me the right to choose any soldiers for the 480 shock troops. So I will go and sort out the soldiers, it would need some proportion of tank, melee, ranged, and healer in each team. You go and inform the others while I do that. When they arrived at where the players camped, Jack called for everyone to assemble as John went to assemble the soldiers. Jack told them about the plan to raid the supply at the enemy's rear line, and that each of them will head a team. They were rather anxious to be put in charge of a team, but Jack assured them all they need to do was pay attention to party messages and gave direction to the soldiers based on John's instruction. They were still nervous when John came with the assortment of soldiers, as they would be heading to the enemy's back, far away from the rest of the Allies. With their low-level state, they could easily get killed. John picked up from there and said to them, There is no need to be worried. The soldiers will keep you safe. You will be at the center of the team. When there is fighting, the soldiers will be the ones that do the fighting. You just need to make sure you give them the direction I send to you in the chat message. Trust in me, I will pick a route that prioritizes your safety. You can take Stormwind here as an example, he will also be heading one team. If he didn't feel that it is safe, he wouldn't have done it. Jack looked at him, he wanted to kick this guy. Who said before that he will be prioritizing the success of the mission and will only send disposable people? He was practically lying to them blatantly and using him as a guarantor some more. Jack did not expose John's lie as he knew the importance of this mission. However, he was also not that heartless to give them a complete lie, so he added, Still, things might go wrong no matter how well we planned, so everyone should make sure that you wear the amulet of rebirth at all times during the mission. Unnecessary, but you can wear it for an extra sense of security, John proclaimed. The urge to kick the guy returned. John then assigned each of them to a collection of 20 soldiers he had sorted out. Each team roughly consisted of a composition of five heavy armor melee soldiers with shields, five medium armored melee soldiers, two mage soldiers, five archer soldiers, and three healer soldiers. All of them were around level 35 to 40, and each team had a squad leader which was elite grade with a level of at least 45. This batch of soldiers was above average in the army. Since the shock troops would be cut off from the rest of the army, they would need to be strong enough to handle themselves, the commander had basically given him the cream of the crop. All the melee soldiers were equipped with blunt weapons, like hammer or mace. Such a weapon gave more effective damage to the supplies. While the archers were equipped with flaming arrows. The mage and healer units were only for supports, that was why there were only a small number of them in the team. Each of these soldiers was also given better mounts. This was one of the details that John discussed in the war meeting. The shock troops needed high HP mounts as they would need high mobility. They would continue to use their mounts even when enemies attacked. Only until they reached the supplies that they unsummoned their mounts, hence the mounts would need to be able to weather some damages. For the player themselves, they kept using the mounts that were loaned to them. Since they would be at the heart of the team, it would be unlikely for their mounts to receive attacks. John also assigned alphabets to each team and asked everyone to memorize them. He was not going to call out names as it would take too long. At first, he was thinking about dividing the map into grids and asked the players to memorize the grid numbers, but then he looked at the man's team. Remembering the past fiasco, he told them he would be giving them directions following clock bearing as was used in their world's military. After making sure that everyone was familiar with their own teams, and that everyone knew what they needed to do tomorrow, John dismissed everyone and told them to rest early. They would need to be in their best condition very early tomorrow. Chapter 353, Dawn of War Early in the dawn before the sun rose, the human army marched and claimed the position that had been determined the day before. The scouts that were sent by the orcs to monitor the human army movement immediately reported this development to their main camp. Warlord Abasai who received this report snickered. The human was much more agitated to make their move this early, he said. 
he was also in the process of organizing his troops and was just about to have them set out. His aide, Badu Thick Skull, a level 55 special elite, asked, Are they probably trying some kind of trick? The humans are known for their deceits and schemes. Humph, whatever tricks there is, we will crush them under the strength of the orcs. The warlord exclaimed. His words drew a chorus of recognition from the nearby soldiers. He went to a large wooden podium and addressed the ready troops. Orcs. Today we will spill the human's blood and claim honor to our tribe. Every one of you has followed me through numerous battles and I know for a fact that each of you is a courageous warrior. Any human you fells will bring honor to your family and ancestor. The one that managed to capture or kill the human prince, will receive a bountiful reward. Now, let us go and bring glory to our nation. The Sea of Orcs made a concurrent roar upon the speech. The resulting roar was so loud that it could be heard from miles away. Jack and the others turned westward as they heard the roar. That's the sound of our enemy. Bowler asked. Sounds like a lot of them. Stop being a chicken and go to your position, John told him. Jack looked at the landscape, everything was still dark, and it was cold, completely in contrast to the heat when the sun was in the sky. He gazed to the faraway land where their enemy was supposed to be coming from, and said to John, By the way, how will you give us instruction? I mean, we will be very far away at the enemy's back. How will you be able to see us so far in the distance? Even with his dragon's eye skill, he was still struggling to see too far away. John answered him by taking out something from his inventory bag. That's... Jack was astonished to look at the thing in John's hand. It was binoculars. Where do you get that? He asked. What do you mean where? I bring it from the tutorial world. Binoculars were a handy tool, I even wonder why none of you bother to bring one. It can still work. Jack remembered his handphone had turned into junk when the world changed. Of course it can still work. It was just a couple of lenses that let us see distant objects, why won't it work? Jack took the tool from his hand and tried to see through it. He could indeed see distant things. John snatched it back from his hand. He said, now go, while the dark still conceals your movement. You need to hide with the others before this pitched battle started. Don't let those orc scouts see you, or everything will be ruined. Pitched battle. John looked at him as if he had asked a dumb question, and answered, it's the definition for a battle where the two opposite sides agree on the time and place of combat. Though in our case, only the time. Now, go. Jack knew the importance of this operation, so he did not postpone it any longer. He walked by foot far to the side from where the army had taken position, behind one of the large sand dunes amongst the many others around this place. The twenty soldiers under him were already hiding there. The other team was hiding at the other sand dunes. The plan was for them to move separately as they made their way to the enemy rear line, from one sand dunes to the others for cover. They would start moving once the armies clashed, when the enemy's attention was focused on the troops they were facing. Jack laid down on the sand as he waited. Before long, his god eye monocle showed a cloud of red appearing at the edge of his radar. The orcs were already considered hostile by his radar since the war declaration was made. He must say, seeing the tightly packed dots forming a solid red cloud was rather intimidating. He crawled to the edge of the sand dune and lifted his head to take a peek. He could see the large cloud of dust even under the dark sky. To be able to create a cloud that large would be a number that he had not yet witnessed before, except maybe in those epic war movies from his real world. And he could be sure this time, that this dust cloud was not made using tricks. He could hear the heavy sounds of hoof steps next. The sound kept on getting louder as the shadows that created it were getting closer. The rumble was as if the sound of thunder, which was rare in this desert region, as it signified that rain was coming. The rumble soon came to a stop as the shadows stopped advancing. The dawn was giving way to the morning as a line of red was seen on the horizon behind the human army. The little light dispelled the darkness and allowed the shadows not far away to reveal their true forms. 
Rows and rows of orcs, each as ugly as the one after it, were seen in an unending line. There were so many of them that it was difficult to see where their formation ended. Even from the first sight under his hiding place, Jack could see that they far outnumbered the army on their side. Could John really defend their assault with just 2,000 soldiers? It took some time for that many orcs to come to a stop into a neat formation. Not long after that, a portion of the orc army came forward. He could see the one in the lead. It was a larger orc than the rest, which was already larger than a standard human. Jack estimated this one might stand three meters tall, or more. He was riding a large lizard creature, unlike the rest who were riding large jackals. He must be that warlord of Asai Rare Tooth that everybody had mentioned. Humans. This lead orc bellowed. The time of reprieve was at its end. Whether you are ready or not, prepare for battle. Today let us honor our ancestors and decide who amongst us that will bring glory back to our countries. The orc army started roaring, accompanied by the sounds of drums. Did they really bring drums to war? Jack wondered after hearing the sounds. The warlord lifted his hand and made a sign. The front column of his army came forward in an orderly fashion. They had unsummoned their mounts. They walked steadily at a uniform pace towards the human army that was holding their formation. John who saw the enemy army coming, looked behind him at the sun that was getting higher, and felt the air that was blowing from behind. He then said to everyone, hold the line, let them come. The ones in hiding were getting agitated. John sent them a message in party chat to wait. They waited as they peeked from their hiding place and saw columns and columns of orc soldiers marching in the distance. The gap between the marching orcs with the human army was getting shorter with each of the orcs' steps. They could see the orcs huffed and grimaced, the orcs queerly displayed excited expressions in the coming confrontation. When the two armies were less than a hundred meters from each other, some of the orcs finally could not contain their eagerness anymore and started to sprint out of formation. Many and many started to follow until the entire marching army turned into a speeding army, they brandished their weapons and waved them around as they bellowed excitedly. Their combined running steps churned out a large cloud of dust into the air. The players in hiding could not help but feel their hair stood on end. They were going to fight against this race of lunatic beasts. The human soldiers, however, did not react to such a show of battle lust. They had perfectly accustomed to their opponents' traits. Their armies had been clashing in past occasions after all. When the advancing orcs hit the 50-meter mark distance, John finally gave the sign. Commander Quintus followed suit and gave the command to his army. The human army rushed forward in a formation. Their running march was no less powerful than the orcs. Each step was a thunderous rumble that caused the sand in the ground to get thrown into the air. Due to the wind that was blowing from the back, the dust that was blown upward followed the human army's march, creating the effect that a sandstorm was following their march. Chapter 354, Provocations for Duels Both the human and orc army divided their armies into four sections. Center vanguard, left wing, right wing, and reserve. The one that had moved out to clash was the center vanguard from both armies. When the two vanguard armies clashed, the sand cloud that followed the human army also slammed into the orc army, while the sand cloud caused by the orc army was blown further back as the wind was blowing westward in this area. Since the orcs were facing against the wind, the sand hit their eyes and caused them a short term of blindness. The human army capitalized on their enemy's sudden loss of visibility and get the first strike. Even after the orcs had removed the sand and managed to open their eyes, another wave of sand cloud hit them again as the wind continued to blow. John had instructed the rear part of the advancing vanguard to keep moving to churn the sand up into the air. On sparse occasions when the orcs' eyes were spared from the sand harassment, they were blinded by the morning sun. Even the orc archers and mages at the back were having difficulty as the sunlight was shining right into their eyes. Even though the orc vanguard numbered twice more than the humans, they were forced into a passive state. Not giving quarter, John advised the commander who then commanded the right wing to advance and flank the orc troops. 
the already passive orc vanguard was given more pressure with the addition of the human army's right-wing troops. Seeing his vanguard army at such a disadvantage, warlord Abashi frowned. His aide, an overseer rank named Badu Thixkull, said, the human had picked an advantageous position. Warlord Abashi harumphed, I never expected for them to be able to work out the most suitable location under such a short time in this foreign terrain, and used the elements against us. I have truly underestimated them. Send both the wings out. Tell them to do their best to avoid facing directly to the east. John used his binoculars to keep tabs on the orcs' remaining army. What's that? Commander Quintus asked. Magic eyes, John replied wantonly. They are finally getting serious. Have the left wing intercept theirs. You, the Duke, and the others should get ready soon. Due to the battle took place close to where the human army's original position was, it took the orc left and right wing some time to get to the battlefield. Commander Quintus commanded their left wing to intercept the enemy's right wing. While the human right wing which was harassing the orc's vanguard broke off and engaged the orc's left wing. Both the human left and right wing were already drilled to always position themselves so as the enemy would always face east. With how crude the orcs were fighting, they had trouble escaping from getting blinded by the sand and the sun, as the human army had already occupied the advantageous position. Unless the orcs decided to disengage completely and maneuver in a large circling route, it would be difficult for them to resolve their current disadvantages. Still, the orcs outnumbered the humans by more than twice, and their ferociousness was not affected even with the disadvantages. Hence, the warlord had his army continued to push forward. When John saw that the orcs' attention was fully on the battlefield, he at last, gave Jack and the others the command to begin. Jack and the others started to creep forward stealthily. They moved slowly and separately in small teams and without mount, to avoid creating dust clouds that would betray their positions. They had been using dust clouds in their tactics, it would be ironic if the same dust cloud became the thing that ruined their plan. They moved from one sand dune to another, making sure that they were always under cover. Their progress was excruciatingly slow, while the battle between the armies continued to rage on. In conjunction with the advancing of the shock troop teams, the Duke and the others began to take action. Captain Salem was left with John to command the army as they made their way forward. They rode on their mounts as they cut straight through the battlefield. Some orc soldiers thought they had found some easy targets who had broken off from the human soldiers and wandered too deep into their line. They immediately went over to besiege these stragglers. While they were on their way, happily thinking about the glory they could claim from these easy targets. One of these easy targets started to form a spell formation. A magic caster? This revelation made them unconsciously slow down their advance. But after seeing their own numbers, their confidence was reaffirmed and they put on pace again. Some of their own mages also started to prepare their spells. To their consternation, the runes in the spell formation continued to add until there were five of them. At this time, they finally realized this group was not stragglers that had accidentally blundered into their ranks. However, it was already too late. The spell took effect as hundreds of magic spears shot out and impaled the surrounding orcs. A large portion of the ones hit by the spell was killed upon impact. The rests who were lucky enough or swift enough to perform defensive maneuvers were thrown far away and fell into a critical state. The mana fluctuation caused by the spell did not escape the warlord's and his aide's attention. A high-level individual was in the fight? So early at this stage? The warlord immediately called over his retinue as he went over the direction where the spell had been cast. He soon saw a group of humans on mounts coming over. He immediately recognized the lead human as they got nearer. Although he had never met the human personally, he had read some reports about this individual. Duke Alfredo. Warlord Abasai called out. Are your confidence in your army so low that you had decided to interfere already? Warlord Abasai, the Duke called out in reply. I am in a hurry, and honestly speaking, your obstruction had pissed me off. I don't have the time to play around with you and I will appreciate it if you pull your force away at once, or else, 
I will not be courteous. The warlord laughed heartily, courteous. Do you think there is still a need for that between us at this stage? Do not liken me to a human, duke. I am not your kind who likes to say one thing but mean another. Do you want to fight? Then let's fight. Good. Then that makes this simple, the duke said. This place is too close with the battlefield. Our fight will cause many unnecessary casualties to the others. Let's head over there. The duke pointed at a faraway empty part of the desert and steered his mount in that direction without waiting for the warlord's approval. Warlord Abasai harumphed as he watched the duke. Overseer Badu warned him, this must be the human's trick, my lord. He must know that his army will not survive ours for long, so he was hoping to gamble in this personal fight to secure victory. Even if it is so, do you think it is honorable for me to decline this challenge? The warlord asked. The overseer lowered down his head as he realized his blunder. He was just one level higher than me. I have heard much about this human. It is time for me to verify the reports. Do not worry, I will bring a glorious victory back, along with his head. With these words, he summoned his giant lizard mount and rode off after the duke. When they were off, Overseer Badu noticed with a confused feeling the rest of the humans that had come with the duke. They were still standing there after their duke had gone. One of these humans suddenly called out, I am Commander Quintus of the human army from Themisphere Kingdom. Is there any orc of Verimor nation that is brave enough to accept my challenge? The orc's leaders were furious as they heard the call. There was another challenger? The tone that the human used had even carry a tint of arrogance as if he was looking down at the orcs. Even Overseer Badu felt discontent with the challenge. The orc leaders behind him were getting restless as they all volunteered themselves to accept the challenge but Badu stopped them. They also had the report on this Commander Quintus and his level and grade were higher than all that present here. Badu was the strongest amongst the orcs after the warlord, thus he would be the one that should accept this challenge, but he knew he would have little chance of victory. The commander was a special elite level 60. He was a whole five levels higher than him. Unlike his warlord, he was more of a prudent kind of orc, which was rare amongst his kind. Seeing the hesitation in the orcs' countenances, Commander Quintus chuckled and said, I don't mind taking on two or more challengers if you orcs have no confidence. Chapter 355, Sneak Attacks of the Shock Troops Hearing the provocation, the clamor that had died down from the orc leaders was reignited again. However, Badu ordered them to calm down, and then to the commander, he responded, since Commander Quintus had said it then it will be impolite for us to turn you down. It will not be dishonorable since you are evidently stronger than any of us. I will face you with another two of my followers. Badu picked out two amongst the leaders who were level 51 and 53. I have no problem with it, Commander Quintus replied. The purpose was to pull the strong combatants away. The more that left the reserve army who guarded the supplies, the better. After Commander Quintus, the others also threw out their challenges for a duel. Laron also took on three opponents at the same time, considering his level 70. If he was the same grade as the Duke, it would have made him the strongest amongst the human officers despite him being a healer type. However, an NPC class was not as constricted as players, so even as a healer type, he also had several offensive spells in his arsenal. They all went to the far part of the southern side to have their duels, which was also part of the plan. Jack and the others were sneaking at the northern side, so they were pulled further away from Jack's teams. Even though it took them quite some time, Jack and the others finally made it to the last sand dune that was closest to the orc army's rear guard. Once they came out of this sand dune, they would be exposed. They could see the rows of supplies in the distance. They were heaps of wood crates on large carts pulled by several large jackals. There were still a significant amount of soldiers guarding them, although none of them was too high a level to deal with. They were just waiting for John's command to move out now. As they wait, Jack saw some light shows and explosive thunder-like sounds in the far distance. 
that was where the high-level officers from the human side had clashed with the orc ones. Even from such a distance, they could still see the impacts of their clash, he was feeling pity and gladness at the same time. Pity because their clashes would be amazing spectacles worthy to be witnessed. While glad because if the fights were close, it would be very easy for them to become collateral damage from an accidental fire. While he was admiring the fireworks show in the distance, he finally received John's signal, Team J and B, mount up and target the closest supply cart. Team A and C, follow behind, but proceed ahead until I say otherwise. Jack was in Team J, he immediately commanded his team to summon their mounts and came out of hiding. With Team B who was Bowler following by his side. John was the one that assigned the alphabet naming for each team, he probably picked a corresponding alphabet with the players' names to make it easier for him to remember which one in which team. Team A was the man's, while Team C was led by Viral Cora. The man was given the alphabet A simply because the guy insisted on it. In fact, he threatened John with his axe on John's neck if he was given any other alphabets other than A. Jack and Bowler's teams were almost halfway before the orcs realized that some enemies had somehow appeared from behind them. The orcs that saw them clamored for the others' attention. The leader who was left in charge of the reserve team immediately organized a part of the troops to go and engage these enemies. As the orc troops drew closer, John gave new commands, Team J and B, go to 11, now 10. 10 again. All of the players and the soldiers that joined the shock troop teams had undergone drills on clock-bearing directions yesterday evening. This was to make it easier for John to give detailed instruction on the field. John fed them commands via the party chat message as he monitored their and enemy's movements via his binoculars. Team A and C continue straight at 12, Team E and F come out and chase after Team A and C. Team J goes 10 again, Team B now goes 2. As Jack continued to follow John's instruction, the orc troops were drawing closer. They were also on mounts as they chased after Jack's team. Looking at the situation he could not help but curse, FK. You are using me as bait. Someone has to, friend. Now shut up and just follow my directions, John replied casually. As the orc troops drew closer, their ranged units could start to shoot their spells and arrows. Jack's team just focused on moving so very few of the attacks reached them. The ones that arrive, were blocked by the two mage soldiers who cast the barrier spell and put their bodies in harm's way. The spell covered their mounts as well so they were protected. The ones that were not blocked were healed by the healers. The healers prioritize healing the mounts first as their HP was less compared to the soldiers. As Jack and Bowler pulled away a portion of the reserve troops. The man's team who had gone further was also chased by another troop which the orc sent out. By this time, John had sent out most of the shock troop teams. Each of the teams went following John's detailed instructions. For a bystander, they would see these separate groups of people going around and around haphazardly. But as the orc reserve leaders continued to send out troops to engage teams that continued to appear one after another, a portion of the supply carts was left unguarded. At this time, Team G led by Giant Steve and Team T by Trinity Dawn, crashed onto these unprotected supply carts. The melee soldiers with the blunt weapons immediately went to work, while the archers equipped their flaming arrows and fired at the other carts next to them. The mage soldiers used magic bind on the few guards left while their comrades went to work. When the orcs found out about the humans destroying their supply carts, they immediately rushed over. But the carts were destroyed already before they arrived. Supply carts did not possess too much HP, while 10 melee soldiers with hammers and maces would be able to make short work on them in less than 20 seconds. They quickly ran away before the orcs arrived. And when they failed to destroy the supply carts before the enemy's reinforcement arrived, the archers shot their flaming arrows to burn the already damaged supply carts, giving them continuous DPS. The orcs would need time to douse the fire, which for the already low HP carts, it was not enough time. John continued to alternate between the teams for distractions and strike teams. Striking the ones that had holes while the rest created disturbances. Of course, 
with the supply carts dwindling, this tactic was getting harder as the orcs had fewer carts that needed protecting so they could allocate more manpower. At this time, John had no choice but to pick the weakest one and punched through using multiple teams at one target. Casualties of course happened when such a crude method was used, but as long as the soldiers ignored the attacks and went directly to the supply carts, they still managed to achieve their objective. Before long, the commotion reached the main army fighting in the front line and also the orc leaders who were currently in a duel with the duke and the rest. You despicable human! You trick us! Warlord Abashi roared in rage as he saw his army's rear supply line was attacked. He was also floating in the air opposite Duke Alfredo. On his back was a pair of large metallic wings that exuded a bluish aura. Warlord Abashi was a melee type, he didn't possess a spell that allowed him to fly like the Duke. Thus he needed an external tool such as the metallic wing to allow him to contend with the Duke in the air. Otherwise, a melee type like him could only look up from the ground as a magic user blasted him mercilessly from the sky. His metallic wing beat and created blue sparks that propelled him. He was intending to go back to his army to deal with the cowards that had backstabbed his army's rear guard. However, as soon as he moved, a large rectangular light wall materialized in front of him. The duke had cast magic wall to hinder him. Warlord Abashi swung the gigantic two-handed axe in his hand. Sparks of fire flared as his axe moved, as if the axe had friction with the air itself, creating a trail of blaze along its curved path. It crashed heavily into the magic wall and caused an explosion that shattered the magic wall, but magic wall also discharged a repulsing force that caused him to slid back a few meters. Taking advantage of this, the duke flew and put himself between the warlord and his army. You are not going anywhere, Duke Alfredo declared. Chapter 356, The Shout of Betrayal The orc main army had been fighting for almost two hours, and yet despite outnumbering the human army, they were suffering more loss than their opponent. The dust wind and the sun had truly hindered their fighting prowess. Added to that, when they received the call for help from the reserve unit who guarded the supply carts, they became more agitated. What should we do? The reserve had sent a messenger requesting for reinforcements, a short orc who used claw weapon on both his hands said to the chieftain of the vanguard troops, Habisi Loud Roar, who had been the orc who gave the war declaration to Captain Salem the day before. A bunch of dolts. How could they let themselves get sneak attacked? The warlord only left them not long ago and they have messed things up. Habisi bellowed in his frustration. He made a few more huffs before he calmed himself and said, Wang Gom, sent my order to the left wing, have them disengaged and go back to aid the reserve unit. But, won't that decrease our offensive power? At the rate we are doing now, it isn't looking good. Humph, the human was just depending on petty tricks to buy them time. The sun is getting higher now, they will soon lose the advantage it provided. As for the sand, the fighting is getting more and more chaotic, sooner or later we will force through their formation. They won't be able to force us to continue facing the wind anymore. They will lose their advantage as time passes. Now, go and carry out my order. As you wish, chieftain. Wang Gom went away and delivered the command to the left-wing troop. They followed the order and disengaged. They lost more troops from the forced disengagement and were harassed as they retreated. The central vanguard tried to cover for them as best as possible. When John saw the retreat of the left wing, he gave a signal to Captain Salem, it's time. Bring up the reserve. As the orcs left wing retreated, the 500 human reserve troops came charging on top of their mounts. Same as the shock troops that went with the players. These reserve troops rode on the best mounts with the highest HP and fastest movement speed. The human reserve troops charged at high speed in an arrow formation as they circled around the battlefield, and then punched through the orc army from its rear flank. The central vanguard and right wing who were already in trouble, had their rear formation ravaged even more. Their rear was mostly composed of low HP archers, mages, and healers. Being suddenly flanked had thrown their formation into chaos. 
the reserve troops continued to force their way deeper into the enemy's rank as they sent attacks upon attacks from the top of their mounts to disrupt the enemy's formation. These reserve troops had been given two mount whistles. If one of them died, they would immediately summon the second one and continued their advance. The commander had completely used up their mount supply reserves for this operation. The healers were hard at work to heal the mounts to keep the casualties as low as possible. Those that had the unfortunate fate of having their mounts killed twice could only accept their fate and used their lives to take down as many enemies as possible as their comrades continued onward leaving them behind. This cavalry charge tactic despite resulting in many mount casualties, still proved effective to disrupt the enemy formations and caused their support on the front line to plummet. Hence the front line soldiers managed to gain an even more huge advantage against the orc army. The left-wing leader who had retreated halfway hesitated after seeing this new development. He was unsure whether to go back to help the main army or continued back to reinforce the reserve units. His indecision caused the left-wing movement to slow down, allowing Jack and the others to destroy more supply carts. Running together inside the cavalry troops wreaking havoc within the enemy's formation, was Prince Alonso and his personal guards. The Duke had asked him to stay back with Captain Salem and John at the command post, but he had adamantly refused. He demanded to join the charging reserve troops to gather experience on the field of battle. The Duke finally relented, having the Prince too sheltered was also not a good thing. The Prince's willingness to learn and struggle with the common soldiers was one of his qualities that the Duke deemed favourable. That was also the reason why he had been training as if he was a common squire when he first met Jack. The Duke, however, demanded him to stay within the heart of the troops and not to engage any enemy. His level was still too low, after all. The Duke also made him promise to always listen to Bailey's command and to not do things out of impulse. Everything had been going well as the cavalry troops caused havoc amongst the enemy's formation, until a loud yell sounded out. Prince Alonso. Look out! Prince Alonso and Lieutenant Bailey turned to the source of the voice and saw Ronnie who was riding at the side. I'm sorry, I thought I saw an arrow coming, he said with an apologetic expression. It might have been an honest mistake, but the harm was still done regardless. When the surrounding orcs heard that the human prince was inside the troops that had perforated deep into their ranks, their focus shifted. All of them started to chase after the cavalry troops. Even the ones supporting the front line left their comrades who were still fighting and joined to capture the cavalry troops. Not good. We have to get out of here. Bailey exclaimed. The leader of the cavalry troops gave the instruction to turn around as they tried to evade getting encircled. If they got blocked and lost their mobility, they would be done for. The cavalry punched through one blockage after another losing soldiers with each collision. Captain Salem who saw the shift, immediately requested the three wings of the main army to push forward to apply pressure on the orc army. However, the orcs seemed to ignore them despite suffering more casualties when they reduced the soldiers that faced the main human army. Their main target was the prince, after all. The captain could only continue having the main army pushed forward in hope of breaking through and went to the prince's rescue. Shit is bound to happen sooner or later, John commented when he glanced from his binoculars at the chaos that followed the cavalry troops. He had no time to deal with it as he was still concentrating on giving orders to Jack's teams. It was not an easy task to give commands to 24 different teams at the same time under a situation that was constantly changing. So the cavalry troops were left to fend for themselves. As many more orcs came to their blockage, the leader of the cavalry troops made a radical decision. He gave the command for them to split. They promptly split into eight smaller groups as they weaved through the gaps among the orc army. Prince, this way. Another shout again, which immediately attracted the nearby orcs. Bailey turned and found that it was Ronnie again, you. Anyone could see by now that the guy was doing it on purpose. Bailey thrust out her spear at him without any warning but Ronnie must have expected it as he steered his mount to break away from the group. At this time an orc party on mounts suddenly came upon their side. The lead orc swung his large two-handed hammer and struck one of the human soldiers off his mount. 
Some of the other orcs in the party crashed into the other human soldiers and caused both to collapse to the ground. Do not let the prince flee. The lead orc bellowed as he and his party chased after the prince's team. They have broken out of the encirclement, but lots of the orc army was still chasing after them. Bailey turned and had a grim expression. The orcs had chased while having another portion of their team go in the direction between the human main army and the fleeing prince's team. If they were to turn and headed towards the main human camp, they would get blocked. Bailey had no choice but to go further away from the main camp. She was dismayed. This morning before they departed, Jack had spared the time to find her and asked her to be on the lookout for this Ronnie guy. When she asked if he had proof or a reason for his suspicion, he could not provide one. After all, Jack himself was not sure. The lying detection of his investigator skill was not exactly in detail. So all of it could be considered as a simple hunch. Since Jack could not provide a good reason nor evidence, she dismissed his suspicion. She could not afford to be suspicious of his comrades. Trust was a very important thing in the army. Almost a code. If you could not trust the person fighting beside you, then you couldn't fight properly. After running for a while, Bailey finally decided. They would get surrounded sooner or later in this condition. He said to the prince, Prince, I will stop their chase. You have to find an opportunity by yourself to get back to the main army. No, Bailey. I cannot allow you to sacrifice yourself. Prince Alonso exclaimed. Do not worry about me. I will flee once I stop them long enough. This is not the time to be indecisive. You have to promise me that you will prioritize your safety. I... I will follow your instruction. The prince said with determination. Good. Chapter 357, Pursuit Catching On Bailey assigned two soldiers to accompany the prince as they continued to flee, while the rest turned around and engaged the chasing army. Bailey brandished her spear and made successive thrusts. Uncountable images of spears made of wind slashed through the orc soldiers one after another, stopping them on their tracks. Bailey especially targeted their mounts which fell with just one or two hits from her spear. The other soldiers spread out and made sure that none of the orcs could chase the prince. As Bailey was stabbing one orc after another, a loud roar suddenly erupted, making the ears of everyone in the vicinity hurt. A large orc leaped forward at Bailey, swinging his large two-handed hammer down. Bailey did not want to be careless in accepting the blow of this powerful-looking hammer. She backstepped a few times as the heavy hammer slammed into the ground which then erupted into several large pikes that thrust outwards. If Bailey did not retreat, she would have been impaled by these earth pikes. I am Habisi Loud Roar. State your name before I kill you. The orc declared. I am Bailey, the prince's guard, and I will not let you take one step further, Bailey exclaimed. Jack who was still running around alternating between being a bait and attacker at the rear line, noticed the disturbance on the distant battlefield. His dragon's eye skill allowed him to see very far. Though not as good as John's binoculars, he could still see several groups of humans getting chased by the orcs. He saw Prince Alonso amongst one of these groups. At this time, the orcs' left wing that disengaged from the battlefield was almost upon them. John had asked all the teams to rush to the right side. He had mostly arranged for everyone to wreak havoc at the left and center side of the orcs' supply carts. The right side which had been left alone had very few defenders at this moment. They were to deliver a concentrated blitz attack on the right side and destroyed as many of the supply carts as possible, then ran away before the left-wing army got to them. While the others were galloping to where John commanded them to, Jack turned the other way. Expert, where are you going? You do know the three o'clock direction, don't you? Or do you suddenly suffer from a case of idiotic syndrome? John called out. Sorry, I leave the rest to you all. I have to go to the prince's aid. Jack replied, ignoring the sarcasm. Do what you must. Everyone, continue onward. Now was not the time for argument. Time was short, so John just proceeded without Jack. 
Jack was not doing this out of impulse as well. He knew that destroying the supply carts was the key to their victory, but losing the prince would also make the entire expedition losing its long-run goal. Not to mention, he had been given the quest to safeguard the prince by the royal adviser. Now was the time to fulfill this given duty. Jack watched as Lieutenant Bailey stayed behind to stop the pursuing orcs together with a large portion of the soldiers. The prince continued to run with two guards. No, there was another one, riding at their heel not far away. He focused his sight and recognized this last one as Ronnie. He urged his team to hurry as they ride toward where the prince was heading. Prince Alonso continued to urge his steed to gallop. He tried to turn to the east, but there were some orcs on that side shadowing in the distance. He could only turn westward, getting further from the main army. Bailey won't be able to hold all the chasing orcs, some still slip through. There were already four of them closing in. In this hot pursuit, the prince seemed to lose direction in this expansive desert. He didn't know which way to go. His indecision caused the pursuit party to catch up. The two guards that followed him put themselves forward to block the orcs. The four orcs didn't rush to get the prince as they dealt with the two guards. Your Highness, run! One of the guards yelled. But! Prince Alonso was hesitant. Prince, you have to go, now! The other guards exclaimed. Prince Alonso steeled his heart to flee, but as he turned around, a shadow abruptly crashed onto him. He felt his steed suffered quick successive attacks before it fell. This rare steed of his despite having a large amount of HP, had already been continuously bombarded by range attacks while he was on the run. These last sudden attacks had finally claimed its life. The prince looked up and saw Ronnie. You. Ronnie unmounted, I'm sorry, prince. Please don't take this personal. I'm just carrying out order. Order? From who? Do you even need to ask? You, traitor. Is Samuel in on this? That dumb geezer? No, he is as thick as a dolt, stubborn bastard. Same as my family, do they think they will get a happy ending serving a losing prince? I am doing this to save them. Otherwise, once the crown prince takes the throne, it will be my family that is going to suffer. I have to do something about it. Save me your excuses. You are just doing this out of greed, do not pretend it is for the sake of others, Prince Alonso spat in disgust. Hee <laughs> hee, you are right. Well, then let's get this over with, Ronnie brandished his sword and attacked the prince, who had long prepared his sword and shield. Ronnie was a level 35 elite. While the prince was a level 26 special elite, one level more compared to when he left the capital. Although his higher grade and excellent equipment helped him to cope with Ronnie for a while despite nine levels lower, Ronnie's experience eventually gave him the upper hand. The light green sword in his hand seemed to be not simple as well, it might have been given by the crown prince for this assassination purpose. Prince Alonso felt his speed growing slower, and his HP also gradually decreased even when he did not suffer any hit. He looked at his wounds which Ronnie had managed to land on several occasions. There were some green blisters on the skin around the wound. You, your sword is poisoned. Prince Alonso asked upon realization. Please just accept your fate, Prince, Ronnie said as he thrust out. The prince managed to dodge despite his body's heaviness, but suddenly another slash came from the other direction and hit him cleanly. Prince Alonso stumbled back as he lost a significant amount of HP. He looked and saw Ronnie was holding a saber in his left hand. Ronnie was wielding two weapons. He had been attacking with only one sword all this time, the sudden appearance of his saber had caught the prince off guard and scored him a critical. He was grinning with success so close. If he could bring the prince's head back for the crown prince, he would be awarded an even better reward than having the prince died at the hand of the orcs. He had been working so long to find this opportunity, he must thank the orcs for this. If not for their assault, he did not know how long still he had to wait. He was about to resume his attacks when someone lunged at him. 
it was one of the guards that were holding down the orc pursuers. He was full of wounds and had very low HP already. Ronnie evaded his desperate attack. Prince, run! He called out. A heavy axe slash landed on the guard's back after his shout. He fell to the ground. The two orcs that were fighting with him before had come over. One of them saw Ronnie and charged at him. Hey, I am on your side. Ronnie exclaimed. Scheming human, do you think me stupid? The orc said as he resumed his attacks. You dumb orc! Didn't you see me fighting with the prince a moment ago? Ronnie cursed, incensed by the orc's stubbornness. The other orc was going for the prince, but something grabbed at his leg. He looked down and saw the dying human was clinging to his leg tightly with both hands. Prince, go! He called out with all his strength. Prince Alonso could not bear to let the guard's dying effort be in vain. He turned around and ran as fast as he could. However, the poison in his blood slowed his movement. He had drunk an antidote to alleviate the poison, but this poison was not a common one. Although his HP had stopped decreasing, his body still felt weak and heavy. He took out a second mount whistle after putting a little distance, he did not want his mount to get attacked again. Every one of the cavalry troops had been given two mount whistles. Although this spare one was not as good as his previous one, it was better than nothing. He quickly mounted up. As he was about to ride off, he watched in despair as several orcs on mount appeared in front of him. He turned to his left and right, there were also orcs there. He had been surrounded. Chapter 358, To the Prince's Rescue Prince Alonso heard the death cry of the guard who had been holding the leg of the orc. He turned and saw the sad scene, his sacrifice still ended up wasted. The one remaining guard was ganged up by another three orcs that had recently arrived and he also fell soon after. Ronnie, who saw the change in the situation quickly disengaged from the orc he was fighting and attempted to flee, but a short orc suddenly appeared in front of his path. Move away! Ronnie shouted as he swung both his sword and saber at the short orc. This short orc was wearing a claw weapon on both hands, he spun both his arms around and Ronnie's sword and saber were deflected effortlessly. Ronnie realized from this exchange that this short orc was much stronger than him, but too late, the claws made a lightning fast motion as they repeatedly slashed at Ronnie. Ronnie's HP decreased frighteningly fast. In his desperation, he quickly screamed out, Wait! I am on your side! Stupid human is using the same stupid ploy again, the orc that previously fought with him commented. No, look. It was me that call out about the prince's location. Ronnie quickly pleaded with the short orc in front of him. Without me alerting you, you won't know about the prince's location. I see, so we should thank you. By the way, my name is Wang Gom Thick Skull, the short orc said. Ronnie became delighted upon hearing it. It's good to know you, honored Wang Gom. Let's kill this prince. If you don't mind, I just need a part of him too. Without waiting for Ronnie to finish his sentence, Wang Gom said, Good, now you know the name of the one who kills you. Therefore, your spirit won't be restless in the next realm. Once his words ended, Wang Gom turned into a blitz. Six of his images appeared around Ronnie at the same time as they all punched simultaneously. Each strike targeting a different weakness point, throat, temples, groin, ribs, knees, solar plexus. Each strike caused critical damage. Ronnie's HP zeroed out after the last strike ended. Ronnie fell with his eyes open wide. He was extremely unwilling. He was supposed to go back with news of his success and had the crown prince awarded him with his due rewards, but instead, he had to fall here. All his hard work, his effort, to get close to the prince, to gain an opportunity to carry out this assassination. He was regretful. He regretted his greed. He should not have taken the risk of killing the prince personally just for an extra reward. He should have been content seeing the prince's demise from a distance. But however regretful he was, it was already too late. Prince Alonso who saw the traitor fell, 
displayed no satisfaction. Because his situation was none the better. He was still in a predicament of being surrounded by enemy soldiers. His breath was heavy, the poison effect was not yet alleviated. Not that it would make any difference though, even Ronnie in his best condition couldn't do anything against this short orc. Wang Gong walked slowly towards Prince Alonso. The other orcs stayed at their places, keeping the prince surrounded. Prince Alonso took up his sword and shield. Even though there was no hope, even if it was futile, he would not go down without a fight. Good spirit, Wang Gum commented. Are you the third prince of Themisphere? Prince Alonso kept his silence for a while before finally answering, I am. He would not be spared even if he lied. I am Wang Gum Thick Skull, son of Badu Thick Skull, a grunt in the army of the great warlord Abasai Rare Tooth. You will say my name when you pass over the river of death, my name is the person who has sent you there. As Wang Gom's words ended and he was about to move, a ball of light shot at him. He evaded it effortlessly despite the sudden ambush. He looked in the direction where the attack had come from and saw an armored human jump to almost six meters high, passing over the head of his soldiers who was on standby and came down at his spot swinging down a large hammer. The hammer crashed onto the sandy ground but Wang Gom was already several distances away. At this time, numerous human soldiers appeared and clashed with the surrounding orcs. Prince Prince Alonso turned to the familiar voice that was calling him and saw Jack coming over to his side. You, you came, Prince Alonso said, words could not describe his relief at this time. Jack saw the prince's half-empty HP. Heal the prince. Jack told the healer soldiers. The healer carried out the command, but his spell only healed a small amount of HP. I was poisoned, the prince informed. I have drunk an antidote, but some of the poison effects are not yet gone. It reduces the healings I received. I have also drunk healing potions with the same little efficacy. Jack looked at their situation. There were sixteen soldiers with him, he had lost four in the previous assaults on the supply carts. The enemy had close to 30 soldiers. The good thing was the soldiers that came with him seemed to be of higher levels compared to the orc soldiers here. However, there was no guarantee that no more orcs would come. They were still behind the enemy's line, after all. The lead officers between the humans and orcs, however, seemed to be at a stalemate. Jack inspected and found the short orc with the claws weapon was a level 45 elite same as the NPC squad leader of his team. He noticed the short orc had a rank called Grunt, while the other orcs had the rank of Peon. The squad leader on his side was a knight rank. He was familiar with the Mosphere Kingdom's military rank, the knight rank was only a level below knight lieutenant. He was not familiar though with the orcs rank system. As the two lead officers continued to battle to a standstill, Jack was contemplating if he should give the command to disengage and flee. But to have an effective escape, he would need to have a few soldiers stayed behind, otherwise, they would just get harassed at the back as they were making their escape. To sacrifice some men and flee? Or to stay and fight, risking more orcs to appear? That was the question. Jack knew that he could not afford to be indecisive for long each second gone meant an additional chance on more incoming perils. After making his decision, he took out the three remaining magic bind scrolls in his bag. He called the two healer soldiers nearby and gave two of the scrolls to them each. The last one he gave to Prince Alonso. He also called the one remaining mage in his team over, the other one was among the ones who had fallen. Everyone, on my mark, uses these scrolls on that short orc he pointed to Wang Gom who was fighting with the human knight. The main advantage Wang Gom had over the human knight was his speed. As time passed, his advantage over the human knight was more apparent as he landed much more hit on the knight. The knight had trouble catching Wang Gom's movements. To tip the battle in the knight's favor, Wang Gom's movements needed to be halted. The best spell in their arsenal to do that was the magic bind spell but he doubted one spell cast by him would give much help. He needed to land multiple magic bind on the grunt to have an effect. 
he could not use the same spell scrolls successively due to the scrolls also had a cooldown, so he needed others to cast it together with him. To the mage soldier, he said, you use your magic bind together with me. Jack had gained magic bind spell when he reached level 25 of his mage class when the Grim Sand Drake died. At that time, his warrior had also reached level 25, which granted him a new warrior skill, a passive skill superior body recovery. It was an upgrade to his natural body recovery skill. This skill added an additional 10 HP to each healing, but the best effect this skill brought was that it allowed the recovery effect to operate even during combat, despite with half efficiency. This skill meant every warrior level 25 and above had a continuous small regeneration effect. On the same night when the Grim Sand Drake died, due to superior body recovery, Jack decided to max out his natural body recovery skill together with the heightened state skill, using a small part from the 221,298 souls he had gained from the Grim Sand Drake and Grandmother Spider. For the remaining souls, he used them all to max out his superior body recovery skill. Natural Body Recovery, Level 20 20ths, Passive Skill, Star, 1. Recover 65 HP every 9.5 seconds when out of combat. Superior Body Recovery, Level 20 20ths, Passive Skill. Allow Natural Body Recovery to be in effect even during combat, with 50% efficiency. Additional 330 HP on each healing. Heightened State, Level 20 20ths, Active Skill, Star, 2. Increase Mana Regeneration by 60%. Decrease Skill Cooldown by 24%. Duration, 6 minutes 30 seconds. Cooldown, 10 minutes. He was at first expecting to gain a secret reward again for max leveling one of his advanced skills, but no such luck. He had decided to max his superior body recovery to increase his survivability. In combination with the natural body recovery, he could recover 395 HP every 9.5 seconds. When he was in combat, he would heal 197.5 HP instead, which was almost like drinking a free basic healing potion every 9.5 seconds. Chapter 359 Shooting Dash Jack took out his rapid dazing staff and said, target his limbs. He was adopting the same tactic as John had done on the Grim Sand Drake. To the mage soldier, he said, begin the incantation. They both started forming their spell formation. The mage soldier formed his rune faster than Jack, but Jack's one had all three runes forming at the same time. In the end, Jack's spell was completed a tad bit faster than the mage soldier's one. Cast it. Jack uttered to the others. The others unfurled the magic scrolls in their hands. Five magic bind hit the unsuspecting Wang Gom who was in intense combat with the human knight. Four of them locked his two arms and two legs, the last one by Jack was sealing his torso. Wang Gom was taken by surprise by the sudden interference. One magic bind cast by low-level casters would be easy to be broken, by five of them locking different parts of his body, he needed to exert extra effort to break it. Not to mention he was not a strength-type class, hence it was more difficult for him to break these united spells. A window of opportunity was all it needed to decide the outcome of a battle between two equal opponents, the human knight did not let this chance go to waste. His heavy hammer crashed onto Wang Gom's chest as he was still incapacitated, then a follow-up attack crashed onto his head. Jack and the others did not stay idle. They cast their offensive spells and ranged attacks. Jack turned on the burst shot ability of his staff to maximize damage. Wang Gom's defense was not as insane as the Grim Sand Drake, so they had no problem causing sufficient damages even with their levels. The other orcs saw their leader's predicament and tried to lend a hand, but the other human soldiers were also aware and thus immediately put themselves in harm's way to hinder them. Wang Gom roared in fury as he forced himself free from the magic bind. He finally managed to break four of the magic binds, leaving only the one in his left leg. The human knight had stopped his attack for a second to channel his strength for an ultimate strike, he lifted his hammer high as a magnified image of his hammer appeared above. 
This gigantic image fell on Wang Gom at the same time as he broke the last magic bind. Wang Gom was just about to utilize his incredible speed to flee the attack when the ground underneath him light up just as the last magic bind was shattered. He was affected by disoriented status which slowed his movement. A crescent light also hit one of his knees. The crescent light did not cause much damage to him but it still caused his knee to buckle for a breath. Jack had started casting arcane turbulence when he saw the first magic bind was broken, he then executed Sword of Light at the same time when his spell was cast. This short pause had deprived Wang Gom of a dodging chance. The giant hammer summoned by the human knight slammed at him heavily and brought him collapsing to the ground. The force of that giant hammer was so powerful that it created a small tremor and a cave-in at the point of impact. Sand dust exploded out and covered everyone's vision. Everyone watched with apprehension as the dust receded. Wang Gom's battered body was soon exposed as he was lying pitifully on the small crater of sand. His HP was only a hairbreadth left. Wang Gom spoke with difficulty as he tried to stand up, detestable humans, why you will know not, defeat the GR great Wang Gom. His subordinate orcs went into a frenzy as they saw his condition. They tried to barge their ways through without a care of their own safety. Seeing the situation, they would break through before long. There were healer orcs as well among them. It would be troublesome if they managed to heal that orc. Finish him. Jack ordered as he executed Shredding Fang together with ranged attacks from his staff. The human knight also sent another strike with his hammer. Wang Gom was close to death already, he would not survive these attacks. Before they connected, Jack willed out the Rune Stone of Luck. On the night that the Grim Sand Drake was defeated, he had fused with the Rune Stone of Luck. This Rune Stone had the element of lightning, so he had gone through electrocution torture again that night. Rune Stone of Luck, Rare Rune Stone. Increase luck by approximate 5 points for 10 seconds. Elemental energy required for upgrade, 0 1000. He focused his willpower on the rune stone and boosted his luck by an additional 7 points as the attacks connected with Wang Gom, whose HP bar was immediately depleted. He doubted that it was his attack that dealt the killing blow, but it does not matter, the human knight was under his command, so his luck stats should still apply when the orc died. Wang Gom's body did not disappear as monsters did, but a couple of items dropped beside him. Jack came over to pick them up. The other orcs were devastated seeing their leader's demise. Yet they still did not stop their frenzied. It's like they had gone berserk. The human soldiers had trouble dealing with them. But now that the human knight was no longer preoccupied, he immediately made short work on the other orcs. One of the orcs yelled out to his comrade, You go back. You have to tell Overseer Badu of this. He will surely avenge our leader, Wang Gom. That orc nodded and turned back as he summoned his mount and rode away. The other orcs continued to fight until all of them fell. Jack was relieved to see that no other orc units were coming, but they still had to leave this place soon. Sooner or later, the orcs would find them if they stayed still at one place. Not to mention with how much respect these soldiers showed this Wang Gom, they would surely come back to claim his body. Jack observed the items that the slain orc had dropped. Technique Book, Shooting Dash, Super Rare Consumable. Grant the Skill, Shooting Dash. Restriction, Any Advanced Physical Class. Skill Book, Rare Consumable. Grant 1, Skill Point. Amethyst, Rare Gemstone. Amazing, he exclaimed in his mind. He doubted this orc was at the standard of the Grim Sand Drake, yet all the items it dropped were also at least rare grade. He did not doubt that the increase in luck played a significant role in this outcome. Peniel was right, it was the right decision to choose the rune stone of luck. There were also one gold 42 silver coins and four mana cores which he picked up. Other slain soldiers also dropped some coins but he chose not to waste time to pick them all up, he was just about to ask them all to leave but his god eye monocle picked up a yellow marker on one item among the ones dropped by the others. He ran over there to pick the item up. Other items might not be valuable enough to take the risk, 
but a yellow-colored marker was different. It indicated a rare grade. When he arrived at the place, he saw a light green-colored sword. Jack picked it up. Venomous Viper Sword, Level 35 65th, Rare One-Handed Sword. Physical Damage, 175. Attack Speed, 2. Durability, 80. Reflex Plus 6. 15% chance to cause poison status effect on each attack. That was Ronnie's sword, he heard Prince Alonzo said. Jack saw the approaching prince, his countenance was not pale any longer. His poison status must have expired. Ronnie. Jack remembered the guy as the one who had volunteered as the prince's guards. Who killed him? That orc leader just now, the prince replied. He then gave Jack the short version of Ronnie's treachery. So there really was something wrong with the guy. I should have given more trust to that investigator talent of mine and be more adamant about my suspicion when I talked to Bailey this morning, Jack thought. He was relieved that in the end, he was still not too late in rescuing the prince. Eh. Then how come this sword dropped? He suddenly thought. No loots dropped when the one who did the killing was an NPC who was not under a player's influence. Feeling his questioning thought, Peniel explained, that sword must be a special item which was loaned to that Ronnie guy, it was not exactly his possession. Sometimes such an item will still drop even if the one wielding it died without Outworlder's interference. Meaning it was an item naturally of this world. He believed if it was the other soldiers who saw this sword first, they will also pick it up, unlike the other dropped loots. Luckily, he saw it first. We need to go, Jack said as he stored the sword. He summoned his steed, the others did the same. Let's move out. They rode away from the place. Jack chose to head westward, away from the human main army. He had seen the orc army forming a barricade when they chase after the prince, they would just go into the enemy's arm if he headed east. Jeannie and the others had also been headed westward as they were being chased by the orc's left-wing army. Jack planned to regroup with them before he thought about how to get back to the main army. He sent a message to John so he could inform Captain Salem that the prince was safe with him. While he was riding, he checked on the loots. He was especially happy with the level 35 Venomous Viper Sword. He could instantly increase his Storm Breaker's level to 35 when he fed this sword to it. He then took out the skill book. His container of souls rendered this book less important to him, but a free additional skill point was always welcomed. He used the book and was prompted with a question to apply the free point to his warrior or mage class. He chose the warrior class without hesitation, he still saw his melee class as his main class. The technique book was next. What's this skill do? He asked Peniel. It's a movement skill. It allowed you to cover a decent distance in speed. This skill is similar to the body double spell, once you leveled it up to level 10 and 20, it will have additional effects. Chapter 360, Trapped in a Siege Cool, he had flash step, but that skill was mostly for dodging purposes. He still lacked a movement skill that gave him a burst of speed to reach a ranged opponent quickly. The charge skill was an offensive skill, its increase in movement speed was only average at best. He proceeded to learn the spell without delay. Shooting dash, level, 1 20th, active skill, movement. Dash in a direction with 500% movement speed. The next attack after the dash is increased by 200%. Range, 5 meters. Cool down, 30 seconds. Stamina consumed, 30. What additional effect does this skill give after I level it up to 10 and 20? Jack asked Peniel. It allows you to make another dash once the first is done. At max level, it adds another one, so you can make three dashes successively. If I can make a continuous three dashes, then I can cover 15 meters in an instant. Jack thought with amazement. Not 15 meters. At max level, you can do 10 meters for each dash. That meant you can cover 30 meters if you aim all three dashes in the same direction, Peniel explained. Hearing that, 
Jack hurried opened his container of souls. Starting from when they left the swell, he had collected quite a number of souls from the roaming monsters. Then during the war when the shock troops attacked the supply carts, the soldiers had also killed some orc soldiers. Too bad he was not in the main army, the casualties over there would have yielded an astronomical amount of souls. After that, they had killed most of the orcs when saving Prince Alonso. The souls from Wang Gum should have been bountiful, even though probably not as impressive as the ones given by the Grim Sand Drake. There were 106,298 souls inside. Damn, this expedition is truly beneficial. I collected this many souls in just a few days, Jack commented. You met many stronger monsters as you go further away from the city, naturally they gave better souls. The natives also give more souls, especially higher ranked ones. That Wang Gom alone probably contributed half the number you have there. He went ahead and used 90,000 souls to directly elevated the newly acquired shooting dash skill to level 10. Shooting dash, level, 10 twentieths, active skill, movement. Dash in a direction with 500% movement speed. The next attack after the dash is increased by 200%. Range, 7.25 meters. Cool down, 30 seconds. Stamina consumed, 40. After killing Wang Gom, in addition to the accumulation of EXP points since they left the swell, Jack had also increased to level 27 warrior and level 26 mage. Most of the EXP points came from killing Wang Gom, and since the other players in his party were not nearby, he had gotten all the EXP. He was catching up with the others' levels again. He had a saving of 12 free attribute points after these two level UPS. He decided to invest them all into his lowest stat, Reflex, bringing its base point to 129 points. Added with his equipment boosts, he had 145 Reflex. He had neglected his offensive skills for a while, so he decided to use 10,000 souls together with the 7 Warriors free skill points to upgrade his Sword of Light to level 17 bringing its damage output to 520%. This skill remained his highest damage single target skill. For his six mages free skill points, he spent them on his magic bind skill. Magic bind, level 7 twentieths, active skill, range, require magic weapon. Bind a target with a magical leash, power of leash depends on skill level and caster's intelligence stat. Range, 30 meters. Duration, 30 seconds, can be reduced based on target stats strength. Mana consumed, 40. Cool down, 2 minutes. While Jack was organizing his skills and spells, they had been going in the same direction. Prince Alonso asked, where are we going? At this rate, we won't be able to reassemble with the main army. The enemy has prepared blockage, we won't be able to break through with just our numbers. We are convening with the other shock troop teams, Jack said as he opened his map. He had also been receiving updates in his party chat messages. The other teams had been forced to flee from the left-wing army. They had been chased around for some time until they were forced into a small rocky mountain range nearby. It was the only mountain range in this desert region. Jack could see that mountain range on his map now, the name Barren Rocks was shown on it. Jeannie and the others had run into this barren rocks and found out that it only had one entrance. The deeper part inside was invested with giant scorpions and they even saw several flame tigers. They could not deal with these monsters while being harassed by the orc army, so they stayed near the entrance, and formed a barricade. The orc army could not abuse their numbers at the entrance as the path was too narrow. Genie arranged for the human soldiers to take turns dealing with the orcs that tried to force their way in, while sending several scouts inside to look for a different exit. However, the news from the scouts was not encouraging. The only things they found inside were more monsters and an entrance to a dungeon. Under normal circumstances, finding the location of a dungeon would be great news, but not at this time. The orcs that chased them here laid siege outside the entrance as they went on to send in soldiers to exhaust the humans inside. Jack followed his map interface. 
he could see the green dots indicating his party member inside the barren rock. He observed the situation once he arrived nearby. There were several small rock hills in this location, so it was not difficult to find a hiding place for a small group. It didn't look good. There were lots of orcs outside the entrance. How many of you make it inside there? He sent Genie a message. We number only around 300. We lost quite a lot of people in the assault, Genie answered. Also, from the player side, we have lost bitter rain, wondrous life, swell going, pointy tip, and four of the man's underlings. Only 16 of us left out of the 25 who started out in this expedition, Jack thought. He had no love for that swell going fellow, good riddance if he might add, but it was still a pity for the others. He had expected some to not make it, but to lose that many even before they arrived at the destination was rather disheartening. Luckily they had all worn amulet of rebirth. So they should only lose one level as they were resurrected in the capital. Considering Genie's information that there were 300 humans inside, the orcs outside looked roughly at 900 to 1000. The orcs were around three times the number of humans. The humans on the inside would be worn out if they continued this battle of attrition's. Jack thought for a bit as he observed the situation. He then sent out a message to Genie, you have to break out of there. Say what? It took us a while to escape here, Genie replied. Going out again will just put us back to getting chased. And even if we want to, we won't be able to break through all those orcs. We are trapped here now. Don't worry about getting chased. I have a way to stop their advance for a while. There are still lots of their scouts out there in the desert. They are looking for the prince, right? We will bump into one of them sooner or later. It will be difficult to get back to the main army without being discovered. Getting back to the main army might be difficult, but escaping notice from the scouts should be no problem. How so? You forget already that I can find out about others' positions from a distance. Oh, that's right. But it is still unlikely for us here to break through outside with them laying siege already. I can create some distraction from out here for a short duration, but you will have to rely on your own strength to punch your way through. After a brief pause, Jeannie finally replied, All right. Give me some time to talk to the others. I will make my preparation also, you let me know when you are ready. After finished with the chat messages, Jeannie looked at the others. The players were still fine since they knew they will resurrect again even if they died here. Furthermore, with the amulet of rebirth, they would only lose one level, a small sacrifice. The natives, on the other hand, didn't appear too thrilled with their current situation. After all, they would die for real if they were killed. Many of them were wearing grim and depressed expressions. She even heard some soldiers bickering. It had been going on for a while. It was just a whisper at first, but now the quarrel had become heated that either side did not bother if the others heard them. I said already from the start. There is nothing good from listening to the outworlders' plans. Look where it gets us. Chapter 361, Triggering a Spark Watch your tongue. They are our comrades. Our commander trusts them, so should we. Another soldier countered. Jeannie noticed that this soldier was amongst the ones that used to be in the vanguard troops under her. Those that stood behind that soldier and supporting his argument were mostly also from the vanguard troops. These soldiers had fought with them since the start of the expedition, so they were more in support of the presence of the outworlders. The opposing side, on the other hand, was probably consisted of soldiers taken from amongst the main army. Although they were not originally anti-outworlder, the current stress and desperation had caused them to look for something or someone to blame. Outworlders were the easiest target at the moment. It couldn't go on like this, Jeannie thought as the heated arguments raged on. It might turn into a physical brawl if they were left as they were. She looked around, most of everyone was crowded here with tense faces. A team was defending the entrance with a backup team to take over when their HP was getting low. She climbed to a higher ground where he could better see everyone, and everyone could see her. 
she hid her spear onto a rock to draw everyone's attention and called out, All of you, listen. The arguing soldiers stopped and looked at her in confusion. The one that had been saying bad things about the players gave a look that said, What is this B TCH doing? Jeannie did not mind the expression, she waited until everyone was quiet and gave her their attention. I know everyone here is on edge, I know many of you blame us, outworlders. You may be right, you may be wrong, but none of that matters right now. Even if you put the blame on us, your problem here will not be resolved. Understand that we are all trapped here with you and are sharing your fate. Now I have a solution that can get us out of here, but I will need for you all to listen. She gave them a slight pause as she observed their faces. Those who were antagonistic seemed to wear skeptical expressions to her claim, but their militaristic discipline kept them from being unruly. I hope you really had a good plan to break us out, Storm, Jeannie said in his mind. You are right to be frustrated. After all, we are foreigners, Jeannie continued. We are not the natives of this world such as you. We don't know why we are called upon this world. I hope there is a reason but I know not of such reason. And I can tell you that even if we want to, we can't leave this world. So whether you like it or not, you are stuck with us. I can't say for all the outworlders, but I can tell you this, me and my friends that are in this expedition, we want to be a part of you, a part of your world. We will work for it, we will prove to you that we deserve to share this world with you, but we will need you to give us a chance. I grew up in a family who used to travel around. I was brought by my parents to move around constantly. From one place to another. I have always been greeted by one stranger to another. I can tell you that I understand how it feels when you are forced to make friends with someone unknown to you. I know how scary it is to have to work with someone you don't know. The inconvenience of trying to learn if these strangers truly have the same best interest as me. I can tell you that if you do not give these strangers the chance, you will just be pushing them away, and making them as everything you are afraid them to be. I am asking you to not push us away. At least for the ones that have come with you on this expedition. She gave another pause again, those antagonistic soldiers seemed to soften a bit. I thank you for have come with us till here. Now, I ask you to trust us one more time. You all know that our scouts have not found any other exit from this place. And we can't stay here defending this place, we won't last that long. We have to break out. One of the soldiers finally could not keep his silence anymore, how do you suggest we do that? Going out will just be a death sentence for us. I have someone on the outside, they are making the preparations now. They will create a distraction to draw away the orc's attention. At that time, if we force our way through, we will be able to break their blockage. And what good will that do us? Another soldier asked. We will just be getting surrounded by them again. My friend out there has prepared a way to stop the orcs for a while. He will also be able to keep these orcs at bay as long as we continued running. The soldiers looked at each other, Jeannie knew they were not convinced. After all, the plan sounded vague. She herself was not truly convinced, but her job now was to exude confidence that will move these people to action. There are many details that I know you would like to know, but we are running out of time. We need to make our preparation now if we are to go through with this plan. I ask that you trust me. I swear by the god of my world and the gods and goddesses of this, that if you give me your trust, I will bring you out and back to the main army. You will bring the honor back to the capital, as someone who fought through an encirclement of the orcs army and lived to tell the tale. Now, are you with me? There was a long silence after the question, yet Jeannie continued to hold an expectant and confident gaze as she stood tall on the higher ground. Finally, one soldier stood out. You can count on me. He exclaimed. Jeannie noticed that he was the one who was in an argument on behalf of the outworlders. As the first spark was triggered, several other soldiers that were with him started to come out as well and declared their stance to follow Jeannie's plan. The soldier who had been antagonistic to the outworlders had a complex expression. 
but he soon decided and came out as well. I am in, he said. The others behind him followed suit. Soon all the soldiers had one voice. Jeannie gave them a slight bow, I sincerely give you all my thanks. Now, let us prepare. At the outside, Jack had relayed his plan to the others. During this brief respite, everyone had also recovered themselves using recovery potions added with the help of the two healer soldiers. They had also made sure their mounts were fully healed. They were now simply waiting for the news from the other side. We are ready, waiting for your cue, Jack soon received Jeannie's message. Great, wait for my cue, Jack replied. He then looked at the others, it's showtime. Then to the prince, he asked, are you ready? Prince Alonso nodded, I will do my best. Jack could see the resolute expression from the prince. The prince had always been the obedient type but he also had the energetic temperament of a young adult, which had caused his eagerness to join the shock troops. Jack could see that he had matured a lot from the incident today. Men had lost their lives because of him, and this would happen again in the future. The prince could see now that this was his fate that came with his station. All right, let's go. Ten of them rode out, including Jack and the prince, leaving eight who stayed behind in hiding. The ten had their mounts galloped at full speed towards the orcs' army. The orcs who were making preparation to send another wave into barren rocks, noticed the incoming humans. The leader who was a hulking orc carrying a giant crossbow on his back, huffed with a sneer, what are those clowns doing? The other orcs started to laugh with ridicule hearing their leader's comment. A team of ten people rushing at an army of at least nine hundred did appear comical. Send a squad to intercept them. The leader said lazily before turning his attention back to organizing the units to wear down the human troops inside. A squad of twenty orc soldiers came out to engage the ten incoming humans. Seeing this orc squad, the ten humans steered their mount sideways, avoiding the squad while still heading towards the orc army. The orcs at the perimeter of the army looked in confusion as they saw this small human team ran perpendicular to them as a squad of their teammates chased after this team. Those with good eyesight suddenly exclaimed. Hey, isn't that the human's prince? Chapter 362, Breaking Out The others gave more attention to the small human team once they heard it. It really is the prince. Another said. The prince's image had been circulated among the army, as he was their main target so almost every orc in this army knew what the third prince looked like. This news soon reached the leader with the giant crossbow. Chieftain Yomo, should we send more people to chase? His aide asked. Yomo Sharpstone, who was the leader, made another huff. Of course, we are. But we are not sending everyone. I will go myself and bring half of our men to spread out and encircle the prince's team. You will stay here with the remaining half and continued the pressure on the humans inside. Your order will be carried, mighty chieftain, the aide said and immediately went to gather the orcs. Jack had been circling around not far from the main team playing cat and mouse with the pursuing team. As part of the shock troops who were responsible for the ambush on the enemy's supply carts, they had the fastest mounts, so the pursuing team could not catch up to them. Soon he saw many orcs came out and went after them. Bait is taken, let's ride. He said to the others and they increased their pace. They went eastward with the pursuing orcs hot on their heel. The orcs fanned out. There were also those with fast mounts in the orcs teams. These teams took positions at the two furthest sides, trying to flank Jack's group from both sides. Jack could not produce any complicated plan like John. His plan was a simple bait and lure plan. Though it was crude, it was still effective though since now the orcs guarding the entrance was just a bit more than Genie's troops. When he thought that he had lured the orcs far enough, he sent a message to Genie, do it now. Genie, who had been waiting for the queue, gave the signal to go. The ones that were still fighting with the orcs at the entrance immediately broke away and retreated. As they retreated, they gave way to a charging army from behind. The advancing orcs were stunned by this revelation. They were just a small squad that was tasked to exhaust the enemy. 
they did not have the number nor the power to block such a powerful charge. The ones that could dodge, jumped to the side, while the ones who couldn't get trampled by the mounts. Genie had arranged for the front of the charging army to be officers with the highest level and HP. Each of them was equipped with a long weapon such as spears or pole arms. Those that originally did not use such weapons exchanged the weapons with their fellow soldiers who did. The long weapons allowed them to deliver a powerful hit to their enemies to unbalance them before their mounts crashed into them. The mounts that these high-level soldiers rode were also one with the highest HP. Genie had made sure to have all their mounts healed to max HP before charging out. There was also a team of healer soldiers behind these vanguard soldiers. They were to continuously use their heal spells on the vanguard's mounts. Genie had asked them to ignore the soldiers and focused on the mounts. The soldiers' high HP should allow them to sustain damage long enough, but if they lost their mounts, they would be sitting ducks. The vanguard soldiers formed an arrowhead formation as they charged out. The orcs that formed a line to barricade the entrance were taken completely by surprise. They had continued to send waves of teams into the entrance to give the humans inside the illusion that they were still at full strength. They never thought that the humans inside would decide to break out once half of their forces left to chase after the human prince. The orcs were not all clustered at the entrance. Many were at the sides building up camps. They thought they would be having a long siege. Therefore, the force directly in front of the entrance was thinner than expected. The charging human army managed to punch through into the open. With the orcs' barricades cleared, the human soldiers following poured forth with little resistance. The orcs could only attack them from the side, but such attacks did not hinder their movements. Genie had also arranged so that both sides were comprised of heavy armor soldiers, their mounts were also arranged so they were only slightly less than the vanguard units. The 300 human units soon rode away from the orcs' army who watched in stupefaction. The chieftain's aide who was left in charge was bellowing at his underlings in rage. The cry brought them back to sense and everyone immediately summoned their mounts as they gave chase. Go north. We will join you soon, Genie received Jack's message. Jack's team had made a turn northward as Genie's troops charged out from the entrance. His turn brought him close to the one side of the orcs' troops who fanned out. When these enemies got close, some of the human soldiers started tossing out small balls at the approaching orcs. These balls exploded on impact and created paralyzing fields around their areas of impact. These were the disruptive bombs, which Jack had distributed to each of the soldiers in this baiting mission. Any orcs that came near were stopped by these disruptive bombs. The damage was nothing for these NPCs, but it stopped their movements and allowed Jack's team to put distance. Jack and the single mage remaining in his team were also casting arcane turbulence and put them at their heels. Those chasing after and came into the areas of these two spells got their movements slowed. Jack heard a loud roar of rage from afar. Watch out! He heard Peniel shout. Coupled by Peniel's warning and his intuition, he turned his head and looked in the direction of the roar. He caught a flash and immediately activated Dragon's Eye out of instinct. The slow motion of his vision allowed him to catch the sight of a spear flying straight at them. From its flight path, it was heading at the prince. He was directly beside the prince, Jack urged his steed to the side and saw in slow motion as his steed slowly bumped with the prince's. It altered their path slightly to the right. He was now in the spear's path instead. He bent his body down as he saw the spear slowly went past him. He could see crackles of electricity following the spear as it flew past. This was no ordinary spear throw, it was sent with a skills effect. He had no doubt that he would be a goner if it hit his body. As if to prove the case, the spear that had missed Jack and the prince, impaled an unaware level 35 soldier who was riding in the front. The single hit drained out the soldier's entire HP. The soldier fell lifelessly to the ground. There was nothing they could do but continued riding forward. Jack looked back to the origin of the spear and saw from a far distance a hulking orc with his hands on a very large crossbow. Crap! That spear was a crossbow bolt? Jack exclaimed in his mind. But it appeared that the orc could only make that one shot with the deadly skill. 
he was also standing on his feet on the ground, meaning he could not shoot that giant crossbow while mounted. So they would soon be out of the range of his shot. Jack continued to look back at that orc as his steed continued to run forward just to make sure. Luckily it was as he had expected, that orc did not fire a second bolt from that giant crossbow. The orcs continued to chase after them as they fled. They soon saw Genie's army. Jack's team joined with theirs. Continued running north. He yelled. Oh, and don't trample the eight in front. What eight? Genie asked, but he soon saw eight figures in the distance. They were standing at a fixed interval, around fifteen meters from each other. Genie immediately bellowed to the soldiers and made sure they steer clear from those eight. As they passed through, Genie saw that those eight were human soldiers as well. They continued to stand there as they waited for the orc army who was chasing from behind. What are they doing? Genie thought with puzzlement. When the orc army was close, these eight each unfurled a scroll. A long wall of plants soon sprouted out where they stood. Each wall was fifteen meters long. Since they stood at an interval of 15 meters from each other, the resulting eight scrolls created a wall with a total length of 120 meters. Jack had given all eight of his magic scrolls containing the Wall of Vines spell to these eight. Chapter 363, Endurance Contest The orcs that were rushing forward were too fast to halt their advance. They soon crashed into these walls, which then tightly bound them and held them in place. The others at the back continued to crash forward, but the wall held on. It was bulging forward due to the forward pressure, but more and more vines came out to hold and bind the orcs. The eight soldiers that had used the magic scrolls immediately mounted up and chased after the human army once their tasks were done. The orcs army at the back tried to circumvent the long wall to continue their chase, but they had lost their momentum. The human army had gone far away. Jack and Jeannie continued to urge the troops to go at high speed. Ignoring the fact that they kicked up a large dust cloud that exposed their positions. It was difficult to hide in the desert anyway. Their footprints on the sand made them easily tracked by the enemy. Unless they had decided to divide into many teams and made their enemies confused about which track to follow, like what the cavalry reserve troops had done when they tried to flee. Jack continued to give direction to the troops. He watched on his radar if any enemies were approaching, and took a different direction. Many small squads started chasing them already, but Jack snaked around with the help of his radar. Their pursuers soon bundled into a large group that combined with the still chasing left wing of the orcs army. Getting back to the main army might be difficult, but not impossible as long as they could continue to avoid any hindrance and put their pursuers at their back. Even if the orcs formed a barricade, it will be a thin one since they would need to cover a long line. They were only expecting the prince to be in a small splinter group. If they charged through with their current 300-man army, that barricade was as good as non-existent. He contacted John to ask for an update on the situation of the main army. John told him that several of the cavalry troops that separated had joined back with them. The enemy was now trying to copy their tactic and aiming for their supply carts. They were now forming a turtle shell formation encircling their supply carts and were just playing defense. From the clash at the start of the war, the orcs had suffered many casualties due to their disadvantageous position. And later they lost many of their mage and healer units again due to the charge executed by the cavalry reserve troops. If not for the prince's presence being exposed within that cavalry troops, the human army would have reaped more. However, Due to the orcs' main army shifted their focus to chase after the prince, their main army instead received a heavy blow and suffered even more casualties. In total, the orcs had lost close to half of their army at around 3,000 casualties. While the human army lost almost 1,000. The humans who were now defending the supply carts were around 1,500, the ones with Jack numbered 300, the rest were scattered around the battlefields. The orcs that were sieging the human main army numbered over 2,000, while the ones chasing after Jack's group were around 1,000, with the others roaming around the battlefield looking for stragglers. John said by his estimation Jack and the others had managed to destroy around 70% of the orcs' supply carts. 
they would not be able to maintain a prolonged battle. He was confident that the orcs would just insist on this war for another one day before they had to retreat, two days at most. He also told Jack that he better not try to reconvene with the main army at this time. The orcs' main army was currently encircling them. Even if Jack could charge his troops through these orcs, they could not break their defensive formation to let Jack's troops in. So what do you suggest us do? Jack asked. Keep running, John simply answered. Ugh, what about if we harass the orcs encircling you? We attack their main army from outside while you attack from inside. We should be doing enough damage to them. Well, if we both attack, that might be the case. But it will most likely be you attack, we still defend. We can't afford to break our defensive formation just for you. The goal now is not to trim their numbers, it is to last longer. So stop trying to be a hero and go play tag with those orcs chasing you. Play tag your asterisk SS. Jack cursed in his mind. Did he just expect them to continue running for the whole day and the whole night? Yet, that was exactly what they did. They continued to run. The players were less troubled since their game bodies were less affected by physical fatigue, but they still felt mentally tired and sleepy. The NPC soldiers were the other way around. Their regular military training allowed them to stay focused even if they forego sleep the entire night. Their bodies, however, were prone to tiredness, as with the case of their mounts. A constant fight and running the entire day had sapped their stamina. Jeannie could see through their tiredness, even though their pride as a soldier prevent them from showing it. She discussed this with Jack quietly. They saw that the orcs were also affected with the same problem, they could not continue to chase after them non-stop, hence their chasing speed was slowing down. They adjusted the soldiers' marching speed to match with their pursuers, so they slowed down as well when the orcs slowed down, to preserve stamina. Jack made sure though, that their distance would always be outside the range of that fearsome giant crossbow. Another thing that they noticed was the number of the orcs chasing them had reduced. Probably to only twice their size. The others had broken off to another place. The fact was Habisi who led the main army had sent a messenger to Yomo to call the left wing to return in aiding the siege on the enemy's main army. If not for the prince who was right ahead of him, Yomo would have led all his troops back. He kept 600 units in the chase, twice the number of their preys, while the other 400 he sent back to aid the main army. Yomo had tried to use a trick to get to his prey. When they arrived at a landscape where there were large sand dunes, he had instructed a part of his troops who still had enough stamina, to break away to behind the sand dunes and attempted a flank. In order to mask a part of his army breaking off, he had his army made a mad dash which kicked up a large dust cloud. The cloud masked the platoon which had separated. Yomo then had the main army go at an angle that forced the human troops in a direction that would have them closer with the platoon that was creeping behind the sand dunes. But Jack laughed at the attempt, all because he could see their movements easily from his radar. He simply led the troops at an angle away from both the orc forces. Yomo was morose, he had tried several other maneuvers, but the opponents continued to move in the direction away from his expectation. In the end, he could only chase after them in a straightforward and unambiguous manner. Jack continued to have the troops matched pace with their pursuers. If they stopped to rest, they stopped as well. It was not like he was trying to lose them. They could not get too far away from the main army as well, after all. So they just went in a large circle around the desert with the main army at its center, all the while playing a cat and mouse game with the orc pursuers. This continued until the next day. Both the humans and the orcs were unmounted now, most of their mounts were too tired to move already. They walked slowly with blank expressions. Their eyes were listless as their feet continued to move like an automaton. Viral Cora who had been constantly complaining the whole night had also stopped chattering, she probably was too sleepy to talk now. Jack was still fine since he was used to spending a day or two without sleep playing games during special occasions where the developers handed out quests or rewards for a limited time. The others though, were not faring so well. By the look of it, 
the players might succumb to their mental fatigue before the soldiers. Now it was just a contest of endurance with their pursuer. Who gave up first would be the loser. Before noon, Jack finally received the message he had been waiting for. Hey, expert. I see that you are still alive. Come back to the main army, John's message said. Chapter 364, Reconvene with the Main Army Jack did not mind the guy's insensitive comment, he was just glad that this would be over soon. He heard some drumming sound in the distance. The orcs started to move away after this drum sound was heard. He assumed the sound contained some messages that only the orc understood. This must be how they communicated in the field, since they didn't have instant communication system like the players. That sound just now must have called for them to regroup with the main army. As the orcs left, they also headed in the same direction, making sure not to get too close with the marching orcs. When they arrived back at the place where the main battlefield used to take place, they saw both armies were lining neatly opposite each other. Jack and the others joined back with the main army. Bailey was there, she went to receive Prince Alonso. She had managed to break free from Habisi and the other orcs after providing enough time for the prince to escape. She had been searching around the battlefield in vain for the prince before regrouping with the main army and was told by Captain Salem that the prince was safe with Jack. In the empty space between the two armies, the leaders of the humans and the orcs stood facing each other and appeared to be conversing. The players went forward to the front of the army to where John and Captain Salem were standing. What are they doing? Having after war chats? Jack asked John. Something like that, John replied simply. Should have known to not ask this a whole, Jack grumbled in his mind. Captain Salem was more considerate. He told Jack that both parties had decided on a ceasefire. The leaders were discussing the terms and agreeing on non aggression for a determined timeline. There is such a thing? Jack asked. Apparently there is. It's their culture. At least for the humans and orcs, John commented. Good thing there is no casualties amongst the dukes and the others, Jack said, but he could see most of them had their HP less than half already. I was worried there will be some that die, considering they fought for entire day and night. They only fought to prevent the other from interfering with the battle of the army, Captain Salem explained. They were not really serious to fight to the death. There was also Laron present, it would be difficult to kill someone if the high priest intends on keeping the said person alive. That overseer beside the warlord is also a master shaman, his healing prowess was not low either. I thought they were fighting separately. They were at first, John said. But when the high priest started healing the others that were low in HP, the orc master shaman did the same as well. Anyway, glad the war is over. It is really over, right? Jack asked. Looks like it, for now, Captain Salem said. Great, I was sleepy as hell, Jack said, he looked to the side and saw some of the players were already lying down on the sandy ground, uncaring of the soldiers around who gave them weird looks. Oh, so you guys haven't slept? I had a really nice sleep last night inside the defensive formation, John gloated. Jack completely ignored the guy as he asked Captain Salem, so how long will this peace talk last? Can I go to the back and assembled my tent first? Before Captain Salem could reply, a thundering voice suddenly resounded, who is the outworlder that killed my son? Show yourself. Jack looked over and saw that it was the aide of the warlord who had made the shout, the one that they called the overseer and master shaman. I'm Badu Thick Skull. Overseer of the Army of Warlord Abasai Raretooth. I demand the Outworlder who was with the Prince to show himself. You have the guts to kill my son and yet did not dare to show yourself? Coward. An orc came over to the Overseer's side, he then pointed in the direction of Jack. Badu's eyes stared straight at Jack as he shouted, You? Coward. Are you the one that killed my son? Are you so coward to deny it? Jack was stumped by the sudden allegation. He yelled back, The hell! Mister, I don't even know who your son is. My son is Wangam Thick Skull. 
you killed him when you are with the prince. Oh, Wang Gom. Now he remembered. It was that grunt orc who he had killed together with the captain of his team when he was saving the prince. Oh, that piece of crap is your son? I'm sorry. I was saving the prince at the time, I have no choice but to do it, Jack said. Jeannie rolled her eyes at him. Do you have to apologize and insult people at the same time? John, on the other hand, gave him a thumb up. Hearing Jack's words, Overseer Batu roared with rage. He made a lunge forward, but both Duke Alfredo and Commander Quintus came and stood on his path. Batu, stop. Warlord Abasai stepped in. Batu stopped, but his body was still trembling with rage. Commander Quintus said, death is common on the battlefield. It is not just that outworlder who killed your son, my soldiers play a part as well. Your son had also killed many of my soldiers. Are you to deny his honor like this? Do not teach me about honor, human. Badu roared. I have no problem with your soldiers. As you said, this is war. It is our duty to fight. But these outworlders are different. They are outsiders. They know nothing of our honor. Warlord Abasai said to Duke Alfredo, Duke, give me that outworlder, I will promise you support of peace from our clan against your kingdom, and I will send you conciliatory gifts when I get back to my clan. I am sorry, those outworlders are our comrades. We are not going to sell our comrades, the duke replied without hesitation. Humph. Are you saying they are worth our wrath? They are just weak outsiders. Let me tell you, these weak outsiders are the reason that you failed this war. It was thanks to their plan and their cooperation that we managed to beat you back despite your superior number. Warlord Abasai frowned when he heard it. The duke didn't sound to be lying. Badu was unwilling, he yelled, I don't care. If you don't give me that outworlder, I'll... Badu, control yourself. Warlord Abasai called out. But... There will be time for revenge, now is not the time. Badu gave a death stare at Jack, he knew it would not be possible to take his vengeance now. After all, he was also the one that had reasoned with the warlord to stop the war. With the supply carts they had at the moment, it was only enough for a return trip to their nation. If they insisted on continuing the fight, they would be left with the decision to go all out against the human army and hopefully steal their supply carts when they defeated the human. There was no reason for this desperate do-or-die option. Not to mention the probability of winning was also not that high. The supply carts not only housed water and food, but also recovery potions. Natives didn't have the magical space bag like the outworlders, so they had to carry the potions physically on their belts or backpacks. The army had been fighting with limited recovery potions and they had also lost a significant amount of healers due to the charge by the human cavalry reserve troops. So even though they still outnumbered the humans, the chance of victory was actually rather low. That was of course before he learned of his son's demise. Now he wished he had counseled the warlord to continue fighting. He roared loudly before turning away, pushing all the orcs that were in his way. Great, now I got another high-level native enemy. Is this luck stat of mine really working? Jack complained in his mind. With your personality? Even triple your current luck stat will not be enough to avoid more enemies, Peniel commented. Warlord Abasai gave a last look and said, I congratulate you on your victory, Duke Alfredo. The glory this time is yours. Do understand that I will claim it back for my honor. He then turned around and left. Wait. Duke Alfredo called out. What is it? Our conversation should have finished, Warlord Abasai stopped and said, but didn't turn back to look at the Duke. Our army's movement. You should have found out about it from someone. Can you let me know how you come to this information? Warlord Abasai snickered and said, Your second prince. He then walked away. There was no need to protect the second prince, he was not an ally after all. Let the princes of Themisphere fought amongst each other. 
that should weaken the country enough to allow an opportunity for an invasion. The orcs started to retreat in an orderly manner. Warlord Abasai came to the side of the fuming Badu. Badu noticed the presence of his leech, and said, I'm sorry, my lord. This rage has taken over me. I find it hard to control it even with this age of mine. I'm truly ashamed. There is no shame in it, Warlord Abasai said. I will carry this vengeance with you as well, Wagam was also a part of my army after all. But as you see, that Outworlder is protected by the Themisphere Kingdom. We can't do anything to him if he continues to stay inside the kingdom. One way to solve that is to invade their country, but in order to do that, our Rare Tooth clan has to become the first clan, our chief becomes the Grand Chief. I will do all I can to make that happen, and then we will both get our revenge, my humiliation here, and the loss of your son. I will put everything in me to support that into reality, my lord, Badu said passionately. Warlord Abasai had a moment of silence before he said, There is probably a need to change our nation's policy once we are back, I will talk with my father, the chief, once we are back. What policy is that, my lord? We should stop disregarding our nation's outworlders. Chapter 365, Atonement Commander Quintus reorganized the army once the orcs retreated. Multiple tents were erected. Everyone needed to rest after the long fight. Especially the ambusher troops which had been constantly chased around all night. The main army still had the chance to rest yesterday night since they could alternate between the ones who rested with the ones who defended. The orcs main army had also done the same. Jack took out his small camping tent, he did not intend to wait for the army to finish setting up the tents. However, before he could get into his tent, he heard a commotion. He looked over and saw Samuel kneeling down in front of the prince. Jack walked over and found that Samuel had just found out about the matter with Ronnie. He was the one who had recommended Ronnie to become one of the prince's personal guards. He had been so confident when he vouched for him, but the guy turned out to be a traitor. I have gained the intel directly from that traitor, Samuel. I know you are not aware of his treachery. You are not at fault, Prince Alonso said. No. My unawareness of his treason itself is a sin. I should have found out before he does any damage, but instead, I did not. I thank heaven for not allowing his mission to succeed. If that had happened, even killing myself a hundred times will not be enough for atonement. Now, I will only need to die once to atone for this sin. He pulled out one of his two tomahawk axes, he put it in front of his neck to slash it. Jack did not know when an NPC wanted to commit suicide, they would just require one slash by themselves, or they had to hack themselves repeatedly until their HP reached zero. If it was the latter, it would be rather comical. Still, he didn't wait to find out. In his half-sleepy state, his hand instinctively slashed out with his storm breaker. A crescent light hit the tomahawk axe that was just about to dig into Samuel's neck. Jack's attack was nothing for this high-level NPC, but the impact was enough to halt Samuel's attempt. What is the meaning of this? Samuel looked at Jack angrily. What a drama queen, uh, I mean, king, Jack uttered, drowsily. If you really want to atone, giving your death is worthless, that is the easy way out. You should instead give the prince your life. You should work your whole life for the prince to make up for this sin that so bothered you. That will be more beneficial to the prince, rather than you just leave now and let the prince fend for himself. Now, since you already decided to give your life and death to the prince, then you have to wait for his permission first before you kill yourself. Samuel's angered expression turned complex after hearing Jack's words. Despite his emotional state, he appeared to be seriously contemplating Jack's words. What Mr. Stormwind said was right, Commander Quintus added. You have served under me for a while, Samuel. I never pegged you for a coward who will choose the easy way out. I am not a coward. Samuel exclaimed. Then give your fate to the prince to be decided. I, Samuel prostrated himself. My prince. 
I give you my life. Please decide what you wish to do with me. I will adhere to your command. Prince Alonso looked at the prostrated officer. He closed his eyes for a while before opening again and said, In this war, I have also done mistakes. If I didn't act as I did and forced myself to join the cavalry charge troops, things should have gone as planned. Instead, many soldiers had lost their lives because of it where they would be otherwise still alive. Even though I was not the ones that killed them, I also bear such sin and responsibility to make up to them. The prince stared at Samuel sharply, I declare that you are to keep your life and use it to help me bring balance and stability to our kingdom. Now that we know that this war was brought forward due to my second brother's scheme, and my first brother had sent an assassin on me, I can't pretend to not vying for power with them anymore. With all of you who are willing to support me, I will strive to become the king that deserves all your efforts. Jack could see the officers and the soldiers who heard the prince was rather motivated by his speech. That young prince was now giving more of the vibe of a monarch compared to the previous. This cadet had truly grown after this ordeal. Even his level had increased another level again to 27. Jack was however too tired to think about it all, he slowly walked back to his tent. Storm wind. Jack looked back when his alias was called. Samuel was the one who had called him. Thank you. He said. Jack simply smiled and waved at him, he really was very sleepy. Before he entered his tent, he saw Jeannie who should have been equally tired as him. She was calling those that had lied on the sandy ground, to wake up and go sleep in the large tent the military had erected. Such a responsible leader, Jack thought as he headed inside his tent. The army ended up spending the whole day and another night to rest. There were plenty that had been wounded in the war. The healers were hard at work to heal them to a stable condition. After Jack woke up, he had gone around the battlefield where he had led his team in ambush. He wanted to check if there was still any loot lying around, which only drew a mocking laugh from Peniel. She reminded him again that dropped loots only lasted for three hours. Even if he went directly to search for the loots when the orc army left, he would still not find any loots left. He spent the remaining free time practicing spell formation. He also leveled up his storm breaker. He fed Ronnie's venomous viper sword to it, bringing it up directly five levels, and used its poisoning ability. Storm breaker, level 35, rare one-handed sword, bound weapon. Physical damage 195. Attack speed 3. Cannot be destroyed. Bound to storm wind. Dexterity plus 6. 15% chance to cause poison status effect on each attack. Over limit, release the weapon's hidden power that adds an additional 200% damage as chaos damage, increase weapon range by 2 feet, and decrease target's defense by 70%. Duration 120 seconds. Cool down 8 hours. He had also used his gemstones for rune crafting. He had four gemstones in his bag, emerald, amber, diamond, and amethyst. The emerald and amber were useless for now since their elements were wind and earth respectively. He took out the uncommon diamond and rare amethyst gemstones. Amethyst was of lightning element so it was compatible with both his rune stone of probability and rune stone of luck. Peniel explained to Jack that diamond was a special gemstone that had no element, and was compatible with all elements making it the most valuable of all gemstones. She also explained that the uncommon compatible gemstone would give 50 elemental energies, while the rare one gave 200 points. Meaning these two gemstones had a total of 250 elemental energies if he used them on lightning-based runestone. His runestone of luck was of rare grade and required 1000 elemental energies to upgrade to super rare. So he would not be able to upgrade it at this time. He decided to use the rare amethyst on runestone of probability and the uncommon diamond on runestone of luck. After injecting the energy, the runestone flared up and upgraded from uncommon grade to rare grade. Runestone of probability, rare runestone. Increase approximate 25% success chance to auxiliary jobs. Elemental energy required for upgrade, 110-1000. 
there was another surprising event after the orcs retreated and the war ended. Same event but happening to two persons. The first person was John, he announced that he had received something called a talent after the war ended. The talent was named Strategist. It increased his intelligence by 10% and all NPCs under his command received an additional 20% damage and stamina or mana. Hearing his claim, Jeannie said that she also received one. Hers was called Motivator, it increased her wisdom by 10%, and all NPCs under her command received an additional 20% defense and HP. Everyone joked that they should form a joint command army then. Their combined bonus would give an all-around upgrade to the NPC's prowess. Jack, on the other hand, was feeling glum. Although their talents only give a boost to one stat while his was two, the ability it gave sound much more useful compared to his. His investigator talent only gave him an unreliable ability to detect clues from the environment and lies from NPCs. Still, he was happy for them. Those talents they got do indeed suit their persons. Chapter 366, Like a Hero In the morning of the next day, they resumed the expedition again. Since the army had decreased in size, they could not afford to have three vanguard troops as previously. Commander Quintus only spared Jack 200 soldiers to be used as vanguard troops, with numerous individual scouts which spread out around the main army for early detection in case the orcs decided to return. Although a ceasefire agreement was reached with the Orc army, they still couldn't afford to be careless. With only one vanguard troop, the experience gathered was less rapid, but still more abundant than if they did monster grinding normally. Before the expedition resumed, Jack thought that he had caught up in level with the others after killing Wang Gom. Only to find out dejectedly that the others had reached level 28 in the war, still placing the others ahead of him. Jack did not see an increase in the soldiers' powers despite John and Jeannie's talents. He thought probably because the commander had appointed him as their leader instead of those two. So, their talents' effect was not triggered. The monsters they encountered were still mostly giant scorpions and flame tigers. Only when Captain Salem informed him that they were close to their destination that they met the last monster in Jack's hunting quests, tricolored cockatrice. The monster looked like a giant rooster with scaly skin, a lizard tail, and bat wings. Its lizard tail was green in color, its scaly body bronze, while its rooster head was red. Thus, the three colors in its name. It could not fly though despite the wings, so it's easier to organize the soldiers against them. Flying monster would just fly over the formation, making the formation useless. However, the fights were still tough. Apart from these monsters having an average level of 40, after being sufficiently damaged, these cockatrices would unleash a projectile attack from their eyes that paralyzed the ones that got hit. The paralyzed soldiers would be immobile and open for attacks. Luckily, the cockatrices could not use this attack often, so another soldier just went up to cover for his paralyzed comrade. Nevertheless, these cockatrices liked to attack in a large number so if they all used these paralyzing attacks at the same time, it still caused a headache since a large number of soldiers would be incapacitated for a duration. They continued to advance at a steady pace while obliterating the tricolored cockatrice. Soon, the outline of a structure could be seen in the distance. Was it another mirage? In the two days since they resumed the expedition, they had seen such images twice, and both times had proven to just be mirages. When several small ruins were seen in proximity, they then exhaled a breath of relief, it was no mirage. When Jack opened his map interface, he could see the large structure they saw in the distance had the name written, Temple of Divine Squall. They had finally arrived. The large structure in the distance was not the only ruins. There were lots of small size ruins spread out with the temple at its center. The layout made it seem that this place was most likely a bustling town in the past. Now, there were only ruins left, roamed by monsters. The vanguard troops continued onward as they cleared out the monsters and made their way to the temple. Suddenly, three strange-looking monsters blocked their path. It was unlike the tricolored cockatrices which they had been fighting all this time. 
these new ones looked more like a giant lizard than a rooster. Jack used his god eye monocle to scan them. Ruin Basilisk, Elite Monster, Magical, Level 45. HP, 92,000. Warn the soldiers to not look at their eyes when they started to glow, Jack heard Peniel's urgent sound. Jack was puzzled, but he trusted the fairy enough to immediately relay the command. However, it was too late for the ones at the front. The basilisk's eyes were already shining brightly even as Jack gave the command. The ones in front who were staring directly into the creature's eyes felt their bodies stiffened. To their comrades' horror, their bodies slowly turned into stone. Is that stone effect permanent? Jack asked Peniel. For the native, it is as long as the battle is still ongoing. They will turn back if you kill the basilisk, Peniel answered. For you outworlders, you will be petrified only for a certain duration of time. Not that he planned to send players against these monsters, they were still too low level for these monsters. Jack proclaimed to the soldiers that the ones who turned into stone will return back once they could kill those three basilisks, this motivated the soldiers into action. You know, I have always been wondering. How do you know about all this seemingly new information? John asked from the side. The other players nodded in agreement. Jack replied truthfully, I heard voices in my mind. Which the others just treated as he did not want to tell them how he knew what he knew. These basilisks' level was higher than the average soldiers in the vanguard troop. Hence Captain Salem took to himself to engage one of the three. The other two were handled by another two night lieutenants while the others gave supports. The battle was troublesome as the basilisks could use their petrifying gaze quite often. Every one minute their eyes would start to glow and the soldiers would have to look away to dodge the gaze's effect. But this caused an interruption in their assaults and created an opening for the basilisks. At one time, the basilisk fighting one of the night lieutenants swept its thick tail onto the lieutenant when he turned away to avoid the petrifying gaze. The lieutenant was smashed heavily and flew far away. This allowed the basilisk to charge into the other soldiers and created havoc. Several casualties resulted before the lieutenant came back and stabilized the situation. The monster's scales that covered their bodies also had magical properties that absorbed most impacts. Causing the damage delivered by the soldiers to be nerfed. The battle took a long time, long enough for the main army to catch up. They had just managed to get the three basilisks to half their HP. The other elite soldiers from the main army came and lent a hand. The situation turned better after their assistance. As they thought the situation was already under control. A large shape jumped onto a nearby ruin. It was another ruin basilisk, but this one was at least three times the size of the ones they were fighting, whose size was already bigger than a normal car. Ruin basilisk, special elite monster, magical, level 55. HP, 230,000. It was a special elite version, so high a level some more, Jack exclaimed after he inspected the monster. As it made itself known, its eyes glowed. Look away. Captain Salem instructed. They did so, yet the glow was reacting differently. It shot out and rained on an area. The soldiers within that area instantly turned to stone despite not looking at the creature. Shit. This one is different. Bowler shouted. The special elite ruin basilisk's eyes glowed again. What? No cooldown. As they looked with despair at the eerie glow, a soothing blue breeze swept through the crowd. The eerie glow of the basilisk clashed with this soothing breeze and was dissipated. Jack turned and saw Laurent floating forward. We are safe. As Jack was watching Laurent's figure as if a saint gliding through the air, a large yellow spear shot out from behind him with lightning speed. Jack turned back in time and saw the magic spear stabbed at the giant ruin basilisk. The spear detonated and created a shockwave that thrown the giant body tens of meters back, destroying all the ruins in its path. Another figure flew forward, overtaking Laurent as he put himself in front of the giant ruin basilisk. Duke Alfredo had arrived, and he alone was more than enough to deal with that monster. It was much weaker than the rare elite Grim Sand Drake after all. They are doomed. 
Jack exclaimed as he saw the Duke waved his hand. Several crimson chains shot out from the ground and bound the three ruined basilisks who first appeared. They were already at disadvantage dealing with so many soldiers. Now that their movements were bound, they were just target practices. Laron cast a spell. Soft light descent from the sky and covered the ones that had turned into stone. The stony surface slowly peeled off and revealed healthy skin. All the ones that had been petrified soon were back to normal again. Yet. Yeah. Go, go, Sir Duke. You are amazing, Mr. Laron. Bowler was shouting his throat hoarse. Seeing these two incredible natives saved the day, the players couldn't help their desire to get stronger soon. They too yearned for the day where they were able to swoop in and save the day like a hero. Duke Alfredo's magic power rained down on the giant ruin basilisk with a colorful display. His spell was further boosted by Laron, causing the already powerful spell to become more destructive. The rate by which the giant ruin basilisk's HP went down was even faster than the three smaller ones. Chapter 367, Temple of Divine Squall When the giant ruin basilisk died, the other three were already in critical states. Duke Alfredo turned to the three and was about to cast his spell when Jack promptly shouted at him, Your Grace, wait. Just let us finish these three. There is no need for you to trouble yourself. Duke Alfredo chuckled and said, It's no trouble. Three spears of light impaled the three basilisks and sent them to their graves. At number dollar. Jack was peeved. He was not really worried about troubling the Duke he simply didn't want the duke to shave away the exp points. When the giant ruin basilisk died, the players received no exp at all as they didn't involve with the combat in any way. While for the three smaller basilisks, even though the soldiers under them contributed the most in chipping the monster's hp, the final blow still generated a large portion of the exp points. Now that the duke was the one dealing the killing blow, it was similar to taking away half of their income. Out of the two days' journey, in addition to these three ruined basilisks, many of the players had reached level 29, with the remaining still at level 28. They were only one level away from reaching the level where they could attempt their elite class trials. Jack himself still stayed the same, at level 27 warrior and 26 mage. For the dropped loots, they distributed equally among themselves as usual. Same as previous. Jack's gains were primarily on the souls. Even for the giant ruin basilisk which he got no EXP from, he still received its full souls. There were 72,112 souls inside his container. Not as great as what he got from the war, and far from what he got from the Grim Sand Drake, but he could not expect every monster to give a crazy amount as that Drake. He used 70,000 souls to level up Sword of Light to maximum, and Arcane Turbulence to level 5. Sword of Light, level 20 20ths, Active Skill, Star, 1. Sent Sword Energy in a linear direction, Sword Energy deals 600% physical damage, 30% added critical chance. Range, 10 meters. Cooldown, 2 minutes 54 seconds. Stamina, 70. He might be the only player in this game world that had so many skills and spells maxed out already at this stage. The others could only level up theirs by using free points from level up or skill books which were very rare. They had also got a few of these skill books from the minions killed during this expedition. At that time, Jack showed no interest and just let them bid for it amongst themselves. The others thought that he was being magnanimous for not fighting for the books. Some of Jack's spells had also upgraded after repeated usage. His mana bullets and energy bolts had reached the third star. His power strike which was originally at the head start had lacked behind since he mostly only used ranged attacks to support the soldiers during this expedition. After the ruined basilisks were disposed of, they did not meet any more opposition on their way to the temple. Before long, they arrived at the outside of the temple. It was more like a ruin rather than a temple. Most of its walls and roofs were gone, but at least it still looked like a structure, unlike the starlight ruin which he saw in the past that completely had no roof anymore. 
Commander Quintus organized the soldiers to station around the huge structure and sent out several scouts to the perimeter to watch in case the orcs returned. Duke Alfredo led a small team to begin an investigation into the temple. He was most eager to complete this expedition. All the outworlders were included in this team. The inside of the temple was strangely empty, devoid of monsters, as shown by Jack's radar. Probably they had been scared away by the huge army. Jack thought. They continued to proceed through the empty hallway until they reached the main hall which was surprisingly fully intact. At one side of the hall was a large stage which should be where the orator made their speech. But instead of a preacher, there was a strange-looking opening on the wall behind the stage. It looked as if silvery liquid material was constantly moving around on the vertical surface. Most of the players recognized that energy portal. Dungeon entrance. Giant Steve exclaimed. Dungeon entrance? We call it Outworld Gate, Duke Alfredo said. Mostly because it can only be entered by outworlders. The duke then instructed his men to spread out and searched through every inch of the temple for clues on the Duchess Cure. Jack and the others went and studied the dungeon entrance. So, is there anyone who volunteers to go in and take a peek? John asked. Why don't you go in yourself? Bowler said. The main character doesn't do that, we usually give that job to the expendable side characters. I curse your mother for side character. Now, now, be civil and leave parents out of our quarrel. Jeannie ignored the two squabble. He said to Jack, it shouldn't be dangerous for a peak, right? The dungeons we have encountered showed that we can just come back out again from the same place we enter. If it is too dangerous, we can just immediately hop out. There is no guarantee that every dungeon is the same, Jack said. Inside his mind, he asked Peniel, is that, right? Yes. High-level dungeon's entrance has the chance of serving only one way, Peniel answered. Still, we won't achieve anything if we don't give it a try, Jeannie said. True. All right, let me be the one to test the water, Jack offered. Buller, who heard, immediately said, bro, there is no need for you to take the risk. John immediately concurred, that's right, you should leave the task to side characters. Bowler turned his glare at John, which John gleefully ignored. While they were conversing about what to do, the Duke came over to Jack. How is the search, your grace? Jack asked. The Duke's face was glum. My men have returned. They found nothing. I have instructed them to repeat the search but I have little expectation. He seemed to struggle before he spoke, it seemed that this outworld gate is the only significant thing in this temple. I'm afraid whatever it is that we are searching for will be inside it. Unfortunately, we natives can enter this gate. I'm terribly sorry to put this on you, but will you do me a favor and go in to take a look? At that time, Jack heard system notification that informed him that he had completed part three of the chain quest, accompany Duke Alfredo to the Temple of Divine Squall. He received decent EXP points and coins. Another notification soon popped up of Part 4 of the chain quest, enter the dungeon to search for Duchess Cure. Jack was silent while he conversed with his trusted fairy, I will lose the protection of the army if I go into that dungeon. Do you think there is a chance that I can complete this quest? If it is a bona fide SSS quest, I would say no chance in hell. But then again, remember when I told you I'm not too convinced that this is an actual SSS quest. So it's a gamble then. What's to worry about? It's a dungeon, you will only lose one level, even if not considering your immortal soul. You have taken a much more ridiculous risk when you were facing that grandmother spider and grim sand drake. That's true. All right then, it's decided. Jack accepted the quest, it will be my honor, your grace. Duke Alfredo clapped Jack's shoulder as he looked at Jack in gratitude. The others looked at the two in envy, how the heck did Jack manage to befriend a high-ranking NPC to this extent? At the same time, Jack also received another notification. His influence skill, an auxiliary skill under social jobs, 
had upgraded to intermediate apprentice. Peniel had explained to him that this particular skill was gained by getting to know and increase the affinity with influential natives. In which Duke Alfredo, Prince Alonso, and such, clearly fell into this category. The effect of this skill, however, was vaguer. Peniel described it will increase the earned reputation and affinity, and influence natives' viewpoints and reactions upon him. The later part was oddly similar to the effect of the diplomacy skill. With this, all his social auxiliary skills were in intermediate apprentice grade. Jack didn't care though, these auxiliary skills were just sideshows for him. If they increased, it's good. He would not specifically try to strive for them. Okay, you lots. Make your preparation, we will be going in, Jack said to the others. Wait a minute. He only asked you. Why do you drag us also? John protested. That quest that you got from me, is it completed already? Jack asked. No. It required us to help you complete this expedition. Clearly, reaching this place is not yet considered complete. Still want to see if I can boot you out of the quest. Give us a minute to prepare. Chapter 368, Traps while the others were preparing, Duke Alfredo gave something to Jack. The description of it was an alert beacon, it would let the surrounding expedition soldiers notice his position and come to his aid. Ain't this similar to the Themisphere beacon stone that is still inside my bag? Jack thought. Duke Alfredo said, of course this thing is useless when you are inside. But there had been stories that tell about the exit of Outworld Gate to be different from the entry point. So in case you find yourself in another part of the ruin when you come out, use this beacon to let us know your position. Thank you, Jack said. If possible, he was not planning to use it thought. In that way, he might get another beacon stone that could summon the surrounding native soldiers. He already had a plan of what to use for the first beacon stone, but it had to wait until he was back to the capital. While everyone else made their own preparation, he also made his. He took out an enhanced whetstone and ate a sweet dumpling. Boosting his base attack by 30%. Once everyone was ready, the players stood in front of the silvery portal gate. Duke Alfredo and Prince Alonso stood to the side, bidding them good luck. Jack looked at his friends. Ladies first. He asked. Ladies my ass. You are the one with the quest. You go first. Viral Cora uttered. Jack shrugged, he was just teasing them. He did plan to enter first. Without further ado, he stepped into the silvery liquid-like surface. The experience he got was roughly the same as the last time he entered a dungeon, although it was longer this time. When he came about. He was in a stony hallway. Hey! Am I just being transported to another room of the temple? He thought. The reason he thought that way was because he had passed through the same looking hallway before when he was walking with the Duke to the main hall. It's not the same, he heard Peniel's voice. Look, there were no climbing vines in sight. And the lighting apparatuses were all still intact and working. You don't mean? Yeah, I think this is what the temple looked like when it was still in its heyday. Hmm. That's odd. What is? My radar. It's empty. At this time, the air next to him trembled, then it rippled as if it was a surface of the water before Jeannie popped up out of thin air. Hey, she said to Jack, then looked around alertly, her spear in her hand. We are safe here, Jack told her. Well, if his radar was correct, then he could say there was no danger here at all. But he remembered several times already when his radar was acting up. From the undetected swamp croc to the time where its range was severely limited in the cave with the ice mana site. Probably this time it was a situation where it was completely incapacitated. Several more ripples appeared in the air, and more players popped out. In a matter of seconds, all 16 players were standing in that empty hallway. They looked around before realizing that there was no gate for exiting. F asterisk CK. 
who was the one that said this dungeon might not be like the other dungeons that have an exit at the place we enter? See how we have been jinxed. Bowler cursed. I did, Jack announced. Well, if it's you, then it's okay. Everyone rolled their eyes at Bowler. Which way? The man asked. They were in the middle of the hallway, there were two opposite paths stretching out. The dungeons they had gone to or heard from others, always had one direction to go after they entered. Hence, everyone was at a loss here. After a few moments of silence, Jack said, this way, and started walking. Oh? Is there something that made you pick this direction? Bowler asked. No. I saw that everyone had no idea. So I just simply pick one, Jack answered. Everyone was speechless hearing his reason. A wrong decision is still better than no decision. Come on, or do you want to rot here thinking yourself till eternity? Jack said, then continued his walk. Jeannie walked after him, John trailed not far behind. The others soon followed. The hallway was very long. They went for quite a while. Is this really the temple in its past? I don't remember the hallway in the temple ruin is this long. He asked in his mind. You can't really consider this place as the real temple of Divine Squall, Peniel replied. A dungeon is a separate world. It was created using the real world as the model, but it's not exactly the real world. So there is a possibility this place is even bigger than the real temple of Divine Squall. Jack suddenly stopped in his track. The others who were walking behind bumped on him before they stopped as well. Why do we stop? Jeannie asked. There was nothing in front. The hallway was still going straight ahead without any turns. Jack was staring down on the floor. The reason he had stopped was because there was a red marker in his god eye monocle. He thought that his monocle had been incapacitated, turned out it was not the case but the marker only appeared after he was so close. If he took three more steps, he would have stepped on it. Is that what I think it is? Jack asked in his mind. Yep, it's a trap. Luckily, we were walking, not running. So, what should I do? Remember the disarm tool I asked you to purchase? Use it on that trap. Jack took out the tool and knelt down in front of the floor that was marked. The red marker enveloped a large area of the floor from wall to wall, so they would be sure to step on it if they wanted to pass. It was also too wide to attempt a jump. Peniel gave him instructions on how to use the tool. The others observed him in fascination. After Jack did everything as instructed, what looked like a loading bar appeared. But after he looked closer, it was a time bar, and it was decreasing rapidly. Listen carefully. You should soon hear some faint click sounds now that you are interacting with the trap. You have to trigger the tool at the same time you heard the clicks. The full sequence consists of several of the clicks, the sequence will repeat until you successfully disarm the trap or the time limit expired. You need to successfully trigger the full sequence before the time limit expired to successfully disarm the trap. Damn, so complicated. Jack complained as he tried hard to hear the faint click sound. The others were talking among themselves discussing his weird behavior, some who knew about traps told the others, while a few were asking Jack what he was doing. Hey, shut up. I'm trying to concentrate here. Jack yelled. The others were startled but realized the seriousness in his tone, so they complied. They looked on in silence as Jack was doing something to the empty tile in front. The time bar expired, he failed. Shit, are all traps so difficult? Jack asked Peniel. It is difficult because the grade of the trap is too high and your skill grade is too low. From my estimation, I think this one should be of advanced expert grade. In that case, then this will be difficult. As his detect and disarm trap skill was still of the basic apprentice grade. It's a good thing that he still received proficiency despite failing, the same as lockpicking. Jack turned and saw that the others were still staring at him in silence. He explained to them what he had just done, and then asked, Anyone here with high-grade detect and disarm trap skill? 
there is a trap in front. Weird Trap asked. Yes, what is the grade of your detect and disarm trap skill? Jack replied. Basic apprentice. Crap. Shame on you. You disgrace your name. Bro, you have a storm in your name, I don't see you using any lightning or wind skill. Wait and see. Jack said, then asked the others, anyone. Mine is advanced apprentice, Viral Cora uttered. Is that high enough? Mine is also advanced apprentice, Sunset Walking said. Jack looked at the others' expressions, then said, It appears you two are the highest. Do you have any disarm tool? I have twelve, leftovers from when I prepared them for the traps on a quest, Viral Cora answered. I have thirty, Sunset Walking informed. Okay, I have forty-nine. If you guys need more later, you can take mine. Jack decided to not use this chance to increase his detect and disarm trap skill proficiency. Now is not the time for an experiment. They could not go out to restock the disarm tool. If they ran out of the tool, they will need to trigger the trap to pass through. He doubted the penalty of an advanced expert grade trap would be light. Better to give the tool to someone with a higher chance of successfully disarm the trap. Chapter 369, Running Viral Cora approached the place where Jack was kneeling before. There is a trap in front? Strange, usually I can detect one from around 5 meters away. This one should be an advanced expert grade trap, so it is more difficult to detect. Try going nearer, Jack said. Say, what is the level of your detect and disarm trap skill? John asked Jack. Beginner apprentice, Jack answered. Then how come you can detect it while that last there who has a higher level skill can't? I also have a talent. It is called investigator. I can detect clues and stuff from the environment. That might have been the reason, Jack explained. He might not be wrong. He honestly did not know if the trap marker came up due to his talent or his god eye monocle. Found it. Viral Cora proclaimed. Jack saw that she was only a few inches away. She needed to slowly get so close in order to notice the trap. If she did not already know that there was a trap there, she would have stepped on it before she found out. Looking at how close she needs to notice it, that trap might instead be a basic master grade, Peniel said. Your 49 remaining disarm tools might not be enough to disarm all the traps in this dungeon, I don't think there is only one trap here. Damn. Why didn't you ask me to buy more? Jack complained. How do I know you will just barge into a place with such high-leveled traps? Peniel retorted. Everyone watched on as Viral Cora attempted on disarming the trap. So difficult. She exclaimed, it looked like she had failed as well. The time bar is so short and there were so many clicks in its sequence. I have no confidence to disarm this. Just try your best. Jack said. You can do it, Cora, Jeannie encouraged. Don't worry, we can just throw Bowler to trigger the trap in case you fail, John added. I will throw you first. Bowler shot back. The others gave her supporting words as well, she looked back to the trap with determination and went back to work. The second time, failed. Third, failed again. She kept on failing until her tenth disarm tool when she suddenly exclaimed, Yes. Startling everyone. You succeed. Salty Trade asked. Viral Cora winked at her with her fingers forming a victory sign. The proficiencies awarded are so generous. A couple more and my detect and disarm trap skill will increase a level, she said. Um, no worry, you will get your chance, Jack said. He had walked ahead when Viral Cora showcased her victory sign. He again detected another trap not far ahead. After he told everyone, Trinity Dawn asked, How about we take that other route back there? Maybe it is better the other way. Yeah, it appeared that you really have taken the wrong decision, Weird Trap said. I doubt that, Jack responded. Notice that we haven't met any monsters yet. I think this dungeon is instead full of traps. 
so even if we go the other direction. I'm pretty sure that we will encounter traps as well. Are you sure? Maybe we should still go and take a look. Go ahead. We will stay here and work on the traps in the meantime. Uh, easy for you to say. Only you have managed to detect the traps. Okay, let's continue this way and disarm the traps. Viral Cora only got one more disarm tool left. Not so much chance for her to succeed in one try. She failed as expected, so Sunset Walking went and took over the job. Surprisingly, Sunset succeeded in just three tries. Everybody congratulated him for that, including Jack. How odd, Jack heard Peniel's voice. About what? Jack asked as he continued forward to detect more traps. Well, we can't see the time bar nor the clicks which he had to respond to, but I've been paying attention to when he triggered his disarm tool. The frequencies by which he triggered it were less crowded than when you or that girl did it. The only reason I can think of is that his skill level is much higher. The higher the level of detect and disarm trap skill is, the longer the available time bar and the fewer the clicks that are needed to be triggered within one sequence. If you are an advanced expert grade disarming a basic apprentice trap, you might only need to trigger only one click to successfully disarm the said trap. So, you are saying that he was lying about his skill level. I'm pretty sure he is. I just don't know why, Peniel replied. Probably he is just shy. Maybe he is afraid that we will expect too much from him if we know his skill level is so high. Probably. I never understand the way you outworlders think anyway. Jack found another, and Sunset disarmed it in four tries this time. The next one in just two times, and so on. By the time they finally reached the end of this extremely long and straight hallway, Sunset only spent 24 out of the 30 disarm tools he claimed he possessed. The hallway although stopped going straight, it continued on in different directions. They arrived at an intersection that went to left and right. Crap, we are still going? How long will this be? They looked to the left and right, the hallway was again very long that they couldn't see the end on either side. So, which way now? After a moment of silence, Jack turned to the left and said, this way. Instead of asking why he picked that route, they simply followed. After walking for a while, they strangely did not encounter any more traps. But they noticed that the floor of this hallway was slightly sloping. Wherever they were heading to, it was going downward. They continued for a few minutes until they heard a rumbling sound from behind. What's that sound? They looked back the way they came. The lighting was not so bright, so they had trouble looking too far. But Jack's dragon's eye allowed him to see something that was moving in afar, and it was heading their way. After squinting his eyes to see clearer, he finally realized what it was. Shit. Everyone, run. He shouted, then started running. Everyone was confused by his reaction. Several that trusted Jack unconditionally like Bowler, Flame and the man ran after him even though they were puzzled as well. The others looked behind at the dark abyss in the distance. Not long after, they saw a huge round ball rolling out of the abyss, towards them. The ball was so large that it covered the entire hallway, there was no space to slip by. Son of a! Giant Steve didn't finish his curse as he turned back and ran as fast as he could. Everyone was now running. The slowest one was the mage who had the lowest dexterity, one of which was John. He took out a magic scroll and activated it. All of a sudden, his movement speed increased. He passed through the others. F asterisk CK. How selfish can you be? Can't you use the group spell one? Giant Steve shouted. Sorry, friend. The single target one gave more boost, he replied. I have a group haste scroll. Genie announced and used it. Everyone's speed increased. But the rumbling sound that was getting louder informed them that the ball was getting closer despite their high-speed run. Giant Steve looked back and saw how close the ball was. The gigantic ball looked even more dreadful from up close. He could see the rough and uneven texture of its surface as it rolled. Over here. 
he heard someone shouted. He looked back to the front and saw Jack was waving at him from an opening at one side of the wall. Everyone immediately ran towards that opening. Knight and Mage were the two slowest classes, Giant Steve and Trinity Dawn were at the rear of the group. They made the last leap at the opening as the ball was about to reach them. They looked back after falling to the ground and saw the huge ball passed by the opening. The passing ball caused a tremor which broke the roof of the opening, stones and rocks fell and sealed the opening. Darkness covered everything as they were cut off from the hallway where they were running a moment ago. There were none of the magic lamps inside here. Everyone cannot see anything in the complete darkness. Suddenly a bright light shone and illuminated the surroundings. Everyone looked at the source of the light and saw a small shining ball above Jack. Is that a spell? Trinity Dawn asked. Yeah, it's called Illumination, Jack replied. You can buy it from a store called Magic Association Shop in the Noble District in the capital. Once you people completed this quest and gained the writ to enter that district, you can buy it there. Save you from using a torch. Chapter 370, Monsterless Dungeon What was that just now? Looks like a trap mechanism. But we didn't trigger any trap, right? None that I know of. I felt like I am in one of those old movies where the main character was a tomb raiding dude with a hat and a whip. Where is Sunset? Upon the last comment, everyone started to look at each other. Indeed, everyone was accounted for except Sunset walking. Did he got left behind? If he did, he would be run over by that giant ball already. Everyone started to open their party system. Sunset Walking's name was still in their party, meaning he was still alive. Jack could see on his radar a lone green dot away from their position, but he saw no path in that direction. Hey, Sunset. What happened to you? You okay? Bowler sent a message in the party chat. I'm fine. I had ducked into another path. You guys go on ahead. We should be able to meet again if we continue forward, Sunset replied. Let's continue forward then, no point hanging around here, Jeannie agreed with him. They observed their surrounding. It appeared to be another corridor. A short one though, they saw it turned not far ahead. Since the place they came from was already blocked, they had no choice but to go forward. They heard some whirring sound in the distance, like the hum of machinery. The corridor took them through several turns before they came out to a slightly large room. What they saw in the room alarmed them. Four continuously spinning pillars were moving back and forth along straight groovings on the floor and the roof. They wouldn't be alarmed if the pillar was simply spinning as they moved, the problem was on these pillars were attached several long blades that slashed around at high speed as the pillars spun. The width of the room was not that wide, the blades of the spinning pillars crossed each other. The blades were positioned at different heights along the pillar, so one blade didn't clash with other blades. When the pillars aligned with each other, there would be no space available to slip by. Luckily the speed of those four pillars was not the same, so there were still windows when they were apart from each other, allowing a limited passage if one wanted to pass through to the other side. They observed the room, there was no other way out except the other side through those spinning pillars with blades. The other side was around 50 meters long. Even the slowest spinning pillar covered that distance in 10 seconds, while the fastest one only took 5 seconds. They looked at the situation with apprehension. What the heck kind of dungeon is this? The man finally asked after a long silence. Apparently, it is the kind without monster but full of traps and machinations that we need to go through, John said. The worst kind since we got no EXP exploring this dungeon unless we clear it. Jack lamented the fact that he had wasted his enhanced whetstone and sweet dumpling. What do you think the damage we will receive if cut by one of those blades? Someone asked. How about you go test it out? Another offered. Let's throw a dice and decide who goes first. No need, Jack said, he had been observing the movements of the pillars in correspondence with each other. After observing several cycles, he felt that he had grasped the timing. 
he made some internal countings and dashed forward once the window arrived. The others looked with wide eyes at Jack who rushed into between the spinning pillars without hesitation. They saw him moved, then stopped as he waited for the adjacent pillar to pass, then slipped in and ran again. The process repeated several times as he ducked in and out from one pillar to another. After a while, Jack came out to the other side. The son of A.B. asterisk T.C.H. really made it. Jack looked back and yelled at the one still on the other side. It's very easy, right? Do you guys memorize the way I did it? The others were quiet for a beat before most everyone shouted back. Easy your mom. Who the heck can memorize all that from a single viewing? How did you do it? You come back here and explain to us. John came forward and said to them, All right, all right, settle down. The path he took was actually rather effective. Now, I will copy it and let you guys see as well. Wait. Almost everyone went and grabbed him before he entered the pillar's formation. What? He uttered with dissatisfaction due to their interruption. Don't take us as the same as you who can memorize it with a single viewing. Here. Write it down and describe the sequences to us. They took out a stack of papers and a pen. What are you people, first graders? John mocked, but he still took the pen and papers and started writing. He made some drawings as he described the path to take, the timings, and during what position of the pillars was the best time to start. He also advised them that the process would more or less be affected by their dexterity stat. Those with slower movement speed would have a narrower window on each sequence, while those with higher might need to slow down and not rush ahead at some parts. Jack was waiting for them in boredom, so he started playing with casting his mage spells again to increase his proficiencies. So, everyone understands already? John asked. Um, sort of. All right. I will go and let you people see. Please pay attention. I'm not coming back here and do it again, John said. Everyone watched intensely as John walked into the pillar's formation, and he literally walked. Contrary to Jack who dashed in and out between the pillars with speed, John appeared to take a leisurely walk amongst the pillars. The cycles it took for him became more and thus resulted in a longer time, but in the end, he still managed to pass through to the other side. Damn it, do you have to act so cool? Jack said to him once he arrived by his side. Friend, being cool is my second nature, he replied, then turned back to the others and called out, It's very easy, right? Do you guys memorize the way I did it? Motherfing asked Jelly. He was copying what Jack had said to them before. The ones with range attack had the urge to throw some attacks his way. If being cool is your second nature, being damn annoying is surely your first nature, Jack commented. All right, I will give it a try, Trinity Dawn exclaimed. She followed the way John did. With a slower pace but more cycles, but she did not have it as leisurely as John. At some parts, she had to dash due to near miss. But in the end, she still made it safely to the other side. Jeannie went next then Fierce Flame, the man, and the others followed suit. In the end, there were still accidents. One of the man's underlings missed one of the timing windows and panicked. He ended up being shredded by the blades. There was no damage number or scream of pain. He just simply killed with one touch of the blade. His friend that was going next after him, another of the man's subordinates, was terrified by the sight. Going in with an unsteady heart, caused him to make a mistake even earlier and followed his predecessor. Calm down. Jeannie called out from the other side. The rest steadied their minds before making the attempt. They passed through one after the other. The last one, Viral Cora, went through the sequence fluently. He had almost reached the end when she missed the timing. Watch out. Jeannie called out to warn her. The spinning pillar was rushing at her back. To her surprise, she made a close dodge, but the sudden evade caused her to trip. She fell as another pillar was coming at her. She looked at approaching spinning blades in horror. She had already resigned herself to fate when she felt her body getting dragged away. 
before she knew it, she was already outside of the pillar's formation beside the others. She looked up and saw Jack who was still holding her body. Phew, luckily managed to make it, Jack said. What was that just now? Was that a skill? Someone asked. Yeah, it is a skill called shooting dash. At my current skill level, it allowed me to dash at high speed two times covering 7.25 meters in each dash. Since Viral Cora was very close to the finish line when she lost her footing, it was within the range of Jack's shooting dash skill. He used the first dash to reach her, and then the second dash to drag her to safety, creating a swift V-pattern movement. How the hell did you manage to get all those awesome skills and spells? Giant Steve asked. There is no need for envy, Bowler said to him, then to Jack he said, Bro, you wouldn't mind sharing with me tips and clues on how to get new skills and spells, right? I'm just lucky, Jack told them. But if any of you are in a league faction already, you should try to perform well. They are a good source to acquire new skills and spells, Jack told them what Peniel had informed him before. Thank you. Viral Cora uttered to Jack, she was sincerely grateful. Don't mention it. We are friends after all, Jack replied. Chapter 371, Puzzle Games As they continued through the dungeon, they encountered more contraptions and machinations. There was no more trap, but the contraptions they met were not any less troublesome. There was a hall with floating blocks of stone, going in a fixed direction. Left right, front back, up down, and diagonally. Some had combinations of several directions in a single block. They had to jump from one block to the other to reach the other side, crossing a bottomless abyss. Bowler took a small rock from the ground and threw it down the abyss. No sound of a rock hitting the bottom could be heard. Then there was a narrow hallway filled with apertures which arrows came out from occasionally. The hallway was too narrow so by the time they saw the arrow came out of the aperture, it would have instantly gone in the other holes at the opposite side. No amount of reflex would be able to save them if they stood in the arrow's path. The density of the apertures was rather compact, so there was no safe zone once they tried to cross the hallway. They had to memorize the timing of when an arrow was shooting out from each aperture to determine the timing of when to advance and when to stop. There was also a room where they were not in danger. In this room, they had to find corresponding tiles with ten pairs of matching diagrams amongst thousands of tiles of random diagrams. There was an hourglass with sand in it hanging from the ceiling. They had to find the matching diagrams before all the sand in the hourglass fell to the bottom. They failed several times. When they failed, the hourglass flipped to have the sand on top again, and all the tiles were reset magically. They had to start all over again. Though there was no danger, this room took a rather huge chunk of their time within the dungeon. And then there was also a place where they had to hop onto a train of carts. The carts would then move on a railway that went haphazardly like a roller coaster. During their time on the cart, there would be projectiles thrown at them, they had to either hit these projectiles to deflect them or use defensive moves to block. There was even a hall where they were at a loss as to solve the hall they needed to pull a lever which was located inside a room that they could not access. Luckily, the room was not thoroughly concealed, there were some small gaps in the wall. While everyone was looking for a clue as to how to get inside the room, Flame did a motion, a slim wolf which was slightly larger than a normal wolf appeared out of thin air. Its fur was green with some silvery lines running from its head to the tip of its tail. The fur kept on flowing as if there was a breeze blowing at it despite the absence of wind within this hall. Is that, your savage wind wolf? Jack asked. Flame nodded. So the cub had reached adulthood. The man commented, why didn't you summon it out when we were fighting with monsters outside the temple? My pet can die. If it dies, it is permanent. I have to look for another one, Flame explained. Those monsters in this expedition are all over-leveled for us. Sending my pet at them is simple suicide. She then sent her wolf through the gap in the wall. The wolf was large, but its slim body allowed it to squeeze through the gap. Once it was inside, it bit on the lever and pulled it. 
the locked door of the hall opened and they could proceed to the next hall. Is that considered cheating? Bowler asked. Whatever works, man, the man said with a grin. Flame unsummoned her pet as they all go through the open door. There were more other contraptions they had to deal with. Throughout the ordeals, they lost another two members, Salty Trade and another one of the man's subordinates. Another victim of this ill-fated quest, John commented when the first of the two died. Hey! I will really kick you out if you jinxed this quest, Jack warned. There were only eleven of them left now if not including Sunset, who was still nowhere to be seen. Jack checked his radar and was alarmed to see his green dot was not seen anymore. But when he opened his party system, Sunset was still alive in the party. While passing those rooms, they had occasionally met some traps again. Jack gave it a try and found that the difficulty was not as high as those they met at the first section of this dungeon. So he decided to try defusing the traps instead of giving his disarm tools to Viral Cora. If he was left with only twenty, he then would give them to Viral Cora. He managed to disarm most of those traps in a few tries, resulting in his detect and disarm trap skill increasing to intermediate apprentice grade. After passing through several rooms, they were now in one that displayed a large wall painting which was divided into numerous sections. Each section's placement was completely not in the correct position. Hence, the painting made absolutely no sense. It was a wall jigsaw puzzle. Jack and John stood in front of the wall staring at the painting with full attention while the others wait for their instruction. In solving the contraptions, it was always the two of them that figured out the solutions. So, the others just happily stepped aside and gave them the spotlight. Two out of three were solved by Jack, while John solved the remaining one-third. Such a pattern prompted Buller to voice out his curiosity. Bro, as irritating as it is, I do admit that this fellow is smarter than all of us, Buller talked to Jack as he pointed at John. But how come you seem to perform better than him in this dungeon? Oh? Hmm. Not sure? Maybe because I played lots of these kinds of puzzle and mystery games in the past. Jack replied with a shrug. Well, in that case, how about I offer you my conjecture? John said. Are you trying to make excuses? Bowler asked. Why would I be making excuses? John asked back with a clueless expression. Never mind. Please share your thought. To explain it. Let me first explain to you the difference between autism and savant. What? What do those have to do with my question? Do you want to listen or not? Fine, fine, proceed, Bowler replied with a sigh. All right, now I believe you know about people who had autism, right? What about savant, do you know? If I'm not wrong, it is someone with a condition similar to autistic disorder but exhibit extraordinary talent in one specific area, isn't it? Yes. Now, mind you, I need to say first that there is not yet a definitive cause of autism and savant, but if I am to use an analogy to explain the differences between them, let me use the example of computer file organization. You see, a regular person's mind has a very organized storage system. Organized persons would separate their thoughts and memories into different classifications and store them in a folder that corresponds with the files. They will then label the folders accordingly. Files about fried rice or chicken wing will be stored inside the food folder, files about dogs and cats will be stored inside the pets or scary animals folder, depending on the owner's point of view, and so on. This way, when it is needed, they can quickly search the required folder and access the information stores within. Now, an individual with autistic disorder, however, has no such folders. Can you imagine if you have thousands of files on your computer and you simply put them all on your desktop? Can you imagine the hassle to shift through those jumbles of files to look for one particular file about fried rice? That's why autistic individual appears slow and difficult in social interaction, they have to work through their complicated memories before they can formulate a proper response. They are not in any way less intelligent, their mind simply works in a different way compared to a regular person. 
Imagine if you are working with two computers that have the same processor speed. One was with the neatly arranged folders while the other was with jumbled files without any organized folder. You will surely take more time to work with the latter even if the two computers specs are the same. What about Savant? You ever wonder why people with this syndrome, despite exhibiting slow response and significant challenges in every other field, yet display superbly on one specific subject? Such as music, or art, or maths. Why such contrast? If let's says we take the computer filings analogy again. If on your desktop, there is only one folder titled music. All the files that go inside this computer, are separated between music and non-music. Music files will go into the folder, while non-music files go directly to the trash bin. Now imagine if a person, does nothing but spend his waking hours simply thinking about music. Don't you think he will become a genius musician? Bowler gave him a dull look. When he noticed John had stopped talking, he said, Dude, that's all very fascinating, but again, what does it? John cut him before he finished his words, even a mentally challenged person if focuses his or her mind into doing the same thing over and over again, he will eventually become good in it. It took Bowler a few beats to grasp what John had just said. Once he did, he swiveled to Jack and uttered, Bro, he just called you a mentally challenged person. My goodness! Did you only listen to the bad parts? John facepalmed his face. What I trying to say is, hard work matters. If you keep on doing the same thing over and over again, even if you have no talent in a field, you will eventually become good at it. Better even than a talented person who treats his or her talent poorly. Jack never turned when Bowler called, he was too absorbed trying to solve the jigsaw painting. Got it. He exclaimed not long after. Chapter 372, Maze He went and started rearranging the painting. John soon joined in. No, 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 this should be over here, he said as he made the change. You sure? Jack asked when he saw John make the change. Wanna bet? John asked back. Well, if you are certain, Jack did not take him up on the bet. The two of them continued to busy themselves on the jigsaws, some quarrelings once in a while, while the others sat at the back and watched. They had learned to let the two maestros did their work rather than interfere and get scolded. Between the two of them, the jigsaw painting which made no much sense previously started to take shape. Once they rearranged the last piece into the correct place, the entire painting glowed and a hum could be heard. Abruptly the walls on both their sides shifted, revealing eleven doors, five on the right and six on the left. What's this? Another puzzle? Giant Steve asked. So, which one should we choose? Viral Cora asked. They all look the same, Bowler said as he went around looking at the details of each door. I don't think this is another puzzle, John said. Notice the number of the doors is the same as our number. You don't mean? Yeah, I think this dungeon has decided to separate us now. They stared at the doors for the longest time. Where do you reckon they will take us? Bowler asked. Well, only one way to find out. Jack said as he walked towards one of the doors. Wait, bro. Are you not afraid that there might be a trap? Bowler said. It's more like you are afraid if you will wind up somewhere else alone and could not solve the puzzle by yourself then you will be trapped, am I right? John asked with a snicker. Bowler's expression showed that John's guess had been correct. However, thought Bowler was the only one who revealed his worry. The others could not help but felt unsettled. They too had been relying on Jack and John all this time to solve the puzzles in this dungeon. Don't worry, just use the town return scroll if you are stuck. But of course, that meant you have left this expedition and probably failed the quest. You all have a town return scroll, don't you? John said. Several of them informed that they do not have the scroll. Why the hell did you people not get one when you leave the capital? John scolded. Well, you can always try to get yourself killed by the previous contraptions, 
that should bring you out of this dungeon and back to the capital as well. That's very insensitive of you. Here, the ones don't have can take one, Jack took the scrolls in his possession and offered them. Not everyone is as wealthy as you, friend, John said. After everyone had at least one town return scroll, Jack resumed his walk to the door. He opened the door, which revealed only darkness on the other side, and then went inside without hesitation. The door closed by itself once Jack entered the darkness beyond, then disappeared like it was never there. As I expected, one door was only meant for one person, John commented. I was more amazed by that storm wind, Giant Steve said. Damn. He went inside just like that. Not even a glance back or a parting word. You expect a hug and a kiss. John said and copied Jack's action, albeit with a swagger as he went to the door next to the one Jack used. It also vanished after. He must have the confidence that we will meet again on the other side, Jeannie said, referring to Jack. Then to the others, she said, let's go. They lined up in front of the doors, each taking one door. They looked at each other. See you on the other side. See you. Be safe. Why do you take the one next to me? You got a problem with that. I don't want to be stuck with you wherever we end up. Our door is adjacent doesn't mean that we will end up at the same place. No guarantee that it won't also. Cut the crap. Just go in already. Jeannie scolded them. She then went into the door in front of her. The others went in as well. Soon all the doors vanished from sight, leaving behind an empty room. Jack reappeared in a small room. There was a brazier at the center of the room, but no fire. Around the room were seven torches with different colors of fire. Green, yellow, violet, red, indigo, orange, blue. He then went closer to the cold brazier and saw that the shape was of an eye. The torch was obviously meant to light up the brazier, Jack thought. After pondering for a while, he took the yellow fire torch and used it to burn the brazier. A yellow color light flared on the brazier. He then took the blue fire torch and burnt the brazier with it. The fire was doused instead. He didn't appear surprised by the fire going out even though he burnt it with a torch. He took a different torch, red fire this time, and lighted up the brazier. The flame returned. Next, he used the orange torch. The flame remained this time, a soft red and orange flame mixed together. As expected, he thought in his mind. He then continued with the remaining torches. Yellow went next. Afterward, he used green, then blue, indigo, the last one was violet. The famous rainbow color, or more correctly, the spectrum of visible light. Hence, the eye shape of the brazier. Once the last violet fire was mixed inside. The flame turned bright white. Jack had to shut his eyes due to the brightness. When he reopened them, the flame was gone. A section of the wall swiveled, revealing a way out of the room. He was slightly relieved. That was an easy puzzle. If the others arrived in a similar room as well, they should be able to solve it even without him or John. He hoped. When he came out of the room, he was met with a narrow hallway. Hallway again? What's wrong with this dungeon? He complained. The hallway was short, there was a turn already a few meters ahead whether he chose to go left or right. He looked at his radar, there were many green dots scattered around. Great, they were transferred to the same place, he thought. However, their positions were pretty far away. He chose one that was the closest and took the turn that seemed to head in that direction. But after he made the turn, he was soon met again by a crossroad. He took the turn then was met again by another turn. F asterisk CK. It was a maze. Jack exclaimed. He could see from his radar, that he was the only one that was moving around. Meaning the others were still inside their puzzle rooms. He continued to walk in the direction of the closest green dot. Several times he was forced by the roots away from the direction he wanted, and on several occasions he was met with dead ends, 
forcing him to go back the way he came. He saw on his radar some green dots started to move around already. They must have come out of their room as well, but all the ones that came out were the ones that were far away. After repeated attempts, he finally got very close to the green dot he was targeting. It was still stationary. He was wondering, even if he reached that dot, if that dot had not yet solved the puzzle in the room, then the door would not be revealed. So he would still have to wait outside until the one inside solved the puzzle. However, when he arrived, he saw that the room that person was in had an opened door. Eh? Why did the one inside not come out? He entered inside with curiosity. The inside was much larger than he expected. In fact, it was the same layout and size as the temple's main hall where they entered this dungeon from. There was the same large stage at the far side, but in this one, there was no dungeon entrance behind this stage. A man was standing on this stage. Sunset. Jack called out when he recognized the man on the altar. Sunset smiled as Jack approached him. I was worried, I thought you guys will not come here, he said. Have you been here long? Jack asked. He nodded. That is quite impressive of you, Jack commented. Why didn't you go and find anyone? This room is not locked. I think everyone is meant to come here. So I just wait here. Jack looked around. It would be poetic to end their journey at the same place as their starting point. Perhaps the creator meant exactly that. Chapter 373, Zombie Chow I guess you are right. You wait here then. I will go and help the others get to this place, Jack said. Wait. You won't be able to do that. They need to arrive here by themselves. Sunset informed. Eh? How do you know that? Trust me, I tried going out before. The layout of the maze changed from when I came the first time. It continued to lead me back here. Hmm. All right, I will take your words for it, Jack said. He could imagine he saw a relieved glint in Sunset's eyes. It's better that we try to solve the end game here in this hall. Once we solve it, the dungeon will be considered complete, and everyone will return to the temple. Really? And again, how do you know that? It's a hunch, Sunset said as he pointed to the floor on the stage. Look, I have been examining this hall. There is a strange indentation here that is out of place. It almost looks like something is meant to be placed on it. Jack squatted down in front of the indentation Sunset mentioned. It was the shape of a triangle. It was indeed peculiar, but considering it was so tiny, it was rather splendid for Sunset to have noticed it. Anything to be put onto it comes to mind. Sunset asked. As a matter of fact, yes, Jack answered. He pulled out something from his bag. It was a triangular pyramid, memory of Elding, the alien entity as Peniel called it that came as a result of fusing the three fragments of map. The shape and size of the base of this pyramid fit the indentation on the floor. Jack went ahead and placed the pyramid onto the indentation. A click was heard. The pyramid glowed and shot a beam on the wall behind the stage. A similar liquid silvery portal appeared at the same spot where they had gone into this dungeon when they were still at the actual Temple of Divine Squall. A dungeon within a dungeon? Jack wondered as he stared at the portal. When the silvery portal appeared, Sunset Walking who had been kneeling beside Jack abruptly stood up and lunged towards it. As he was about to touch the portal, he noticed something coming from his side. He had hoped his abrupt action to catch Jack off guard, but he was still wary enough to pay attention. Thus, he managed to erect a magic shield just before he felt an impact. He was sent skidding sideways away from the portal. Jack stood there in front of the portal as he watched Sunset with vigilance. You, you expected this. Sunset said. I have my suspicion, but I honestly hope I was wrong, Jack replied. He bent down and picked up the memory of Elding, the silvery portal vanished. Sunset's face turned dark as the portal disappeared. You seem to know from the start what this does, Jack said. So, 
what is behind that portal just now. Sunset didn't reply. Instead, he asked back, why are you suspicious of me? Too strong to call it suspicious, let's just say I felt something was wrong with you. Mostly just small stuff, the main one I guess was because you lied about your detect and disarm trap level. How do you know I lied? Even though I had more success than that lass in disarming the traps, it's still. From the time gaps between you triggering the disarm tools, Jack replied, copying Peniel's explanation. Sunset creased his brows, he did not expect Jack to watch him till that detail. Why did you separate from us? From the speed you arrived in this main hall, I assumed you knew the routes already and the answers to the mechanism. The traps also didn't seem to phase you much. Sunset was silent for a beat before answering, I was hoping you get killed by the mechanism. Oh? But if that happened, won't you lose this thing also? Jack asked as he lifted the memory of Elding. That will drop when you die, Sunset replied, and before Jack said anything, he added, even with your immortal soul, it will still drop. Jack lifted his brow, you know. Of course I do. Sunset exclaimed, his pitch was close to yelling. Considering you stole it from me. How do I not know? Stole. Jack was getting confused. Sunset walking waved his hand and his appearance underwent a transformation. His look now appeared older. His name also changed to Sunrise Gazing. He was using a disguise? Jack thought with surprise. Do you recognize me now? Sunrise shouted. There was a long silence between them, too long that it turned awkward. Jack scratched his head, I'm sorry, who are you? Sunrise almost fell. He had gone through much trouble to get a one-time use disguise tool, now that he had revealed his real face, the tool is not usable anymore. If he had known that Jack did not recognize him, he would not have wasted his time to get that tool. Do you forget already where you get that god eye monocle at the side of your face? Sunrise screamed. Realization finally dawned on Jack, oh. You are that zombie chow. Zombie chow? such a degrading nickname. Not only did Jack forget about his look, but he had even given him such an ugly title. I'm sorry, all that happened so fast, Jack said. I still cannot make heads or tails of what had happened to the world when you suddenly appeared and then so equally abrupt getting chomped by those zombies. I simply didn't have the time to take a good look at you. Sunrise's mouth twitched, he did not know how to express his anger more considering the person responsible had been so honest in expressing his sorry. Before he could say anything more, he saw something that attracted his attention. Jack saw the change in his gaze as well. Sunrise's eyes which had been so heatedly concentrated on him all this time had suddenly moved to focus on something behind him. His radar didn't show anything other than the two of them within this hall, but his instinct screamed at him to not dismiss this visual cue. He swiveled rapidly that instant as he put his sword in front of him. A clanging sound of metal against metal was heard. He jumped back urgently after feeling the impact. In front of him was a young man, clad in black-colored light armor. The countenance on his face showed surprise. You managed to block my concealed ghost attack skill? Amazing. Jack's max level parry allowed him to mitigate most of that ambush damage. The man in front of him now appeared on his radar after that attack, it was registered as a red dot now. Sound effect. Sunrise called out. Jack made a scan and saw that this was indeed the man's name. He was a level 29 rogue, he was also a part of a guild called World Maker. Quite an arrogant name for a guild, Jack thought. Other than his high level, the fact that another player was roaming around this far side of the wilderness other than his team was already an astonishing matter. Sound effect looked at Sunrise as his name was called. He then expressed a look of disdain as he said, So, you are that Sunrise gazing, another useless fool who failed to carry out Master's command. We heard you have been hiding in their wrath, never imagine you to surface here. I'm not hiding. Sunrise yelled. I am still serving master. 
I know the clue of one of the things that Master is searching for is at Capital the Wrath. I've been following it until here. Hat, you think you will get a pardon if you managed to get that thing? Sound effect gave him a mocking laugh. At least it's a start. Sunrise said. Looking at the glum expression when Sunrise uttered the words, Jack thought the guy himself did not believe his own words. Who was this master? To have them acting so devotedly for him. Jack had been silent this entire time letting them converse, he was hoping to glean a little bit of information from their conversation, since it was unlikely any of them would answer him if he asked directly. Sound effects seemed to have lost interest to talk with Sunrise, he turned to Jack and said, Do you want to hand that willingly? Or do I have to pry it off your corpse? You heard the guy, it will drop if you died. You are pretty confident, Jack praised, playing with the triangular pyramid in his hand. Ha, that should have been my words. Don't think that you are strong already just because you have the attributes from two classes. Strength also comes from equipment, skills, expertise, and tools. Currently, I am wearing all rare grade equipment at level 30, I also have a lot of non-standard skills. Don't think a backwater player like you can hope to match me. Wait, he. Shut up, you failure. Sound effect interrupted Sunrise. We will deal with you when we are done with him. We. Jack raised an eyebrow. Chapter 374, Non-Standard Skills Sound effect made a sudden lunge at him, but Jack was ready now. He stored the memory of Elding and took out his magic staff. He also did not forget to switch his title to Outworlder Slayer for a boost against players. As Jack was about to hit the approaching sound effect, he noticed a movement from above. A second sound effect had appeared above as he dived down. Facing attacks from both sides, Jack decided to block both, his magic staff summoned magic shield to block the earthbound sound effect while his sword parry the skybound one. When the earthbound sound effect touched Jack's magic shield, Jack felt no impact, it was just an image. While his sword that parried the diving sound effect made a loud clang. As Jack wanted to counterattack the skybound sound effect, the guy vanished into thin air. This time, However, his dot was still visible on his radar as Jack saw him changed position to his back. This was a similar skill to the one Red Death used during their duel, or perhaps the same. Jack turned and swung to his back while executing Power Strike. This move surprised sound effect but he still managed to send his stab to the approaching sword. The two attacks collided and sound effect was sent crashing to the wall. He landed after bouncing from the wall with a shocked expression. His HP bar was less than half. Jack was also surprised, a normal rogue would have died outright being hit by his level 35 rare sword and max leveled power strike. The guy was not kidding when he said he was geared in high level rare grade equipment. I was trying to tell you not to underestimate him, Sunset said broodingly, but he still started casting heal spell on sound effect. Jack had expected it. He cast Mana Bullet at Sunset to interrupt his heal spell once the rune started forming. Sunset had no chance but to cancel the casting and used Mana Shield to block Jack's spell. Jack ran to sound effect as he was still getting up. Halfway through, blue chains shot up from the ground and coiled around his body. He was unable to move. He found this spell to be rather familiar. It was similar to the Duke's Crimson Chain spell. Probably this was a weaker imitation of that spell. He turned to Sunrise, but the guy was still reeling from his mana bullet, so it was not him that had cast the spell. While he was looking in Sunset's direction, he also noticed the air behind the healer distorted, and then two men were revealed. One was clad in heavy armor while the other was in a mage robe. I told you not to be hasty, the mage said, apparently to sound effect. You should have activated your concealed ghost attack first before you came out from the invisibility bubble. Sunset there had noticed you before your concealed ghost attack turned you invisible. And his reaction had caused this guy to evade your ambush. You will not be able to do great things if you do not learn patience. I'm sorry, sir, sound effect replied respectfully. 
Though Jack was surprised to see this cocky rogue acting so reverentially towards this mage, he was more surprised to see the tool besides their right eyes. It was the god eye monocle, the same as what he was wearing. I didn't expect the one that had stolen from Master is also the one coming here with the key, the one wearing armor said. It is good too, saving our time from looking for you. Jack inspected them both. The mage was level 29 named Grid Hacker, while the armored guy was a level 29 knight called Graphic Z. The two were also members of World Maker. Sir Grid Hacker, Mr. Graphic Z, Sunrise greeted them. Graphic Z didn't spare him a glance. Grid Hacker asked him, what is his level? He must be wearing some kind of rare camouflage equipment that can even block God Eyes inspect. Level 27, Sunrise answered. Genie had given Jack the position of leader before they entered the dungeon, and Jack had kicked Sunrise out of the party once he confirmed the guy's intention, but Sunrise had seen Jack's level when he was still in the party. For someone that made it here, that's very low. Sound effect mocked as he drank recovery potion. Don't forget he had two classes. One with such trait will require more experience to level up, just like Master, Graphic Z said. Humph, he holds no candle to Master. He is just a thief who gets lucky, sound effects said. Of course, let's prioritize on getting the key. Someone is coming, Grid Hacker said. Finish him while he is still incapacitated by my spell. Jack also saw from his radar that a green dot was approaching. In fact, Jack had been giving instructions to this green dot to point him or her in his direction. He did not know who this green dot was, he simply waited for the dot to move towards him when he said in the party chat, for the ones in the maze to keep heading the way they were heading to at the moment. Although the maze was confusing, if they had a general direction to head to, they should be able to find a way. Just like him when he utilized his radar to come to this hall. Of course, there were a few green dots that had already been on the move at this time. Because of Jack's instruction in the chat, the others who were not the closest dot were instead been sent in the wrong direction. But Jack didn't care about those other green dots, it's the closest one that he hoped to move in the correct direction. Since his opponents also wore God Eye Monocle, his would-be reinforcement was noticed. Graphic Z and sound effect moved towards him while he was still immobilized. Graphic Z lifted his two-handed broadsword high, a pitching sound was heard as his broadsword burst in flame. He then brought the broadsword down at Jack's head, while sound effect's dagger released drilling energy as he stabbed forward. Jack waited until they made their attack, before he took out a small bead, liberty of movement, and activated it. The blue chain shattered immediately. But it's too late, the two attacks had arrived. The flaming broadsword cleaved Jack's body cleanly as sound effects drilling attack stabbed right through. Yet, their faces did not show joy. Instead, bewilderment could be seen on both. Jack appeared at their backs while his image was still in front of them. You people are not the only ones with non-standard skills and tools he said as he executed swing as a rune formation was forming on his staff. His blade cut through them both, dealing damage. A cold blue ring followed soon, dealing another damage and freezing them at the same time. Sunrise who was nearby was also hit by the ice ring. Jack was about to follow up with another slash to finish sound effect first, but a sudden black hammer slammed down on him. He felt a ton was weighing down on him as damage numbers appeared above him, he had trouble moving even one step. He glanced back and saw that it was the mage again, who now cast energy bolts. Six bolts rushing towards him, followed by mana bullet. Jack again used liberty of movement to dispel the weight that restricted him, he put magic shield in front of him while using shooting dash to barge through half the bolts and mana bullet, ignoring all the damages they caused and arriving abruptly in front of grid hacker. The mage was surprised but not flustered. He put a magic shield in front of him, his magic shield appeared to be larger and thicker than usual, probably one that had been enhanced by an evolve seed. Jack's power strike slammed on the shield. His max level power strike was boosted further by the effect of the shooting dash. This assault should have killed a mage with a single hit, 
but that evolved magic shield of his opponent reduced half of the damage, but the knockback effect still threw Grid Hacker away. Jack's shooting dash could do two dashes, so once his power strike connected, he had already dashed away to another side. He sent Sword of Light, this max level skill with the damage boost from shooting dash flew towards sound effect. Jack did not believe this skill won't kill him with a single hit even if the guy was fully clad with high-leveled rare armor. However, before the crescent light hit the rogue, Graphic Z instantaneously appeared in front of sound effect and parried the skill. The knight's HP bar dropped significantly but a healing light from sunrise brought it back up to almost full again. Jack assumed that the move Graphic Z used to defend sound effect was also another non-standard skill. No way a slow knight could move that fast to give that kind of cover. This group was all fully equipped with the best equipment and skills, the fight would be troublesome. Graphic Z took out a magic scroll and activated it. When Jack saw that, he had started running. No matter what the spell contained within, it would be harder to hit him if he moved rather than standing still. Jack formed a spell formation as he ran. Chapter 375 Juggling. Jack felt the floor beneath him trembled before several large spikes burst out. He jumped at the last minute, evading the spikes, and fell to the floor rolling. In his hasty move, he glanced at Sound Effect who also activated another magic scroll. The spell formation on Jack's staff was completed as the barrier spell took effect just as a sea of flame erupted around him. He felt the flame did continuous damage but his barrier held. From within the flame, he saw Grid Hacker also took out another magic scroll. Crap. These guys were as spendthrift as him. Jack exclaimed in his mind. The scrolls he had left were only wind jet, recovery ones, and haste scrolls. He was completely at a disadvantage here. But before Grid Hacker could activate his scroll, a magic bind restricted his body, Jack looked at the entrance and saw that Trinity Dawn was there. His reinforcement had arrived. Thank goodness it was not Buller, Jack secretly celebrated. Trinity Dawn could see the situation and the urgency in Jack's party chat that these people were not friendly, so she took action once she arrived. Spell formations continued to form one after another as she sent them to Grid Hacker. Her speed of casting was marvelous. Arcane Turbulence, followed by Ice Nail followed by another offensive spell which she had not revealed before. A rotating wheel of blades materialized and advanced towards Grid Hacker, attempting to cut him in half. Grid Hacker had cast a spell that was capable of freeing himself of the magic bind. He then cast Barrier to defend against Trinity Dawn's arcane turbulence, before it was shattered by her ice nail. He was now back to using magic shield again to defend against the wheel of blade. As Grid Hacker was occupied by Trinity Dawn, Jack was freed from his hassle. Not letting go of the chance, he dashed out of the flame. His target was still the rogue, sound effect. The knight's HP and armor made him a more difficult target to kill. Sound effect felt humiliated by Jack's attempt in targeting him. It gave him the feeling of being underestimated, so he also ran forward to meet Jack in a frontal clash. Sound effect clashed using normal attacks, utilizing only martial expertise, Jack returned in kind. But after fighting someone like Red Death, Jack found fighting this guy was less challenging. Perhaps unbeknownst to him, his own martial skill had improved. Apart from that, sound effect enjoyed using large movements, in line with his boastful personality. Such large movement was a bane in true combat it left the practitioner with large windows of weakness. One such move was when he jumped up and made a roundhouse slash with his dagger, which Jack conveniently dodged by ducking and using the momentum to send an upward kick at him. Jack's strength stat caused the kick to throw sound effect all the way up almost hitting the ceiling which was around 12 meters in height. Their clash had been going on for only a short few seconds due to both of them had high dexterity. Graphic Z had just arrived by Jack's side when sound effect was thrown high in the air. He used a swing at Jack who was still low on the ground after kicking sound effect. Jack pushed on the ground and hung in the air as the horizontal swing went past under him. He cast energy bolts while spinning in the air. 
The eight bolts flew all around as he was not aiming at all when casting the spell. But it doesn't matter, there were enemies all around him, so the bolts simply looked for the closest enemies autonomously. Graphic Z was rather shocked to see that many energy bolts, it implied his opponent had leveled up that spell to the highest level. He twirled his broadsword around skillfully, cutting the bolts that come at him and at Jack's sword that cut down. Graphic Z suddenly felt himself getting grabbed on his left shoulder. Jack had stored his magic staff and used his free left hand to grip his shoulder. Then he felt the guy kicked on his leg. No, not a kick, it's a step. Before he knew it, the guy's other feet had gone up to his shoulder as well. F asterisking monkey. He was using me as a stepping stone. Graphic Z cursed. Jack kicked again downward and his body went up high into the air. Sound effect who was falling down was in shock seeing Jack getting closer. Even as he clashed with the knight, he was still targeting sound effect. In his panic, sound effect used his throwing weapon skill. Jack ignored the incoming weapon and ate the damage as his magic staff reappeared and he shot mana bullet at sound effect. Both ranged attacks hit, but obviously, sound effect suffered more damage. As his thrown weapon reappeared on his hand, his distance from Jack had shortened. Jack's sword was swinging at him from under. Sound effect thrust his dagger forward to mitigate some of the damages. Their weapons collided and sound effect could feel his body got pushed up into the air again. Effing a shoal was juggling me. Sound effect screamed internally in frustration. Jack had used power strike to keep sound effect in the air. As he went down, he made continuous shots at the helpless rogue. He had activated his staff's burst attack. Each of his shots sent out three energy balls. Graphic Z tried to save his comrade by sending continuous slashes at Jack but Jack expertly used his swordsmanship to keep Graphic Z at bay, while his left hand continued to shoot at sound effect. Sound effect himself tried desperately to slash at the range attacks coming his way, but his attack was not enough to offset Jack's damage. Not to mention how difficult it is to do such a maneuver in the air without any footings. Sunset had tried to cast heal again at sound effect but Jack used Shredding Fang at an angle that hit both him and Graphic Z, hindering them both as he continued to shoot at sound effect. In the end, sound effect lost his life before he even landed back on the ground. Seeing the situation, Grid Hacker gritted his teeth and called for a retreat. He, Graphic Z, and Sunset regrouped together at one corner. Jack had been waiting for them to bundle together. He took out a disruptive bomb and threw it at them. But before the bomb exploded, Grid Hacker activated a magic scroll and they disappeared. Where are they? Did they use an invisibility spell again? Jack asked in his mind. Peniel responded to his question, no, if it was an invisibility spell, it would have been dispelled by the bomb's explosion. That was a teleport spell. So they really had withdrawn. Too bad, if he could just kill one more and threaten the others he might be able to get more information about their purpose and also about this master they kept on talking about. He expected these guys would be troublesome opponents. Who the heck were those guys? Trinity Dawn asked. How did they get here? Was that sunset just now? Why does he look older? And why is he with them? Jack shrugged, I want the answers to those two, sister. Jack looked at where sound effects corpse was. It had vanished after the battle was over. There were a few coins and a piece of equipment. Jack picked them up. The equipment was rare light armor boots. Sweet, he thought. He might give this to Flame. Who the heck is that guy? How come he is so strong? Graphic Z asked. They had been teleported out of the dungeon. They were in one of the ruins at the outskirt of the temple. Apparently, there was another entry point to the dungeon, not just the one inside the temple where Jack and the others had entered from. That's how they had been able to get inside without the army noticing. They had been waiting for the army to arrive before they entered the dungeon. In the dungeon, they used their knowledge to navigate through it to get to the main hall where the memory of Elding would have to be used on and hid themselves using a group invisibility scroll. Sunrise had arrived next. 
They had been expecting him to be the one to activate the artifact, but it turned out the guy just stood there and was also waiting. Sunrise was using disguise at the time so they did not recognize him. That's why I said, do not underestimate him, Sunrise said to the other two. He is not just a lucky player who happened to get the second soul remnant. He had fought against a coalition of hundreds of players and not only did he survive, he even beat them to a retreat. You are kidding, right? Graphic Z said with skepticism. I didn't witness the incident directly, but from the way those famous guilds members were evading him later. I'm inclined to believe the news to be true. Death Associates was amongst those famous guilds in the capital, right? I didn't hear White Death saying anything about that. I doubt he will broadcast such an embarrassing happening to others, won't he? They were silent afterward. What should we do now? Sunrise finally asked. We? You still have the gals to ask? If it was not for you losing those items to him, he won't have progressed this far, Graphic Z scolded. I admit it was my blunder, but I'm sincere about helping. Let me help, Sunrise pleaded. That will depend on Master. We can take you to him and you can make your own case to him. We can't promise anything, Grid Hacker said. Damn it. I almost managed to go into that portal just now. I would have been able to redeem my failure otherwise. Grid Hacker gave a mocking laugh. If you did, you will be dead already. I know about the secret method to defeat the boss, Sunrise said, dissatisfied with the mocking. Even if you did, you will still be dead, Grid Hacker replied, but did not bother to explain more. So, are we leaving now? Sunrise asked. Are you joking? Of course not, how can we go back with failure? Then, what are we to do? We wait for them to come out. Hopefully, that guy managed to get that item. Wait for him? But... Doesn't it have been proven that we are no match to him? Sunrise asked. Grid Hacker grinned, he will get a big surprise once he came out. Chapter 376, Memory of Elding Jack placed the memory of Elding back into the indentation on the floor, the silvery portal reappeared. Another dungeon entrance. Trinity said in surprise. What could be on the other side? Jack shrugged at the question. Should we wait for the others? Trinity asked again. Jack looked at his radar. Most of the green dots were moving in the maze already, but there were still some in static, meaning that they were still dealing with the puzzles in their rooms. I will go check it out first, Jack said. You wait here for the others. All right, be careful, Trinity said. Jack stepped into the portal. Once he did, the portal vanished. Trinity was stunned. She looked to the floor. The triangular pyramid was still there, but there was some kind of transparent layer covering it. That was not there before, she thought. She bent down to pull the pyramid out of its socket. She was thinking that if she took it out and reinserted it, the portal would return. But when her fingers touched the layer covering the pyramid, a jolt of electricity shocked her hand. She pulled her hand back and saw a slight burn on it. She then stared at the wall at which the portal used to be. Looks like the portal was only meant for a single entrance, she thought. Jack, who had no idea that the portal had vanished once he entered, looked around the space inside. It was empty. It was just a dark floor and dark space extending to eternity. He looked back and saw that there was no sign of a portal he had come through. It was a one-way entrance again. He would have to find another way for the exit. But where? He looked around. This place was completely empty. There was not even a landscape. Every direction appeared the same. Where was he even supposed to go? Peniel came out of her hiding dimension and floated around. This is a separate dimension, similar to my hidden dimension. Do you have any idea which way to go? Jack asked. Which way to go? It's a very limited space, Peniel answered. What limited space? It's the horizon everywhere I see. Try going as far as you can then. 
Which way? Anyway. Jack picked a random direction and started walking. Before long, he hit an invisible wall. He used his hand to trace around and felt that the invisible wall went around in a curve. Uh, this felt familiar, he said as he thought back to the tutorial period. The town where the tutorial period was taking place was similarly encased by such an invisible wall, albeit this one appeared much smaller in the area it circumvent. So what? We are stuck in a space with nothing and no exit point? Jack asked. There is always a point in building an enclosed dimension, I don't think the creator of this dimension. Her words were cut short when a spark of lightning appeared not far from where they were. Lightning seemed to come out of nowhere and then struck the ground. Another lightning bolt appeared and hit the same spot, followed by another. Soon, a numerous lightning cracked and shot to the same spot in a rapid manner. It cascaded until it seemed like thousands of lightning bolts were congregating simultaneously at that spot. The resulting light was so bright that Jack had to close his eyes, his ears were also ringing from all these lightning strikes. But as abrupt as this phenomenon occurred, it suddenly stilled. Jack opened his eyes and looked at the spot that the lightning had ravaged. There was something there. Looking closely, he was surprised to find out that it was not something, but someone. A man with purple skin was kneeling. This person looked up and his eyes met with Jack's. This person's eyes were completely white without any pupils. Jack imagined that he might have seen a few small sparks of electricity snaking out of those eyes. The man stood up. He appeared to be naked, but there was no genitalia on the underside of his torso. He floated up and spread out his hand, sparks of lightning shot out from his two hands. Oh, I don't like the look of this, Jack mumbled as he used his inspect. Eldingar, rare elite boss, elemental, level 27. HP, 94,000. Looks like you found the dungeon boss, Peniel commented. Odd, why is its level so low? I thought this area should be one with the average around level 40 to 50. Jack said. It didn't make sense indeed, Peniel agreed. All the monsters they had encountered in the vicinity of the temple had been around that level. Didn't make sense for the boss to be at a lower level. Wait. Can it be that it is to match my level? Jack asked, noting about his level which was also at 27. I don't see why it will do that, all this is very fishy, Peniel responded. The boss didn't let them discuss further. It made the first move since the intruder was staying still. Arc of lightning shot out at Jack. Although Jack was talking with Peniel, his attention never left the boss. Jack's magic shield already formed when he suspected the boss was about to make its move. The lightning hit the shield. Despite the magic shield had been max leveled, Jack still felt the aftershock. 312 damage appeared. Jack had a total of 1450 HP, added with the superior body recovery that healed 197.5 HP every 9.5 seconds. This damage should not be a problem but considering this damage was after it being partially soaked by magic shield, a direct hit would be rather worrisome. So when he saw the hands of the boss lighting up again, Jack started running. The lightning bolt was too fast. He won't be able to dodge it if he only moved after the lightning was shot. He only had a chance if he was constantly moving. Arcs of lightning lashed out one after another causing sparks as they hit the ground behind Jack who was running with all his speed. Jack was morose. He had thought that his improvement was enough now to content with a special elite of the same level. But before he could test out his theory, the system instead threw him a rare elite of the same level. Eldingar did not just continue to get fooled by Jack's running. Its one hand was still shooting lightning that chased after Jack, while its other hand shot at the place in front of Jack cutting off his escaping route. Jack was actually expecting this. Once the two lightning arcs closing at him from both sides, he used flash step to retrace back, causing Eldingar to lose him for an instant as it was expecting him to continue going forward. During this short window, Jack sent the boss a sword of light. 
the skill hit and produced 1,832 damage. Though it was tremendous damage, for the boss who had 94,000 HP, this was nothing. Eldingar who had shown indifferent expression all this time, lifted one of its eyebrows, and looked at the part where he had been hit. Its face displayed annoyance. It made an abrupt lift of both his hands and countless arcs of lightning coalesced there, forming a huge lightning ball. Come on! Do you have to get serious just for that small scratch? Jack complained. He started casting barrier. Whatever move the boss was preparing did not look simple. Eldingar tossed the lightning ball in Jack's direction. Jack had already started running again when it made that throwing motion. The ball fell on the ground not far from Jack and a huge electrical explosion surged out. Jack was shocked by its force. Countless electric snakes spread out from the center of the explosion. His barrier endured the blast but broke after being assailed continuously by the electric snakes. He was reeling backward as the remainder electric current shocked his body. Damages after damages appeared, but luckily he survived. He quickly drank a healing potion and used a heal scroll simultaneously. Seeing his target had survived its attack, Eldingar made a scornful expression and lashed out its hands. Three arcs of lightning bolt shot out from each hand. Jack did not dare to reserve his energy. He activated Life Burning Art then drank a basic healing potion and used a regeneration scroll to counteract the skill's HP consumption. With the speed and reaction boost, he ran again. He cast Mana Bullet, Energy Bolts, and Shot Burst attacks using his staff while evading the increased frequency of lightning strikes, sometimes using his sword to parry the lightning bolts. Not as effective as Magic Shield, but better than none. He could not approach the boss as the lightning strikes were too tightly packed. He only managed to evade so many of the strikes due to the distance. If he closed in, he would be fried to oblivion before he could even land one hit on the boss. But his ranged attacks were not proving too effective. At this rate, he would be electrocuted to death long before he could grind down the boss HP. From this, it was apparent that he was still far from being able to contend against a rare elite of the same level. Chapter 377, Four Purple Balls of Lightning While he was still thinking of a way out, he felt his back getting electrocuted. He looked back in consternation and saw a purple ball of lightning was floating not far away. After another inspection, four such balls had appeared out of nowhere at four corners near the edges of this enclosed space. They started to shoot out lightning bolts. Shit. As if this fight is not hard enough. Jack complained. Is this the boss skill? He asked no one in particular, but Peniel who was floating nearby still replied, Not sure, but I think these balls had appeared by themselves. I didn't see the boss doing anything in relation to these balls. And they don't seem to target you particularly. Peniel was not in a fight so she could observe things more clearly. The lightning shot out of these four balls indeed was random. He had been hit by one simply due to bad luck. Still, dodging the lightning from the boss was already hard enough, now he had to pay attention to these four balls' random shootings again. This had complicated the battle to another level. All he could do was continue to persevere through. He continued with his pitiful ranged attacks to chip down however little the boss HP as best as he could. On one occasion when he cast energy bolts again, several of these bolts went off flying towards one of the purple balls in the corner. When it hit, Jack saw a damage number and an indication of an HP bar. They could be damaged? Jack thought. But should he waste his time to destroy those purple balls? Chipping the boss HP had already taken a very long time, one that he doubted he could keep up. Even if he could destroy all four balls, it would simply put him back to the original situation, one that he was still at a disadvantage in. But one thing he knew from his past gaming experiences, was that most everything was made for a reason. The purple balls seemed to be not part of the boss arsenals, so they must have served another purpose. After a short thought, he decided to go after one of the purple balls. Although it also discharged electricity, it only did so at a long interval, unlike the boss. Hence, 
Jack could still dodge it as long as he timed the moment accurately. He started to attack the purple ball once it was done discharging its electrical attack. This purple ball appeared to have an HP of 10,000, but its defense stat was non-existent, and it didn't move, so Jack had a very easy time hacking at it. Jack's standard sword damage net around 350 damages, courtesy of the boost from enhanced whetstone and sweet dumpling, in addition to other buffs. The boss also did not just stop attacking him, he still sent Jack numerous lightning strikes. Jack evaded them while attacking the purple ball. At one time he instinctively hid behind the purple ball and was astonished to find the boss attacks actually damaged the purple ball. Eh. They are not allies. He thought. So he ended up just stood behind the purple ball and used it as a shield while the boss helped him to reduce the purple ball's HP. Jack thought it was strange this rare elite boss continued to just attack him from a distance. If it had run over to him and blasted him with electricity in close range, he would be out of idea as to how to deal with it. But he would take a blessing any time, he would leave the questioning for later. With attacks from both sides, the purple ball punching bag could not last long. Its HP soon zeroed. While Jack was expecting the purple ball to disintegrate into nothingness, it instead transformed into a pure white ball. However, it was no longer discharging any electricity that assailed him. On the contrary, the dot in his radar representing this ball, which was previously red, had turned into a green dot. Had. It was my ally now. Jack thought in confusion. During his confusion, an interface appeared above this white dot. Because he was close to this white ball, he could see this interface showed a targeting system. He was in a hurry as the boss was still throwing lightning strikes his way so he didn't think much and went ahead to interact with the interface. He heard a notification voice asking him to select a target. Without hesitation, he aimed the targeting system at the boss. As soon as the targeting system locked onto the boss, a searing thick white lightning bolt shot out and slammed into the boss. The boss HP reduced dramatically as the lightning continued to pour into its body. The white ball in front of Jack finally stopped discharging and turned into a dull grey ball. The boss dropped down onto the ground into a kneeling position. White lightning could be seen coiling around its purple body. It was unmoving on the ground. It took Jack an instant, but he quickly snapped out of his surprise and used shooting dash to quickly reach the boss. This was a golden opportunity not to be wasted. He exclaimed in his mind. Once he arrived, he executed power strike at the incapacitated boss. 2000 damage appeared above the boss. A max leveled power strike aided with shooting dash amongst other boosts was truly monstrous. Even he would die in a single strike if he was hit by this. He jumped back once he made his attack, in preparation if the boss retaliated, but it kept its kneeling position. The white lightning continued to coil around its body. After sure it was truly safe he hurriedly went back in and execute attack over attack without reserve. Eldingar simply stayed there receiving all the assaults without any response. Even as Jack attacked it frenziedly, he didn't stop paying attention. He noticed the white lightning was getting thinner and less as time went on. When it was almost gone, the boss started to nudge around. Jack was not taking any chance. He quickly ran away. As expected, once the last strand of the white lightning was gone, it stood back up and went back to shoot lightning bolts from his hands. Jack ran to the second purple ball. Now that he knew that there was such a way to incapacitate the boss, everything became much simpler. From the last attack, he had managed to take out almost a quarter of the boss HP. Considering there were four purple balls, it should be enough to finish the boss. He repeated the previous strategy by hiding behind the purple ball, ignoring its occasional electrical strike. He used potions and heal scrolls to recover his lost HP. While the purple ball was getting sandwiched by both Jack's and Eldingar's attacks. Once the second purple ball transformed into a white one, he repeated the process, sending another thick pillar of lightning onto the boss. He then used charge to increase his speed to get close to the boss since shooting dash was still in cooldown, 
and then hack away the helpless boss with abandon, before quickly ran away again once the white lightning chains became thinner. Jack continued using the same strategy, repeatedly utilizing the remaining purple balls. By the time the fourth ball was activated, Eldingar only had less than a quarter HP left. No more purple ball after this, need to make this count. Jack exclaimed in his mind as the thick white lightning slammed into the boss. Jack rushed at him and started his final burst assaults to take out the boss remaining HP. While the prospect looked promising, when Eldingar only had a sliver of HP left, a strong force suddenly exploded out of its body, eliminating the remaining white lightning chains that were still holding it and pushed Jack away. It then jumped back and flew away to the other end of this enclosed space. It lifted both his hands up. Jack was assuming it would use that giant lightning ball toss again, but instead of one giant ball, more than ten giant balls appeared. Holy shit! Is this its dying struggle? Jack exclaimed in alarm. The lightning ball toss from before had proven that he could not evade it, he would still get damaged by its aftershock. If those many balls exploded at the same time, he would still die even with his barrier spell on. In a split second, Jack made a decision. If he could not evade, then just gamble who would die first. He used shooting dash which had gone off cooldown to get close to the boss who had run to the other corner. He sent Sword of Light after getting in range. With the additional damage boost from shooting dash, the skill produced almost 4000 damage. Unfortunately, it was still not enough to take out Eldingar, it still had a tiny 500 HP left. Jack had hoped for the 30% critical chance of Sword of Light to take effect, but sadly his high luck stat didn't help this time. But he had also prepared a contingency if it didn't happen. He had pointed his staff at Eldingar and activated Dragon's Eye the moment he executed Sword of Light. He could only rely on ranged attacks, there was no more time to move closer to get the boss into melee range. Chapter 378, Lightning God Sphere Through the slow motion view, Jack could see that just as his Sword of Light hit, Eldingar's hands were about to come down, bringing the doom of countless lightning balls down at him. At this time he cast Arcane Turbulence. In his perception, his spell formation was forming at a normal pace. However, under an outsider's perception, the runes on his magic staff were formed at five times the normal speed. Hence, the spell was cast in less than one second. Jack didn't stop, he continued to cast Ice Ring. Although the boss was floating in the air, it was floating very low, the arcane turbulence and ice ring could still hit it. Without stopping, Jack also cast energy bolts and mana bullet. All four spells were cast at almost the same time due to the dragon's eye effect. The two latter spells needed travel time to reach the boss, while the first two struck at a faster rate, almost instantaneously. Jack was hoping the first two spells would have been enough to devour the boss remaining HP. The latter two were only for precaution, but if so, then it would be a race to see if the latter two could hit the boss before it released its toss. Even though it was a dire situation, he did not forget to summon his rune stone of luck just before the first two spells connected, boosting his luck stat. Fortunately, this time his luck went through, probably due to the luck boost on the rune stone as well. The combination of ice ring and arcane turbulence managed to finish the boss. As its HP reached zero, the giant balls of lightning in the air dissipated. Eldingar's head lifted up, he was looking up as he silently dissipated, leaving a few sparks of lightning in its previous position. That was a surprisingly peaceful death, Jack commented on his opponent's behavior before its death. He then heard a voice notification, congratulations on defeating Eldingar. Receiving 310,000 experience points. Considering the level of this boss was not that high, the EXP rewarded was not as abundant. But due to its rare elite grade, it was still high enough that it elevated Jack's warrior to level 28 and mage to level 27. What are you grinning about? With the fight over, Peniel now flew back to near Jack. She had been flying high in the air during the fight. You have been through many close calls before, didn't see you being this happy. Hehe. <laughs> 
I just realized something, Jack said to her. What? That I can already pass the test from that Janice guy. Why suddenly think about that test? Never mind that, I can only give it a shot after we return to the capital, he said as he walked to the spot where Eldingar had dissipated. At. He uttered as he looked around. Why is there nothing? He turned to Peniel and asked, Did you pay attention when the boss dies? Did you see it drop anything? Why would I be paying attention? It's not like I am the one that will get the loots, the fairy replied. What, no loots? So I get only experience for that whole damn fight? So I have used the rune stone of luck for nothing. Jack complained. Do you know why such things happened? As I have said, something is fishy. This whole expedition is weird. Not to mention, what are those four purple balls? Why is there that kind of crippling mechanisms in this boss fight? Hey, it was because of those purple balls that I could win. Don't complain about good things. I know. I'm just saying that it is strange. Now that he thought about it. Sunrise had been trying to get into this space when he had activated the portal. Did he already know that there would be a boss here? If he had known, then surely he knew about those four purple balls as well. Otherwise, with his capability, he would only be running into his death if he tried to fight the boss. But then again, even with the help of those purple balls, he doubted that Sunrise would be able to survive against the boss. Especially the boss final struggle, Sunrise did not have the firepower to finish off the boss before it obliterated him. Did this mean that Sunrise himself was not fully aware of all the information in this boss fight? He decided to not think too much about it. The idea that some players possessed this kind of knowledge about this game world was unsettling. This might point that these players might also know why they had been forced into this game world. He would ask Sunrise again the next time he met him. He looked into the container of souls inside his storage. Even though the boss did not drop loots, it should at least give some souls, right? Considering its grade was rare elite like the Grim Sand Drake, the soul it gave should not be low, even if it was much lower level than the Drake. Are you f asterisking kidding me? Jack cursed after seeing inside the container. There were only 236 souls inside, this soul must be his leftover ones added with the ones he got when he defeated Sound Effect. That boss just now did not generate any soul at all. No souls, no loots. What an absolute waste of time. He complained. While he was wallowing in his bad mood, he felt some tickling at the top of his head. He looked up and saw a light up there, and it was slowly floating down. As the light came down, the tickle spread to his entire body. He felt as if he was experiencing mild electrocution. Such strange feeling, he thought his body even beginning to shiver slightly as the light was about to drop to the ground. That's... No. Not possible, Peniel seemed to be at a loss of words. She then flew closer to the light. It's... It is. But... How can this possibly appear here? Jack was curious about Peniel's reaction. Rarely did something cause the fairy to stutter. He went and approached the light as well. What is that? He asked when he arrived. The thing floating in front looked like a small ball that was constantly emitting light. There were also occasional sparks of electricity coursing out of it. The surface of the thing seemed to keep on shifting, as if constantly moving, but it was stationary the whole time. Peniel was still staring at the thing, she was mumbling something inaudible. She perhaps did not even hear Jack's question. Not bothering to ask a second time, she used inspect on the floating thing. A loading bar appeared. Wow, it was sometimes already since I saw this loading bar, Jack said. The god eye monocle allowed him to inspect items or persons no matter how high level it was, but it was still subjected to some of the standard limitations, such as the time needed when identifying high-grade items. Which meant, the thing floating in front of him was one such high-grade item. He was full of anticipation again. 
it would be a true letdown for not getting anything after the fight with that rare elite boss, and from Peniel's reaction, this thing was certainly not simple. Peniel finally turned to him while the loading bar was still ongoing, her face showed complicated expression. Are you using inspect on it? She asked. Yes, it is still loading. So long. It is more than one minute already and it was still at 4%. What is it anyway? Jack asked. It was even longer than when he inspected the transformation box. Wait for your inspect to finish then you will see, she answered. Out of boredom, he used the time to practice his skill and cast spells for proficiency. As long as his eyesight was maintained on the item, his actions didn't disturb the inspecting process. After a long half-hour time, the identification process was finally over. This inspect had also given him an abundance of proficiency that pushed this skill to advanced apprentice. He was, however, not paying attention to his support skills level up, as his thought was currently transfixed by the words in front of him. Lightning God Sphere, Divine Treasure. Required Soul Link to Use. Divine. He blurted out. The highest grade he knew of an item's classification as depicted in the beta guide was legendary. What was this about divine? It sounded way better than legendary. He turned to Peniel, who was still having a complicated expression. Is this divine grade better than a legendary? He asked. It is, Peniel nodded, confirming his guess. In fact, there are only seven such divine treasures in the world. This here is one of them. Wow. Ain't I super lucky then to get my hands on it. You are more than lucky. This is simply incomprehensible. There is no way a divine treasure to appear here. Especially not when it is only guarded by a measly level 27 rare elite. Such treasure was supposed to be guarded by at least level 70 eternal creature. But it is here right now in front of us, isn't it? Or is it some kind of a counterfeit? No it is a genuine divine treasure. Chapter 379, Lightning God Blessing Then no need to sweat the small stuff, Jack uttered as he took the lightning god sphere in his hand. He didn't get shocked by the tiny electricity that occasionally shot out from the thing, but the hair on his body did feel all raised up. You like to take things too easy, you know, Peniel said. Thank you for your compliment. That's not a complete... Wait. Don't link with it. Jack was startled by Peniel's shout. An interface had appeared when he took the sphere into his hand, asking if he wanted to soul link with the treasure. He had clicked yes just now. What? Why? Jack was taken aback by the panic in Peniel's voice. A loading bar had appeared, he could felt the tickling feeling on his entire body intensified after confirming the link and it was still gradually getting stronger. Why are you so hasty? Peniel complained, she was gritting her teeth with displeasure. Lady, don't get so angry. I will cancel the process, Jack offered. No, stop. Can you quit just doing things immediately? If you cancel it now, the backlash will most likely kill you, Peniel said. Even with that immortal soul of yours, I doubt you will come out unscathed. Uh, so what do you propose me to do? Now you bother to ask my opinion. Jack kept his mouth shut while displaying an apologetic expression. Looking at the situation, whatever he said will just anger his fairy friend more. Peniel sighed after Jack was silent for a while. Just continue with the linking. I don't see any other choice now. Will something bad happen due to the link? Just complete it first. Do your best. If you fail, you will still get the backlash that might kill you. Yes, ma'am. Peniel rolled her eyes at him. At this time the space around them collapsed, they were back to the interior of the temple dungeon, but in a different room than the main hall where they were before. Jack heard a notification voice, congratulations on completing the dungeon receiving 80,000 experience points and 10 gold coins. As the person who had defeated the boss of the dungeon, you are awarded a gold treasure chest. You can exit this dungeon anytime by going out the door. 
treasure chest. Jack exclaimed. He could see the door the notification had informed, but where is the treasure chest? He turned back and saw it, a gleaming large treasure chest of golden color. The sight of it mesmerized him. Hey, concentrate! Peniel yelled. The shout snapped Jack back to focus on the linking. The electrifying pressure was increasing in intensity. Don't go failing just because you get distracted. She added. Yes, ma'am, Jack said again, with a little bit grumbling tone this time. As time passed, several sparks of electricity started to appear around the room. Looking at the phenomenon, Jack had a bad feeling. Not long after, as he had slightly expected it, one of these sparks shot a lightning bolt at him, causing him to spasm. One hundred damage appeared above him. Endure it. It is part of the process, Peniel informed. Holy crap! This is starting to feel like when he was absorbing the runestone with the lightning element. The difference was, the torture caused by those runestones was only mentally, the whole process occurred only within his mind. This time though, it had taken place in real space, and the lightning affected him physically. Heck, he even got damage from it. Luckily, he was considered out of combat, so his two body recovery skills were in full effect, quickly filling back his missing HP. The frequency of lightning strikes increased. He hardly had the chance to breathe properly with all the electrocution. He somehow felt lucky that he had experienced the lightning torture twice from the runestone of probability and runestone of luck. He could say that he was trained already in enduring the agony from these lightning strikes, but still, it was truly tormenting. No matter how many times he had experienced it before, he could be sure that he would never get used to it. While his willpower had been trained to endure the pain, his body though, did not. As time passed and the intensity of the lightning increased, his HP decreased at a rapid rate, his body recovery skills were having trouble keeping up. He started drinking recovery potions. He did not know how long the process had been going. One hour? Two hours? His vision was starting to blur. He was just busy trying to keep his HP at a safe threshold amongst the unending pain. He had even used the remaining heal scroll and regeneration scroll in his bag when the potions were no longer sufficient. He felt truly lucky that he had a huge HP pool compared to others. If it was normal players experiencing this, they would have succumbed long ago. When he was panicking as he ran out of his recovery magic scrolls while the basic healing potion and healing potion usage were still in cooldown, the lightning god sphere in front of him suddenly broke apart into pieces. Jack was terrified when it happened, thinking that he might have failed the linking and thus the phenomenon. But then the broken pieces transformed into small bolts of lightning and stabbed into his body. He cringed from the pain, it was as if he was jabbed by a countless number of needles. The pain slowly subsided as his blurry vision turned clear. His body was drenched by cold sweats. He then realized that his blur vision was caused by tears from his eyes. Shit. The pain caused my eyes to cry. Such a disgrace. Luckily no one was around, he thought as he quickly wiped the tear in his eyes. He then noticed that Peniel was staring at him. Uh, um. Sand got into my eyes, Jack said to her. Ignoring his pitiful excuse, Peniel asked, Did you succeed? Jack looked around, he didn't hear any notification voice the lightning god sphere was also nowhere to be seen. I think so. He said. Look inside your status window, genius. Peniel said. Feeling sheepish, he opened the status window, while inside he grumbled, try getting electrocuted for hours, see if you can still think straight. You do know I can sense your dissatisfaction, right? Project your thoughts directly at me, if you dare. Peniel taunted. No, ma'am, Jack replied. He looked into his status window. He assumed that whatever effect the lightning god sphere gave should be under the inherent skills section, just like the immortal soul. Lightning god blessing, level one third. Lightning resistance plus 50, passive skill. 
Every attack plus 10% lightning damage and 1% chance to cause paralyze for 2 seconds, passive skill. Lightning God Barrage, active skill. Shoot 20 balls of lightning that explode dealing 300% lightning damage each in a 5 meters diameter area, 30% chance of causing paralyze for 10 seconds. Range, 20 meters. Cool down, 5 hours. Upgrade to next level require. 1 Divine Gem, 10 Magic Crystal, EXP, 0 slash 3 comma 0 0 0 comma 0 0 0. Jack stared at the description for a long time. Wasn't this a little bit too overpowered? This active skill when activated, would cause a total of 6000% if all 20 balls were concentrated on a single target. The amount of damage would be astronomical and anyone who was caught within a 5 meters area around the target would also be blown to smithereens. He had truly gotten a boon this time. As he was getting elated for this boon, he suddenly realized something. Eh? Why was Peniel getting so troubled when he soul linked with this lightning god sphere? He turned to the fairy and reported, I got this inherent skill called lightning god blessing. It gives me lots of wonderful passive skills and one kick ass active skill. That's all well and good, Peniel said with a blank face. It has levels, doesn't it? Does it show what is needed for level up? Yes, it said here, I will need one divine gem, ten magic crystals, and three million EXP. I'm not sure this EXP. Three million. Peniel blurted out, interrupting him, only three million? Are you sure? Didn't you say you can look at my stats after we linked, right? Why don't you take a look for yourself if you don't believe me? Peniel did just that. Kind of making Jack felt slightly offended as it suggested that she really didn't believe him. It really is only three million. She muttered. Now, why did you go all panicking when I soul link with that divine treasure? Doesn't it give me such a wonderful ability? Jack asked. Peniel gave him a side glance, irritation returned to her eyes. Although you have dodged the big bullet this time, doesn't mean you come out clean. Three million EXP points are still a lot. It will be roughly the same amount if you level up your current level ten times. How long do you think you will need to accumulate that amount? Chapter 380, Quest Item Well, just leave the leveling for later. It's not like I'm in a hurry to level up this skill. I also don't have either Divine Gem or Magic Crystal yet, so there is no point to accumulate EXP for it now. You don't get it, do you? Peniel said with a snort. This skill came from Divine Treasure. It takes priority. Whatever EXP points you get now will get absorbed by it. You have no control over this. That. Jack's eyes turned wide. Are you saying I will not be able to level up until I fill up the EXP needed for this blasted blessing? Peniel nodded. This is not a blessing, this is a curse. Jack yelled. That's why I am angry with you soul linking the sphere without knowing the consequence. Peniel yelled back. All right, let's take a moment to calm ourselves down. All these yellings are not good for us, Jack said as he turned around, took a deep breath then cursed out loudly, F asterisk CK. F asterisk CK. His dual class had already requiring lots of EXP compared to normal players, now he got a bottomless pit to feed the EXP points some more. He could imagine the huge gap where everyone left him behind in terms of level. You can still consider yourself lucky, you know, Peniel said. Yeah, I am very lucky, Jack said sarcastically. Remember when I said a divine treasure was normally guarded by a level 70 eternal creature? Meaning such a creature could only be defeated by lots of level 70 elite class adventurers, or several level 70 with special classes. Special classes. Don't get sidetracked. Anyway, this divine treasure is meant for those level 70 adventurers. Under normal circumstances, the experience required to upgrade its level is around 10 times a level 70 adventurer needed to level up. That's why I'm so surprised that it only needs a paltry 3 million EXP here. Oh. 
Jack understood what she was saying. That's why I was panicking when you soul linked with it. Imagine if you are required to collect the amount of EXP needed by a level 70. Not to mention a level 70 can fight a level 70 monster which gives tons of experience. If you try to collect the same amount of EXP by fighting only the low level monsters afforded by your current level. You can forget about leveling up for the next 100 years. Jack cringed when he heard her words. If that really happened, he should either retire to being an auxiliary job worker like Ellie or find a way to remove this lightning god blessing. He truly, as Peniel had said, had dodged the bullet. Perhaps the experience required is adjusted to my level, that's why it was this amount. Similar to the boss just now who matched my level, Jack offered his deduction. It shouldn't have done that in my knowledge, but the fact is in front of me, and I can't deny that divine treasure just now was genuine. After a pause, Peniel added, 3 million is a lot, but it is still doable. You just have to accept the fact that you will fall behind the others. Once we are done with this expedition, I will show you a place where you can gather EXP points quickly. There is such a place. Jack's hope was reignited. Oh, fair fairy, you are truly my savior. Save your boot licking, go see what that treasure chest hold, Peniel said. Oh, yes, the treasure chest, he had completely forgotten about the gold chest. He turned to look at the treasure chest, but as he did, he saw something behind the chest, on an altar. It was a simple bottle, but it was marked by his god eye monocle, meaning the bottle had some kind of a function. He went to the bottle first instead of the treasure chest, and use inspect on it. All curse expulsion potion, quest item. Remove any curse. Seeing this potion reminded him again of his SSS quest. If he got this potion, won't that quest be as good as complete? Could it really have been this easy? Well, it was not that easy actually coming till here, but he would have expected more from a quest that was graded the highest in difficulty. Probably what Peniel said was true, there was something wrong with this quest. Could those players, Grid Hacker, and the others, have something to do with this? No point in dwelling on it. He reached for the potion, but hesitated for a moment. Will there be a trap? But his god eye monocle should have sent him a warning if there was one, right? Not to mention his investigative talent also had a probability to notify him if anything was out of the ordinary. He walked around the altar, scrutinizing every detail. Trying to see if anything was out of place. He couldn't find any, so he just resolved himself to take the bottle. He closed one of his eyes and cringed as he lifted the bottle, expecting something to happen. But fortunately, nothing did. You are weird, Peniel commented after seeing his act. Hey, you never know what will happen with this tomb raiding type of game. Traps were always abounding, Jack tried to defend himself. After storing the quest potion, now he could finally deal with the chest. He admired its shiny surface, he could see his reflection through that golden shine. Even from look alone, the gold treasure chest outclassed the bronze one by a mile. He took out his enduring lockpick. He was sure that this chest would require a ton of attempts, luckily he had stocked up on lots of lockpicks before the expedition. He also summoned his runestone of luck, but then realized something and asked Peniel, do I have to have this runestone in effect while I lockpick? Though I can multitask, I still prefer to concentrate while doing the lockpicking. You can summon your runestone of luck once you heard that your lockpick is successful. No need to have it on effect all the time while doing the lockpicking, Peniel explained. Jack nodded. The success rate of lockpicking this gold treasure chest at his current intermediate apprentice grade would be abysmally low. He would need to score a perfect execution on every attempt to compensate for it. Otherwise, even with his deep stock of lockpicks, he might still not manage to open the chest. If he ran out of lockpicks and this treasure chest was still locked, then he might truly cry. He did not think the dungeon would still let him get to this treasure chest if he re-entered. As he was about to store back the runestone of luck, he stopped. He looked at the runestone in bewilderment. 
Rune Stone of Luck, Rare Rune Stone. Increase luck by approximate 5 points for 10 seconds. Elemental energy required for upgrade, 850-1000. The last time he checked, the elemental energy was only 50 points. Now it suddenly shot up to 850. He didn't remember feeding it any gemstone. Peniel also gave her attention when she saw Jack looking at the rune stone. You mentioned that this rune stone of Lux element is lightning, right? She asked. It is, Jack answered. Peniel pondered a bit before saying, probably there is some excess lightning elemental energy after you merged with the lightning god sphere. This excess elemental energy got absorbed by this rune stone. There can be such a case? Jack asked. He then remembered something and summoned another rune stone, the rune stone of probability. He used inspect on it. As expected, the elemental energy inside this one was 910, way more than it should be. Both the lightning element rune stones were now close to upgrading to super rare grade. Just to make sure, he summoned his other non-lightning rune stones. They were still at a pitiful amount of energy. Too bad not all of them are lightning element rune stones, Jack commented. Otherwise they would all have received a free bonus. You wish. Peniel said. I bet the excess energy was divided between the two. If you have four lightning rune stones, then the excess energy would have been divided by four. The total amount of excess energy will remain the same. In other words, if only your rune stone of luck is lightning, it would have been upgraded to super rare grade by now. I see. But this is still a great free boon. Do you know of any way I can get a similar boon again? Peniel didn't even feel like deeming that with an answer. Did he think a divine treasure was something that he could find at the side of a street? Seeing his fairy friend was ignoring him, Jack didn't bother her anymore. He sat down beside the gold treasure chest and started to work on the lock-picking process. Despite his perfect execution, the twelve counts inside his enduring lock-pick were soon exhausted with failures. He didn't think too much of it. Expecting to open this treasure chest with only twelve tries was like asking for a miracle. He took out his standard lock picks and got back to work. Chapter 381, The Contents of Gold Treasure Chest As expected, it truly took him tons of attempts. Even after breaking a hundred lock picks, he was still met with failures. However, through all the tries, his lock picking grade had increased to advanced apprentice. Each attempt on this gold treasure chest netted him a large amount of proficiency. Yet, when his 100th lockpick broke, he was starting to worry. He only got around 300 lockpicks in his bag. He had burnt out one-third of them already. He slapped his cheeks with both hands to force himself to concentrate. Positive thinking. Positive thinking. He motivated himself. Peniel simply sat on top of the treasure chest and looked at him silently. When he reached 200 attempts, he started to have cold sweat. This caused him to make mistakes several times, wasting a number of precious attempts. He broke away and have a walk around the room, taking deep breaths to calm himself. Peniel was still just looking at him without any words. Jack came back again to the treasure chest. He gave a short glance to Peniel but both of them didn't say a word. He then returned to his lock-picking effort. When he only had 50 lock-picks left, he started to pray before every attempt. He even took a proper praying posture and spent a minute reciting a full prayer before every attempt when his lock-picks were down to 20. Peniel simply looked at him, amused. When he had only 8 lock-picks left, he finally heard the notification telling him that he had successfully unlocked the chest. He was blank for a second, unsure if he had heard right. Peniel's voice roused him from his stupor. Rune Stone of Luck. She yelled. Thanks to Peniel's reminder, he immediately summoned it, just as the treasure chest gave a click sound and started opening. When the lid was fully opened, it released an extremely bright golden light. Did it have to be this exaggerated? Jack complained as he closed his eyes due to the brightness. The brightness soon subsided, 
Jack peeked out one eye to make sure the bright light was gone. He then looked into the content of the chest. There were only six items inside, but each radiated aura that gave his heart a loud thump. Hot damn! He exclaimed. The six items were two pouches, a pair of boots, one large-sized diamond, a red smoldering pebble, and a strange-looking device. He knew one of the pouches should be a coin pouch, he took both of them up and inspected them. One was indeed a coin pouch, containing 100 gold coins. He was slightly dizzy thinking about the coins, he could buy another plot of land with this. But more than that, combined with the coins he had saved, he could finally do another upgrade to either Ellie's restaurant or Amy's bakery. His first choice was of course the restaurant, it generated more income after all. He looked at the second pouch, it was a monocore pouch. There were 42 monocores inside. He put these monocores, which he still knew not what their use was for, into his bag. He picked up the pair of boots next. Speed Fury Chosas, level, 2858s, super rare medium armor. Physical defense, 72. Magical defense, 56. Durability, 50. Reflex plus 8. Defense plus 30% when moving. Movement speed plus 80% for 3 seconds after executing a skill. Another super rare. He compared this one with the silver wing leggings he wore. Even though the level of these super rare boots was lower, its defense was still higher than his rare boots. The ability it provided was also handy. His fighting style had him moving most of the time, he was not like those players who like to stay in one place as they fought or cast spells. He liked to move around. Meaning this defense plus 30% when moving suited him perfectly. Its other ability was also perfect for him. His power strike had a 3 seconds cooldown. Meaning as long as he had enough stamina to continuously spam that skill, his movement speed would always be at 80% faster. Now he could again be faster than those high dexterity rogues. Without hesitation, he exchanged his equipped boots with this new one. For a test run, he executed a power strike, then ran around. Let me say it again, you are weird, Peniel repeated her previous comment. Lady, I'm trying to get myself familiarized with the speed burst. Won't be funny if I end up missing my target in a fight because the sudden speed burst surprises myself. After a round of running around the room, he went back to the treasure chest. The diamond gemstone was easily recognizable, but this large size was the first he had seen. When he used inspect on it, the skill showed the gemstone to be a unique grade. He sucked in a deep breath. He then summoned his rune stone of luck. Time for you to level up. Jack said as he injected the elemental energy of the unique diamond into the rune stone. He was amazed as he saw the numbers of elemental energy getting filled. Even after the rune stone was upgraded to super rare grade, the elemental energy still continued to go up rapidly. It only slowed down after reaching the 2000 mark. Rune stone of luck, super rare rune stone. Increase luck by approximate 10 points for 10 seconds. Elemental energy required for upgrade, 2,350-10,000. The luck increased had doubled. He calculated the amount of elemental energy contained within that unique grade diamond, there was 2,500 elemental energy within a single gemstone. He could directly upgrade an uncommon runestone to a super rare grade if he found another one. But then again, it's not like unique grade gemstone was lying around to be picked up. But considering his luck, which was further boosted by the super rare rune stone of luck, sooner or later he should get himself one such gemstone again. He unsummoned the rune stone of luck and took a look at the next item in the treasure chest, the red smoldering pebble. Although he had never seen such an item before, he had an inkling of what it was. He took a random cloth from his bag. He had prepared several such mundane items in his bag just in case. He covered his hand with it before he picked up the pebble. He could feel the heat burning through the cloth. He quickly transferred it inside his storage bag while he could still endure the heat. As expected, 
he thought as he inspected the item in his bag. It was another Evolve Seed. It was Fire Seed, a rare consumable. Ha, he thought jovially. The last time was Ice, this time was Fire, two opposite elements. He thought for a brief moment before deciding. The last time he had used the Ice Seed on the Mage skill, it's only fair if he used this one for his Warrior skill. He opened the Evolve interface and used the Fire Seed on his favorite, most used melee skill, Power Strike. Flame Strike, level 20 20ths, active skill, melee, require melee weapon, star, 2. Deal 400% fire damage, cause pushing force proportional to strength stat. 25% chance to inflict burn on target for 10 seconds. Stamina consumed, 30. Cooldown, 5 seconds. The damage had been increased and as expected, the damage type was changed to fire damage, with additional property to cause burn status. Stamina usage had been increased. The cooldown had also been increased by 2 seconds, Jack felt down due to it. And here he just thought about spamming power strike to utilize the speed boost of his new boots every 3 seconds. But then again, the ability was triggered by any skill so he could just use other skills when Flame Strike was on cooldown. Now, the only thing left inside the treasure chest was the strange-looking device. He left the most unknown one for the last. Peniel, however, knew exactly what it is. I see you save the best for last, she said. Best. Jack thought. The fairy had mistaken his reason, but he didn't bother to correct her. He picked up the device and made an inspect. Upgrade cell, unique consumable. Upgrade an item to the next grade. Another unique? It seemed that his luck added by the rune stone of luck had truly worked wonder. Peniel once told him gold treasure chest's highest grade content was a unique item, but the percentage was small. For him to acquire two was already considered the best of luck. The only thing he felt pity about was that none of these unique were equipment. It said upgrade an item. What item? Any item will do. Jack asked the fairy. Yes, the fairy confirmed. Jack thought for a bit and then took off his new boots. It seemed that he could get unique equipment after all. Don't tell me you are going to use it on those boots now, are you? Peniel asked. Why not? Jack asked back. Why not? Because it will be a big waste, is why. Put those boots back on. Peniel commanded. Chapter 382, Upgrading a Unique Item. So what do you propose I use it on? Jack asked, he still wore back the boots as the fairy asked. Nowadays he had gotten used to her bossy attitude already. Did you not realize when I said any item? The ones you should be looking at are items of the highest grade currently in your possession. Hearing her words, Jack looked into his bag for a bit and came to a realization. Ah, I see where you are going with this. He then took out three items from his bag and laid them out on the ground. They were the transformation box, container of souls, and orb of disguise. Are you telling me that I can upgrade one of these into a legendary item? Jack asked. Peniel nodded. Jack looked at the three, then asked her again, Are you sure? If you ask me one more time, I will stab my hand into your eye. Jack took a deep breath. A legendary item. He had not seen any legendary item since the second soul remnant. Then again, he did just get a divine treasure which was even higher than the legendary grade. But it did not diminish his awe of knowing he will get another legendary item. Now, the only question was, which one should he use the upgrade on? After giving the matter some thought, he decided to eliminate the orb of disguise. The first reason was because the artifact already had its own feature for upgrading, he only needed to find the materials to do it. Secondly, he didn't really need another disguise. At least not at the moment. So he stored the orb of disguise and leaving only transformation box and container of souls. After thinking some more, he decided on Container of Souls. 
This artifact had been monumental in improving his battle prowess by strengthening his skills and spells. He was expectant on what further benefit he could get by upgrading it. He stored the transformation box and was just about to use the upgrade cell on the containers of souls when Peniel stopped him rudely by slapping on his hand. Use it on the transformation box. She ordered. Why? Just use it first. I will explain once you see the upgrades. Lady, if you were already set on which item I should use the upgrade on, why didn't you tell me from the start? Waste my time trying to make the decision. Jack grumbled in his mind but of course, he did not voice it out or projected his thought to her. Peniel still sensed his dissatisfaction thought. Do you have something you want to say? She asked. No. I'm perfectly fine, Jack uttered. He stored the container of souls and brought the transformation box back out again. Jack set the device on top of the transformation box, an interface appeared asking him if he wanted to use the upgrade cell on the transformation box, Jack clicked accept. The device broke into uncountable tiny atoms as they swirled around the transformation box and completely covered it. The process went on for some time as he heard buzzing sounds accompanied by some clicks and clunks. He also saw some movements underneath all the swirling atoms, as if the item inside was getting broken and reassembled. Finally, the swirling receded and the atoms fell onto the ground, forming heaps of dust. The transformation box revealed was completely different than before. In fact, it was no longer in a cube shape, its shape had changed to a hexagonal prism. Transformation Prism, Legendary Artifact Consumes four common equipment slash materials of same type to create one random uncommon equipment slash material of same type. Consumes eight uncommon equipment slash materials of same type to create one random rare equipment slash material of same type. Consumes 16 rare equipment slash materials of same type to create one random super rare equipment slash material of same type. Consumes 32 super rare equipment slash materials of same type to create one random unique equipment slash material of same type. Oh. It could now fuse super rare equipment to make unique equipment. Jack uttered, but then added, but I think getting 32 pieces of super rare equipment of the same types is a bit far-fetched, don't you think? It is, but that is not why I asked you to choose this transformation box to be upgraded, Peniel replied. No? What could be more impressive than the means to make a unique equipment? It is of course impressive, but as you said, very doubtful if you can amass that many numbers of same type super rare equipment in near future. But one thing about this upgrade can allow you to profit from it in near future. Jack took a look at the transformation prism's description again. The only other change to its function was that it wasn't limited to only equipment now, it could also fuse materials to a better grade. Material fusing. He asked Peniel. Remember when you expressed your worry about future leveling up of your equipment? The problem is not just the increased failure rate when you do the level up. Their material demands will also increase. And to make things worse, only common materials are available for purchase at normal shops. Iron ores and steel ores. Yep, higher grade ores will be a problem to source. Like this copper ore. Jack took out one from his bag, he had collected 21 of these copper ores during various occasions. As Peniel had mentioned, he had not seen any shop selling this copper ore when he made purchases. Yet. You will only be able to get them from mining, and even higher grade materials can only be acquired if you have sufficiently high mining skills. I understand you will not be spending most of your time training your mining skill to the maximum, won't you? You can also try to purchase the materials from others who had good mining skills and are willing to spend a large portion of their time doing mining works, but I don't think they will sell them cheap. Some factions also gave them out as exchangeable items using points, but that will mean you can't use those points for other better goods. What level of equipment will require me to use this copper ore? Jack asked. Equipment level 35 and above, Peniel answered. And it will pick up as more rare materials are needed for higher level equipment. Level 55 equipment will start to require rare materials, 
such as gold ore, for leveling. Level 70 needs super rare ones, level 80 needs unique, while level 90 will require legendary materials. So, if you don't have the means to procure these materials, you will be stuck with whatever level you first get the equipment, unable to level them up. I see. By having this transformation prism, I at least will have the means to get the required materials to upgrade until level 89. Exactly. All you need to do is simply mass up on all those iron ores and steel ores and use this transformation prism to convert them into higher grade materials. You don't need to worry about leveling up your mining skills or spending large amounts of coins or points to get the materials. Jack nodded. I see you have thought about the future, thank you. This is a great help. Humph, you don't say, Peniel folded her arms and gave a prideful pose. Jack stored the transformation prism. He would start to amass the iron ores and steel ores once he was back in the capital. He stood up and looked at the exit of the room. I guess it's time to leave, he said. When he stepped over the exit of the room, he fully expected to appear in the main hall where they entered, with Duke Alfredo and the others waiting there. He had not seen any green dots on his radar after coming out of the space where he fought Eldingar, so he assumed his friends had been sent out of the dungeon after he defeated the boss. Instead, he was greeted with the view of unfamiliar ruins. It was not the interior of the main hall of the Temple of Divine Squall. He was instead outdoor and the place looked very much like one of those ruins scattered around at the outskirt of the temple. He was still wondering when blue chains suddenly appeared and coiled around his body, restricting him. This looked familiar, Jack thought when he saw the blue chains. You made us wait really long, he heard a familiar voice from his back. He turned around and saw the trio of Grid Hacker, Graphic Z, and Sunset. Yo, such a coincidence to meet you three again, Jack said to them cordially. In his mind, he was rather confused, why did those three not shown inside his radar? That's a rare grade area-wide jamming device, Peniel said. She had gone back into her hidden dimension when Jack decided to exit the dungeon. Jack's eyes went to the thing she indicated. It was a strange cylinder with a satellite dish cover at its top, there was light blinking on the satellite dish. Chapter 383, Old Enemy That is one modern-looking gadget, Jack commented in his mind. Was that the one jamming his radar? Considering their familiarity with God Eye Monocle, that could be the case. Still have the mood to joke. Graphic Z sneered. Or do you think you will get a reinforcement? Is that what that gadget prevents? Jack asked, indicating the jamming device. It stopped us, players, from sending messages, Graphic Z answered. Apart from jamming the radar detection of our God Eye Monocle. I didn't expect you to manage to complete the dungeon, Grid Hacker said. You will only appear here if you did. I also had Sunset and Graphic Z go back into the dungeon some hours ago. If you died during the fight with the boss, the memory of Elding will be masterless and stayed where it was. But when they arrived back there, it was no longer around, and your friends as well. Unlikely that they took it and left after going so far, more likely they took turns to go into the boss space after your demise, unaware of the danger, and perished as well. Another possibility is that you have cleared the dungeon and they were all teleported out since you all entered the dungeon together as a party. Seeing you appeared here, I can say it was the latter. Well. I didn't ask for it but thank you for your lengthy explanation. You must really like to explain things, don't you? Jack responded. Since you are at it, how about you explain to me the nature of your organization and why you people seem to know a lot about this world and also why do you chase after the divine treasure? Grid Hacker frowned, so you really have gotten it. Now hand it over and we can each go our own. It has fused with me, I don't know how to give it out even if I want to, Jack said before Grid Hacker could complete his sentence. Grid Hacker's frown became deeper. You managed to survive the fusion? That's unfortunate. In that case, you have to come with us. What if I refuse? Jack asked. You have no say in this. 
Graphicsy announced. He took out a long rope with golden inscriptions on its surface. That looked similar to the ones that bound Buller and the others during the Crestfall plane battle, Jack thought. His liberty of movement could free him from movement binding caused by status effects and magic spells, but he doubted it would be effective against a physical binding. As Graphic Z came nearer, Jack used another liberty of movement and broke free from the blue chains. He unsheathed his sword and made a quick swing at Graphic Z, who quickly jumped back as if he had expected it. You truly have the tool to escape from my spell, Grid Hacker said after seeing the exchange. The last time it was all so sudden and his line of sight was partially blocked by his two comrades, so he didn't get a good look. Jack took out his magic staff as well, ready for combat. He watched the three's expressions. They should be clear already that they were no match against him after their last contest, but they seemed perfectly calm. After a brief thought, Jack decided to be prudent. He took out the alert beacon that was given by Duke Alfredo and activated it. It shot into the sky before exploding into colorful fireworks. The jamming device might be able to block the player's messaging system, but it would be helpless if the message was a large visual sign in the sky. Grid Hacker looked at the fireworks with a frown. Aren't you being a bit too vigilant? He asked. Ha, I always trust my guts. I know you have something up your sleeves, Jack replied. Grid Hacker's expression turned grim. In that case, no need to delay things. Get him. As Grid Hacker gave the command, oddly Graphic Z and Sunset stayed on their feet, relaxed. Jack soon found out why. The command was not for those two. Instead, several shadows burst out from around and converged at his position. So apart from preventing him from contacting his friends, the jamming device also shrouded the existence of these people hiding around. Probably to ambush him when he least expected, but his act of using the alert beacon had forced Grid Hacker to reveal them as he could not afford to waste any more time. Jack didn't wait until these ambushers ganged up upon him. He picked one and ran forward to confront the person. All the people wore long brown robes with hoods. Do not kill him. Immobilize him so we can tie him up. Grid Hacker shouted his command. As if I will let them. Jack thought. The one in front of him was using a mace for a weapon. He swung at the approaching Jack, who parried it with his sword, and then utilizing the momentum, Jack jumped onto his opponent's body and used it as a stepping stone to push himself up. Jack somersaulted above the opponent and landed behind him. Ugh, what a monkey, Graphic Z commented. The memory of him being climbed by Jack was still fresh. With his opponent's back in clear sight, Jack unleashed his newly evolved skill, Flame Strike. A streak of fire accompanied his swing as it created a fiery arc and caused an explosive fiery burst when his sword connected with his opponent's back. Damage number of 1293 was floating above his opponent's head as he was sent flying away. He fell nearby the other ambushers, but to Jack's surprise, he got back up again. The HP bar on him indicated that he only lost around one-tenth of his HP. Don't tell me they are, Jack used inspect on them. There were six on them, and all were NPCs. Jack had expected the ones collaborating with Grid Hacker and the others to be also players, but it turned out that was not the case. But giving the matter a second thought, for them to reach this place was unlikely that they relied on their own power. So they were like his group they had NPC escorts as well. Another thing gave that Jack a surprise was that he was not a stranger to these NPCs' names. They were all level 26 acolyte of Phobos. While he was still contemplating, he suddenly heard Peniel shouted, behind. Without even questioning the fairy's warning, he quickly made a roll on the ground, moving away from his initial position. He heard a boom as he stopped his roll and looked at the place where he was a moment ago. Another three figures wearing black cloaks had appeared there. The center one was holding a large two-handed mace which was currently implanted deep in the ground where Jack was standing a moment ago. Jack would have been squashed by that large mace if he didn't roll out of the way as he did, thanks to Peniel's warning. I have to stop relying on the radar, Jack thought. 
Overdependence on that tool had dulled his instinct. He wouldn't have been caught by that kind of sneak attack if it were his past games. When he got up, another thing caught his attention. The lead of the three who had ambushed him just now, was wearing a deer skull hat which he had seen before. He used inspect on them to make sure. It really is you. He exclaimed. The three were priest of Phobos, two were level 29, while the lead one with the deer skull hat was level 30. The lead one was five levels higher than when Jack last saw him, but he had a feeling that it was the same priest that he had fought when he was doing Amy's quest. The priest with the deer skull hat, seeing that his attack had missed, immediately lunged at Jack. Jack did not back away this time, he met the priest head on, clashing strikes with strikes. Jack felt strangely elated despite his disadvantageous situation of being surrounded. An opponent of which he was totally helpless before, he could now go toe-to-toe -to -toe with. He was even at an advantage on this one-on-one -on -one exchange. But as the other two priests approached and the six acolytes came, Jack could not afford to revel in this feeling and play around with his old enemy. He quickly disengaged and cast Ice Ring, sadly none was frozen, but it slowed all the priests and acolytes that surrounded him. Going against these many NPCs, he could not afford to be careless. He activated Adrenaline Rush and heightened State. Unfortunately, his life-burning art was still on cooldown after he used it to fight Eldingar, so it was not available at this time. He also started casting Barrier as he clashed with the surrounding opponents. Luckily they were slowed so he could still cope with that many opponents at the same time. With the help of his barrier, and the fact that each of his landed attacks, whether by sword or magic, had a chance to paralyze the opponents, this gave him an easier time contending with these multiple assaults. Strange, why did he stay at one place? Letting himself get surrounded. Sunset asked. He was simply helpless. It's not an easy thing going against so many enemies at the same time, Graphic Z said. Chapter 384, Descent of a Divine Being That's not his style. I said before he had gone against opponents even much more than this. He always moved around when he fought against numbers. As if answering Sunset's question, Jack punched through the encirclement with a charge while he cast arcane turbulence at the huddled opponents. These NPCs were not like the players who formed an interlocking human wall to block his path, so there were still gaps. Jack targeted one of these gaps. Once he broke through, he used shooting dash to move away. He had endured the encirclement so that all his opponents were clustered at one place. Apart from putting a distance, he was also targeting the damage increase from the shooting dash skill. Added with adrenaline rush, he had stacked up quite a significant damage boost. He then unleashed the strongest skill he had just gotten not long ago, Lightning God Barrage. Large balls of lightning materialized one after another rapidly around Jack. When all twenty balls were formed, Jack sent them all at the clustered acolytes and priests without pause. Those NPCs were still affected by arcane turbulence so their movements were slowed. The lightning balls struck consecutively each ball exploded into a web of lightning. Since all of them were clustered together, every each of the priests and acolytes received the full brunt of the damage from all twenty balls. Each ball dealt more than one thousand damages. All twenty balls combined resulted in over twenty-one thousand damages. All the priests of Phobos were already killed halfway through the barrage. While the three priests of Phobos were below twenty percent HP after the barrage. One even was at a critical because he had also endured Jack's other skills and spells before. Jack sent a sword of light, claiming that one priests. Out of the twelve NPCs, only two remaining with very low HP. Grid Hacker, Graphic Z, and Sunset's eyes and mouths were all wide open, couldn't believe what they had just witnessed. This was the first time that any of them had seen a player took down so many NPCs simultaneously. Jack himself was rather amazed by the result. The skill bestowed by the divine treasure was truly heaven-defying. Still, he didn't pause. He ran forward, planning to finish off the remaining two NPCs before facing Grid Hacker and the rest to force some answers out of them. 
but his body suddenly became heavy. Several bone tusks suddenly erupted out of the ground underneath him. These bone tusks formed a crisscrossing fence around him, inhibiting his movement. Jack hit at these bone tusks using his sword. Damage number appeared, but his hit was not even 2% of the tusks full HP. So sturdy. It will take a long time to break out from this, he lamented. Before he could do anything more, ten other figures jumped out and landed around him. They were all priests of Phobos, but they were all around level 40 to 50. Three out of the ten were special elite while the rests were elite. Shit. There were still more of them? Jack was dismayed. He could see no way to break away from this lineup even if he managed to destroy his current bone prison. We meet again, he suddenly heard a voice from above. Jack looked up and saw a man floating above. He was wearing an elaborate crimson vestment. Jack used his god eye monocle to inspect the floating man. Arl's tracks, Cardinal of Phobos, rare elite human, level, 70. HP, 720,000. Cardinal of Phobos? The thought of possessed Winston came back to him. Now that he observed clearly, the man floating above did resemble the shadow apparition above Winston when he was possessed. You have ruined my plan before in the Duke's mansion, now that you fall into my hand, I will take my time with you, Arl's tracks uttered with a wicked grin. Sir Arl's tracks, do not kill him. Our master needed him alive, Gridhacker called out. Are you ordering me? Arl's tracks glanced at the trio with dissatisfaction. I wouldn't dare, great Sir Arl's tracks, Gridhacker quickly changed his tone. However, it was truly important that he is not killed. He had something that our master needed. As the agreement between our master and your god. Do not speak of our god. Arl Strax's voice boomed, silencing Gridhacker. You are not worthy enough for that. Gridhacker did not dare to talk back. Seeing that Gridhacker obediently kept his mouth shut, Arl's tracks said, Humph, I will honor the agreement. What our god sees in you weak outworlders, it is not my place to question it. The cardinal then opened up his palm, a small purple item in the shape of an octahedron appeared in his hand. Oh no! Do not let him use that on you! Penuel uttered. Lady, do you think there is anything I can do in this condition? Jack complained. He had not stopped hacking at the bone tusks in front of him all this while, but he did not even manage to take away one third of its life. Jack watched helplessly as Cardinal of Phobos approached. Suddenly the Cardinal looked to the side and quickly extended his left arm out. It created a round shield in front of him just as an illusory giant hammer materialized and struck at him. The impact forced the Cardinal to fly some distance away. Numerous arrows appeared with stinging sounds as they flew towards the ten priests surrounding Jack. The priests had no choice but to block the attack. A shadow then dropped down in their center, next to Jack, and made a full circular swing. The light of the swing sent all the priests back, while the bone prison that was immobilizing Jack, was cut cleanly in half. Jack, however, was unharmed. He stared at the figure that had suddenly appeared. Relieved washed over him. Commander. He yelled. It was Commander Quintus that had come. Not only him, Duke Alfredo also flew above, putting himself amongst Jack and Arl's tracks. Laron, Captain Salem, Lucia, Nicholas, and Samuel also appeared as they took up a defensive position around Jack. Everyone. Jack was filled with gratitude as they saw these NPCs arrived. Luckily, he had used the alert beacon early. Are you that Cardinal of Phobos who had invaded my home the last time? Duke Alfredo said to Arl's tracks. The Cardinal snickered at the mention, Ha, such a pity. I almost succeeded. If not for that meddlesome outworlder, the mission would have been a success. Do you know the misery you caused to my butler? And also the life of my maid. I will claim these debts you owed me. Duke Alfredo exclaimed as the air around him exploded with a myriad of colorful lights. Petty display. Arl's tracks shot back as a long snake-headed staff appeared in his hand. 
his aura grew heavy as dark fog started to form around him. The Cardinal of Phobos was five levels stronger than the Duke, but Laron from behind backed the Duke up with his supportive spells. Commander Quintus and the others also readied themselves for a clash. My army is coming, you will all be surrounded soon, Commander Quintus yelled. Everyone indeed could hear incoming rumblings, indicating a large amount of force was enclosing. Jack saw the expressions on Grid Hacker turn solemn. He probably understood that they had lost. If they still did not flee before the army arrived, maybe Jack could ask the army to apprehend them without killing, so Jack could interrogate them. While everyone was about to clash, a soft voice stopped them. All of you, do not move. The air suddenly turned heavy. Even Duke Alfredo and Laron who were floating in the air fell to the ground. Arl's tracks didn't seem to be affected, but when he looked up at the source of the voice, he immediately landed back on the ground and knelt. The other priests of Phobos did the same. Strangely, Gridhacker and the two behind him mimicked the cult's action. Jack turned up to where Arl's tracks had looked a moment ago, and saw a man in a simple black robe floating there, slowly coming down. T that! Oh, no! Jack heard Peniel said. Who is that? Jack asked, but Peniel made no further sound. Jack felt the air grew heavier as the figure in the sky approached. Despite his dragon's eye, Jack felt as if there was a veil covering the man's features. Only when he was slightly closer, that Jack could make out his features. The man's face was that of an elder, yet there was no wrinkle. His skin was pale and he had no eyebrows. He had very defined cheekbones that made his face look thin yet attractive. His eyes were as cold and dark as the night sky. For some reason, Jack felt a tinge of irrational fear surfacing in his heart as he stared at the man. I see you have the lightning god blessing within you. You have fused with that divine treasure, a pity, the man spoke. His voice was soft yet clear. Jack's body experienced involuntary shiver when the voice reached his ears. Chapter 385, Gods and Goddesses Jack looked at the others. Everyone seemed to be unable to move or talk, did they experience a much heavier pressure than what he felt? He returned his attention to the figure above. Just comply with whatever he wants, Jack heard Peniel's voice again. A high fairy. The man uttered, then he lifted his hand. Peniel who was invisible turned tangible beside Jack. Jack looked at her in surprise. From her expression, she was clearly forced out of her hidden dimension against her will. The man moved his finger and Peniel floated towards him. S stop. Jack uttered. Aren't Peniel supposed to be unaffected by anything? She was perfectly fine even on the occasions when she was flying around the area of AoE spells during his combat. Jack tried to move but realized now that his body was heavier than he thought. The man lifted one of his eyelids and said, Did you just give me an order, Outworlder? He floated down and was now floating directly in front of Jack. A wave of fear gripped Jack's mind and caused him to tremble. This made no sense, Jack thought. It was unlike him to fear someone this much. Not when he knew nothing about said person. How about you tell this Outworlder who I am? The man said to Peniel who seemed to be held by an invisible force beside him. He, he is fear, Peniel said. The god of fear, who was worshipped by the cult of Phobos. Yes, my cult. Useless as they are, they are still mine. And I heard that you have given them troubles more than once, fear said as he returned his attention to Jack. Jack felt those dark eyes were pulling him into a bottomless abyss he tried his best to avert his gaze from those eyes. More than I am comfortable with, fear added. Dealing with you outworlders and these mortals were normally beneath me, you are but an infinitesimal existence to me. But some disturbing knowledge had come to my attention and irresistible bargains were made. One of those bargains required me to help in gaining these divine treasures. Hence, here we are. You can't do this. Gods and goddesses are prohibited to meddle in the matter of mortals, Peniel said. Did I give you the permission to speak, fairy? Fear uttered without sparing her a glance. 
He then gripped his hand into a knuckle. Ayaha! Peniel screamed as black smoke coalesced around her. Peniel! Jack yelled out. Peniel's scream soon stopped. The black smoke dispersed and she fell to the ground. Not moving. P. Peniel. Jack called, but the fairy's body stayed still. Now she won't be able to disturb our conversation any longer, Fear said coldly. Why, you bastard. Jack gritted his teeth as he commanded his body to move. His body was shaking heavily from the effort. Hee hee, are you trying to break away from my influence? Fear snickered. His dark eyes then gave a short glint. Jack felt that his vision went black. He could see nothing but infinite darkness. The darkness however was not vast, it was cramped, and it was enclosing. He had a difficulty in breathing in this enclosed nothingness. In this space, all he felt was fear. Irrational fear. All the fears he had ever experienced in his life, pain, loneliness, being not good enough. All the fears he might experience in the future, death, losing the people he cared about, failures. All the fears he thought never existed, the fear of the unknown. All commingled into a single simple thought, terror. This thought made him lose any other thoughts. He could not think of anything as he sank deeper into the sea of helplessness. Unable to swim back out to the surface. He was losing his breathing and he was drowning. His only thought was to accept this fear and sank further into the dark and bottomless abyss. In his fractured mind, Peniel's face suddenly fleeted by. Jack then remembered her voice. The voice that had accompanied him all this time through this game world. The knowledge of never hearing her voices ever again, it brought about a feeling other than fear. It brought about anger, which turned to fury, then grew into a rage. A rage that swept aside all the fears that were currently gripping his heart. Jack's eyes snapped open and saw the object of his rage in front of him. His storm breaker came out as he executed flame strike. The trail of blaze went towards fear who was directly in front of him. When the flaming sword was only a few inches left from fear's head, it abruptly stopped. The flaming explosion which followed the skill's impact was nowhere to be seen. Instead, the flame died down with a whimper. Fear's two fingers were gripping Stormbreaker's blade. Fear furrowed his forehead. You broke my fear domain? He asked. His face was still indifferent despite the furrow, but there was a tint of astonishment in his tone. This tone, however, soon turned into annoyance, you lowly creature dares to defy me. He tightened the grip on his fingers. There was a loud snapping sound as Jack watched with disbelief as his storm breaker, which was supposed to be unbreakable, broke into pieces right in front of his very eyes. The broken shards of the black blade fell onto the ground. Fear watched his handiwork with a smile, he then looked back at Jack, fully expecting to see the outworlder's eyes filled with surprise and fear. Yet, what came into his vision was the tip of a magic staff. Jack fired a monobullet point blank. Though Jack was indeed surprised by his storm breaker's fate, it only lasted for an instant. His rage over this god was still prevalent. All he cared about right now was to give this supposed supreme being a slap on his face. The monobullet hit Fear's face and popped like a burst balloon. Damage number of one appeared on Fear's head. Despite the overwhelmingly insignificant damage, Jack was grinning savagely while Fear was scowling. What god of fear? Even an infinitesimal existence like me can touch you. You are nothing. Jack said loudly. You ant. Fear was clearly angered by the provocation. His hand shaped into a claw and dark clouds materialized and gripped at Jack, restraining him. You're almighty, please do not kill him. Gridhacker called out. Silence. Fear proclaimed and Gridhacker was seemingly slapped by a tremendous force. He was thrown away due to the force and had his HP hanging by only a thread. No one talks to me as you did, so I will grant you a proper reward of death, Fear said as his hand gripped into a knuckle. Everyone expected Jack to lose his life then and there, but a green light enveloped him, eroding all the black smoke on his body. 
Before anyone could make sense of what had happened, an otherworldly beautiful woman with long golden hair and blue eyes came out of thin air behind Jack. Her appearance was that of a young woman but yet also gave people the impression that she was centuries old. She made a pull and Jack was dragged to her back. Gee Goddess Serenity! Jack uttered when he recognized the woman that had come between him and fear. Fear was frowning as he glared at Serenity, what is the meaning of this? That is what I should ask you, fear. You know the rule set by the Creator was that none of us gods and goddesses are to interfere in the affair of mortals. Yet, here you are, interfering. Serenity's voice brought about calm into the hearts of all who presented. The fear that was holding them immobile was dispelled. Finally able to move, Duke Alfredo and the rest quickly gathered behind Goddess Serenity with Jack. They remained silent as they knew that the affair between these two beings was not something they had the power to involve themselves with. Creator? Rule? Humph, if only you knew the truth. Such a joke, fear uttered. Do not make excuses. You know if you continue to involve yourself, I will also not stay impartial, Serenity said. Ha, so what? Do you think you can do much against me? Fear asked. What if I also demand you to stay your hands as well? Another voice was heard. This one boomed as if a loud thunderclap. Everyone looked up to the source of the voice and saw two figures floating down. One was a middle-aged man with a clean and handsome face, his hair was blue. His body was geared in full golden armor that constantly shone and gave a feeling of hope in all that laid eyes on it. The other one was an old man with a long white beard that Jack also recognized. He was on Urine, the demigod that presided over their passing from the tutorial world into this one. The two landed beside Serenity, it was clear from their stance that they were in opposition from fear. Do you think you can take me on? The man in the golden armor asked. Jack surmised he had to also be a god to dare to talk that way to fear. Chapter 386 Restoration of the Lost Fear snorted. Humph, you and your codes. I won't be surprised if you are also into that farce that is called our Creator's Rules. You six had always been sticklers of rules. You still dare to call us six? Two of us have gone missing, I don't suppose the three of you have anything to do with it. Probably, fear gave him a sneer. Do you try to test my patience? The god in golden armor asked. Although I might not be able to beat you, do not take it that I fear you, hope. There is nothing that I, fear, have to be afraid of. Do you think you can unleash your full might with all these mortals around? The god that was called hope did not answer. I think not, fear said after hope's silence. Well, I can't do anything with you two around. Guess I will leave it at this. Try to stop me if you like. Fear extended his hand, a portal made of darkness appeared where he pointed. Go, he said. Arl's tracks and his minions followed the command and went directly into the portal. Gridhacker was hesitant. You're almighty, about that outworlder. You can stay if you want, Fear simply replied. Considering the situation, Gridhacker decided retreat was the better option. He and his two other companions went into the portal as well. Once they passed through, the portal vanished. Fear was about to leave when Serenity called out, Fear, we don't care about your cults, but know that if you or any of your demigods tried anything to this outworlder, we will come again. Fear glanced back, his eyes darted between Hope and Serenity before lingering for a while on Jack. He then snorted and turned around without saying anything. His figure slowly dissolved into nothingness. Duke Alfredo and the others heaved a sigh of relief when the god of fear had finally left. Even though they themselves were powerful individuals, they were still nothing to these gods and goddesses. All of them came forward and thanked the god of hope and goddess of serenity for their help. Not every day one could have the chance to interact with these divine beings. Jack? on the other hand, went straight to where Peniel was lying. He scooped her up gently with two hands and put his ear onto her chest, trying to hear a pulse. There was none. He hurriedly brought her to Serenity, Goddess, 
can you help heal her? Serenity stared at the motionless fairy in Jack's hands. She was silent for a while. Jack was dreading that she would say that there was nothing that could be done for Peniel, not even with the power of the goddess. Her silence only lasted for a breath, but Jack felt like he waited too long for her response. She said, since this is done due to the interference of a god, then we are allowed to undo his deed. She made a gesture with her hands, rune was formed one after another until it formed a complete spell formation. Eight runes. Jack watched in amazement. A pillar of light split the clouds on the sky and came down directly where Jack was standing. Jack felt warmth and comfort when the light touched his body. The light consolidated into a dense white fog that covered Peniel's body, it was as if he was holding a dense ball of light now. Jack felt a tingling feeling on his palm that was warm at first but soon intensified into blistering heat. Yet, he did not move his hand. He remained still and endured the heat. Because of the heat, Jack did not feel that there were movements on his palm. After the dense white fog dispersed, he saw Peniel's figure was sitting upon his palm and looking around in confusion. She blinked a few times as if trying to remember what had happened. She then realized the presence in front of her and quickly get up to her feet as she made a curtsy. All hail the exalted one. Your servant, Peniel, greets you, she said. She then also realized the presence of hope and quickly sent him a greeting as well, this lowly servant salute the great and mighty god of hope. You have done well in the service I tasked you in accompanying this outworlder, Serenity said to her. He was rather at a panic when he thought he has lost you. Peniel turned to Jack, who was looking elsewhere, trying to act indifferent. Of course he is afraid of losing me, he can't do anything without me, Peniel declared. Jack gave her a gentle flick for a response. Hey! Peniel protested. Serenity gave a soft laugh seeing the two. Jack suddenly thought of something and took out his broken storm breaker. It was just a hilt with half a blade on it. Goddess! You mentioned that you are allowed to do something since it was interference from a god. This sword of mine was broken by that god of fear. Can you also restore it back? Serenity gave the broken weapon a look and asked, Is this the weapon from the seed of thousand forms which I gave to you? Uh, yes. Can it not be restored because it was from that item? Jack asked worriedly. This growth weapon was another of the reasons that had put him much ahead of other outworlders, Losing it would be a significant decrease in his prowess. Of course it is not a problem, I was just curious, Serenity replied to Jack's relief. But as she was about to touch the broken sword, Hope came and said, Allow me. Knowing the guy was an all-powerful god, Jack did nothing as Hope took the broken sword from his hand. He did try to inspect this god, but same as Serenity and Fear, all he got was a bunch of question marks. As Hope gripped the hilt of the sword, tiny golden lights appeared and danced around the broken sword. Shards of the broken swords fluttered on the ground before flying up and coming to the broken sword on Jack's hand as if attracted by a strong magnet. They then reattached themselves to the broken part of the blade while the golden lights continued to dance and mend them together. It was not long before the sword was whole again. No, not whole. It looked slightly different. Jack thought of the reformed blade. Here, Hope opened his palm and the black sword floated slowly back to Jack. Jack extended his arm to receive the sword. Once he gripped it, he noticed that the sword was slightly longer than the previous, but lighter. There were also more golden lines running along its body. He quickly checked its statistics. Stormbreaker, level 35, rare one-handed sword, bound weapon. Physical damage 210. Attack speed 4. Cannot be destroyed. Bound to storm wind. Dexterity plus 6. 15% chance to cause poison status effect on each attack. Over limit, release the weapon's hidden power that adds an additional 200% damage as chaos damage, increase weapon range by 3 feet, and decrease target's defense by 90%. Duration, 3 minutes. Cool down, 6 hours. Its damage power had increased despite being on the same level. 
so had its attack speed, no wonder the sword felt lighter. He only ever saw an attack speed of four on Rock's weapon like a dagger. Combined with his high dexterity, his attack speed would be even more deadly now. But the most significant improvement was its over-limit ability. All of the aspects of its ability except for the additional damage had been increased. He was already happy that his Storm Breaker was getting fixed. But not only was it fixed, it was also even getting strengthened. He was at a loss for words of this benefit that Peniel had to remind him, you are being awfully rude. Jack quickly gave a deep bow to Hope after Peniel's reminder, I can't thank you enough for granting me this boon. Hope gave him a simple nod. It was by right we should straighten the wrongs that our misguided kind had wrought, he said. I never expect that an outworlder had already managed to obtain a divine treasure at your level, but maybe that's why they came for you, Serenity said to Jack. I have put a mark on you after you saved me, that's why I can sense a divine being appear near you and come immediately. If any god or demigod comes at you again, we will know, and we will come to your aid. However, we will not give you any assistance if it was below divine level interference. And now that fear had targeted you, you should be careful, his cult was not to be underestimated. Thank you for your warning, Goddess Serenity, Jack replied and took this chance to pry. What about the outworlders that were with fear? Do you know anything about them? Unfortunately we don't, Serenity said. Since we are not allowed to interfere, we also do not keep tabs of outworlders' activity. But there are indeed some outworlders' activities that are affecting this world in a concerning way. They should be part of these outworlders that are associated with fear. We will perform more review on our part and have our mortal forces check them out. We can't stay any longer, Hope declared. Chapter 387, Rewards of Chain Quest Yes, Serenity agreed. We only came as a counterbalance to fear's appearance. Now that he was gone, it was time for us to leave as well. There was still much Jack wanted to ask, but he did not dare to stall these divine beings. He bid them farewell, thank you again for your help, we can rest well knowing such benevolent divine beings such as yourselves are watching over us. Fawner, Peniel chided him with a whisper. Jack also waved at Onurin who nodded back at him. The three then left as mysteriously as they appeared. Serenity simply faded into nothingness, but in a more graceful way than fear. Hope and Onurin turned into two pillars of light that shot up into the cloud. Were you really that upset when you thought I was lost? Peniel asked after those divine beings were gone. Nat, I was fine, Jack replied, but then added. Well, maybe a little. You know, a little tiny tinsy bit worried, perhaps. Peniel was quiet for a while before saying, Thank you. Jack turned to her in surprise, What are you being so formal for? It doesn't suit you. Humph, do not expect it so often, Peniel said as she flew away. At this time, the rest of the army arrived. Commander Quintus ordered them to spread out to search the perimeter. It was doubtful that the cult was still around but it was still prudent to make sure. Thank you for coming to my aid. Your Grace, Jack said when Duke Alfredo approached him. I'm just glad that everything went well. That was pretty perilous just now. I never expected those divine beings to appear here. It seemed that this matter with the cult is more serious than I thought, considering they truly have a mad god backing them. We will need to tread more carefully in the future. Hey, we also have divine beings backing us, two of them some more as evident to what had happened just now. Jack consoled. Didn't you hear them? You are the one getting marked, we don't have the same backing, Captain Salem reminded. Well, but they did say those divine beings were not allowed to interfere. If that fear guy involves himself personally again, I'm sure those two will come again as they did just now. Let's hope that is the case, Duke Alfredo said. Oh, by the way, I have something for you, Your Grace. Jack said as he remembered something. He took out a bottle. It was the all-curse expulsion potion that he had gotten from the dungeon. I believe this should be the thing we had come to look for, 
Jack said as he handed the bottle to the Duke. Duke Alfredo took it into his hands as he gave it an inspection. He then looked at Jack, gratitude could be seen in his eyes. He gave Jack a slight bow. Allow me to express my appreciation, Mr. Stormwind. You have been a godsend in my endeavor to recover this cure and you have proved yourself again to be the greatest aid I can hope for in this quest of mine. My wife and I are forever indebted to you. Um. No worry. Really, it's not a problem, Jack felt awkward with the Duke's formal gratitude, he quickly added. I hope the Duchess can recover soon with that potion. I believe she will, Duke Alfredo said with a smile. It was the most natural smile Jack had ever seen expressed by the Duke. Jack felt happy for the Duke, he genuinely hoped the Duchess would truly recover, it would have been a big waste of efforts otherwise. As if to reassure him, a notification voice was heard, Congratulations on completing the chain quest, Duchess Cure. Receive rewards of 120 gold coins, 1,500,000 experience points, and golden noble headband. Jack was stunned by the announcement. So much. He thought. With this gold reward, he had 362 gold coins in his bag already, enough to upgrade both Ellie's restaurant and Amy's bakery for their second upgrade. He was looking forward to doing so once he returned to the capital. Even from the experience reward alone, it was extremely abundant. As he was wondering why he didn't hear the sweet notification voice that informed him of his level up, he remembered about the lightning god blessing. He looked inside his inherent skill and saw that its experience bar was half full now. It really ate up all the experience received, Jack thought. Great, thanks to the completion of the Duke's quest, the time needed for him to feed this greedy inherent skill had been cut down to half. He then looked for the new equipment in his storage bag which was the last reward the notification had informed him of. He found a simple-looking gold-colored headband. Upon closer observation, he saw multiple runes covering it. He used inspect on it. Golden Noble Headband, Level 2858, Super Rare Medium Armor. Physical Defense, 69. Magical Defense, 69. Durability, 50. Wisdom plus 8. Plus 20% resistance to all mental status ailments. Purify the mind and body, active ability cleanse all status ailments, immune to all the new status ailments for the next 10 seconds. Cool down, 1 hour. Another super rare, cool. He exclaimed in his mind. His current gear was slowly getting replaced by better grade equipment. This should help to keep him ahead of the others. The defense on this headgear was slightly different than the other medium armor, it had the exact same defense between physical and magical defense, he preferred such balance though. The armor's abilities were also great. His current helmet gave him 40% resistance to dizzy and disoriented. Even though it will be a setback for these two status ailments if he changed his headgear, all his other mental status ailments gained a boost. The active ability served almost the same function as his purifying pendant. The difference was his pendant's one was passive ability. It activated automatically once he was inflicted by a mental status ailment, while this new gears allowed manual activation, which gave more versatility. Additionally, purify the mind and body not only affected mental status ailments but all status ailments, so physical ailments could also be cleansed. With all these improvements, he immediately replaced his current headgear. One thing that Jack thought was slightly regretful was his look. The silver guard helmet gave him a rather cool and intimidating appearance, while this golden noble headband only covered a small portion of his head. It made him look like a certain monkey king from the east. While he was enjoying the rewards, he realized that Duke Alfredo had been waiting patiently with a book in his hand. Is that for me? Jack asked. This is a spell that had accompanied me during my early adventurer days, Duke Alfredo said. I hope it can help you in yours. Jack was elated, there was even an extra reward. Jack received the book with glee. Not forgetting to thank the Duke politely, of course. He checked on the book immediately. Technique book, Myriad Ensnaring Chains, 
super rare consumable. Grant the skill, myriad ensnaring chains. Restriction, any advanced magic class. Sounds imposing, Jack thought. He was just about to learn the technique book when he heard Peniel's voice, what's that ugly thing on your head? Peniel had been flying around and had just arrived back. What do you know? This is what we human calls the latest cool fashion, Jack replied. Not admitting that he actually agreed with her. Look was not important anyway, this headband served him better, that was enough. Function before form, if he might put it. Peniel ignored his statement and said, I sensed that you have just completed the chain quest and gotten the reward. Yes, it was really generous, Jack described to her all the rewards he had received. As I have suspected, she said. Suspect what? Why do you suspect anything? Jack asked. The whole thing doesn't make sense for an SSS quest. The rewards themselves had proven so. They are too pitiful as rewards for a quest of that grade. Pitiful. Jack was speechless by Peniel's comment. He had been jubilant over his gains and this fairy was calling them pitiful. Yet. If I may say, the only item that was aligned with that quest grade was the lightning god sphere you got after defeating Eldingar. The others were only the rewards of roughly an S rank chain quest. Really? Jack was skeptical of the fairy's evaluation. Are you doubting me? Peniel asked while giving him a sideways glare. No, of course not, ma'am, Jack hurriedly answered. After thinking a bit, he then said, if what you said is true. Could it be someone hacked the quest to change its grade? Hack? How do you hit something that is not tangible? Uh, I mean tamper. Could someone tamper with this quest, and make a change to it? Give it a higher grade to its description than it should be. Chapter 388, Peniel comes out in the open. Even if someone could, which I don't think so as that was even above what gods and goddesses were capable of. Why would someone do it? Peniel asked. You said just now that Lightning God Sphere was the only reward that made sense for the quest, right? Jack replied. You don't mean. Yet, yeah, probably someone tampered with the quest just to allow that divine treasure to appear within this quest. You yourself were plenty shocked when you saw that divine treasure. Peniel was silent as she pondered deeply. Who would want to do that? Someone who was after the divine treasures. Jack answered. Those grid hackers group seemed to be a likely candidate considering their in-depth knowledge on the quest and the temple. Still, something confused me though. What? It was Peniel who asked for an explanation now. If they have the ability to tamper with the quest, then why not just directly give themselves the divine treasures? Why go through all these troubles? Perhaps they have their limitations as well. Well, anyway. No need to ponder too much about it. We won't get the answer that way anyway. We will just have to beat the answers out of those guys when we see them again. Let's talk about another thing. Take a look at this book. Is it a good spell? Jack said as he showed Peniel the technique book he had gotten from the Duke. Your ability to set important matters aside is truly astounding, Peniel quipped with sarcasm, but he still studied the book. Myriad ensnaring chains. She read. Not bad, how did you get it? It's the additional reward directly from the Duke. Part of the rewards that you called pitiful. So, is it a good spell? Remember the spell that had those crimson chains coming out and ensnared the Grim Sand Drake? Peniel asked. This is that spell. Jack asked back. That was an advanced spell? I thought that was an elite spell. How could an advanced spell manage to hold that beast? Even though it still managed to break the chains, the spell did hold it down for some time. Go ahead and learn the spell. You will know soon, Peniel said. Again with her mysterious answer, Jack thought. But he still did as she said, he was going to learn it anyway one way or another. He activated the technique book's interface and accepted the learning option. Myriad ensnaring chains. Active skill, 
Evolving Skill, Level 1 20th. Mark an area of 5 meters diameter, 3 chains with a length of 15 meters will come out of this area and ensnare anything that comes into range. Range, 20 meters. Duration, 20 seconds. Mana consumed, 60. Cooldown, 5 minutes. The description did sound similar to what the Duke had cast against the Drake previously, though the Duke's spell produced more than just three chains. Probably more chains would be added as the skill level increased, Jack assumed. This spell was like the grandfather spell of Magic Bind. Jack thought it was even better than that blue chain spell Grid Hacker had used on him. With a chain of length 15 meters coming out from an area of 5 meters diameter, it practically put the area affected by these chains to be 35 meters diameter. That was a very wide area of effect. Jack then noticed a new type of description on the spell. Evolving spell. He asked. Yes. Peniel explained, it meant that even though you can learn this spell as an advanced spell, once you change class to an elite one, this spell will automatically transform into an elite version of the same spell. You mean this spell will get even stronger? Jack reconfirmed. It will. Jack sucked in a breath. He had gotten offensive, defensive, and movement skills. Now adding this spell that could effectively control the enemy's movement in a large area, his arsenal of skills and spells could be said to be almost complete. One regrettable thing about this spell was it took four runes to form its spell formation. He had to practice in order to be able to cast it efficiently during battle. However, he suspected that once the spell evolved into its elite form, the spell formation would also change to needing five runes, because he remembered that was how many runes on the spell formation when Duke Alfredo cast it. The Duke was having a chat with Commander Quintus when Jack was conversing with Peniel and admiring his new spell. Their chat had ended so Jack asked the Duke, so, what now? Now that the target of our expedition has been achieved, we will return as soon as possible to the capital. I will let you coordinate with your friends for the journey back arrangement. We will leave first thing tomorrow. Got it, Jack said. Peniel who was sitting on his shoulder suddenly uttered, time to hide. She then vanished into her hidden dimension just before John and the others came to sight. As they approached, John asked, what's that ugly thing on your head? Jack ignored the guy, but John's next question took him by surprise, what's the deal with that fairy? Why does she disappear when we come? Jack was mum, he gave the guy a clueless expression. I know the fairy got something to do with you. Just call her out already, John insisted. Hum. Jack continued to act. Do you forget already that I have binoculars? John said as he took out the item. You have been watching? Jack asked. Friend, I have been watching ever since that scary dude appeared. You did? Then why didn't you come rushing to help? Are you kidding me? That guy can even immobilize Duke Alfredo there, you think ants like us coming here can contribute anything other than giving our lives away? The second he exhibited his power, I have everyone stopped, then we stayed and watched from a distance. Jack was speechless. What? Do you expect us to be like you, rushing in blindly when a friend is in grave danger? John asked when he saw Jack's expression. The notion would have been nice, Jack said. I don't do nice in case you haven't noticed, John replied. But please know that we are resolved to avenge you if you died back there. Oh, wow. I'm touched, Jack said sarcastically. I know. I'm a good friend, John responded, intentionally or honestly didn't catch the sarcasm. Now, how about you introduce us to that fairy friend of yours? Jack thought for a bit before calling Peniel out. She emerged and waved to John and the others. This is Peniel, Jack introduced. She is a high fairy. Hi, my name is John, John said. I am Jeannie. As the others were about to say their names, Peniel said to them, don't bother. I know all your names. I've been with you throughout this expedition. Yes, she was with me all the time. You guys just cannot see her, Jack said. 
you devious secretive man, how many secrets are you still keeping from us? John said to Jack. Hey, every man is entitled to his own secret, Jack defended himself. John didn't give him any attention anymore as he chatted with Peniel, Jeannie and the others joined in as well. It turned out Peniel was rather excited to converse with them as well. She was quite chatty after all, to have her only conversed with him all this time, he did feel some guilt after thinking about it. Perhaps he should stop asking her to hide from now on. Out of their conversation with the fairy, the others found out that the fairy was the source of all the information that Jack had been claiming to have gotten from the library all this time. John gave him a deriding glance before returning his attention to the fairy. He seemed to be the most passionate in talking to the fairy, most probably trying to dig as much information as he could from her. Seeing that Peniel did not mind, Jack just let them be. It was good to see her making friends as well. He couldn't just continue to treat him as his property. The army rested on the outskirt of the temple, some soldiers were setting up camp within the temple. Everyone had made their preparation, after the night passed, they would start to journey back once the sun was up. The mood was light now that they knew they had succeeded in the expedition, all they had to do now was deliver the potion back to the Duchess. Jack and the others camped outside the temple, they preferred the outdoor setup. They were gathering together around a bonfire as they chatted under the night sky. Peniel joined in the group chatting now that she was exposed. She especially liked to chat with Bowler as the guy never seemed to stop talking. John continued to try for more information from the fairy but she was not that feeble-minded. She only let out a little bit of information without giving too much. Life in this world was not too bad, Jack thought. Well, that was considering if he did not think about the group who was intent on catching him while being assisted by an all-powerful god. Chapter 389 are you thinking what I'm thinking? Jack left the group as he took a little walk around the ruins under the night sky. He didn't go too far and stayed within the perimeter the army had set up. The army had combed the surroundings and they found no sign of Grid Hacker or the cult's presence but it was still better to stay vigilant. As he decided to sit on a small slab of a broken down structure to rest and enjoyed the quiet night sky, he heard a woman's voice, How are you doing? Jack turned and saw Jeannie came by and sat next to him. It's not every day someone goes up against a god and survived. How are you holding? I'm fine. Thank you for the concern, Jack replied. It was pretty dangerous though. Yes, John described what he saw through his binoculars. It was rather unsettling, knowing there is such a powerful creature targeting you. But you are protected by the other gods and goddess so you shouldn't worry too much about it. There is still the matter of that mysterious organization, they called their Guild World Maker. That name was not any of the previous famous game guilds, but I think they know the reason why we are sent to this world. Really? Why do you say that? Aren't they simply a group of players who stumbled upon a rare quest that involved themselves with the cult? It was John who asked, suddenly appeared as well. He came and took the liberty to sit on Jack's other side. When John saw the two staring at him, he said, What? I am not disturbing anything, right? You people aren't dating or anything like that, are you? Jack ignored the tease, he related the full story about what had happened to him since the world first turned. Including how he got his second class and how he stumbled upon Goddess Serenity. How he later encountered the fragments of maps that later brought all of them to this place. And about who Sunset originally is, how he had infiltrated this expedition with full knowledge of what awaited here. Then came this mysterious group who was after the divine treasure he had acquired from the dungeon boss, till their confrontation earlier today. Jeannie and John were quiet as they digested Jack's story. That was quite a lot to digest on, Jeannie commented. But from your story, that group indeed seemed to have more knowledge about this world than the average players. So that thing on your left eyes is the one that allowed you to detect others' positions? John asked. Yes, it is called God Eye Monocle. Some from that mysterious group also possessed it. This was also originally Sunsets, uh, I mean Sunrises. 
From your story, I reckon all alien entity items have a 100% chance to drop when the owner was killed. The next time you encounter that group again, target the one that wears the monocle. Once you get an extra one, please remember I reserve one first. Jack gave him a side eye. This was the issue he prioritized on? That mysterious group said they wanted to bring you somewhere alive, does that mean they have a way to take away that divine treasure you have merged with? Are they really capable of something like that? Aren't your second class also gained after fusing with a legendary item? Can they take that away as well? Jeannie asked. Now this woman was more serious and reasonable to talk with, Jack thought. He said, honestly, I have no idea what this group can and cannot do. I don't even know how many people they have. It was indeed unsettling dealing with people whose existence is still concealed. It is, Jack lamented. You are vulnerable being alone like this. You better go and join a guild. At least with more people, you should have more protection. They can also provide aid and backup when that group comes at you again. Nah, I hate being in a guild. No freedom. Too many restrictions. Then make your own guild, John suggested. As a leader, you will be free to do what you want. Ha ha ha, very funny. What kind of members do you think want a guild where the leader goes off on his own doing whatever he likes? I am only good at fighting, I'm not really a leader material or a people person. I have no problem leading a small team, but asking me to organize a guild with hundreds of members is a long shot. I get you, friend. I'm good at planning, but it will be a miracle to find people willing to follow all my plans. Mostly it was by manipulation that they do what I ask. And I am also not the type that likes to be ordered around, that's why I'm not in any guild all this time. Well, if it is me, I had been in a guild before, as Storm here is aware. It's difficult to be in a guild if their ideology is too different than yours, Jeannie told them. I have no problem leading, people naturally follow me and I kinda enjoy that actually. But in a fighting game, I am only of average skill, so not many I can inspire. I am also not much of a thinker, and I think a leader who can't think ahead of the future is not a complete leader. She then sighed, but after a few seconds, she thought of something. She turned and saw the two were also looking at her. They then looked at each other silently before Jack asked, Are you two thinking what I am thinking? I think I'm thinking what you are thinking, Jeannie said. John said, If you are thinking about the sexy waitress from the Raven's Den, then I guess we are thinking the same thing. Jack and Jeannie gave him a weird look. I'm kidding. John chuckled. It was obvious what the three of us are thinking. We want to pool our expertise together and form a guild, don't we? A guild with us three as the leaders. Yet, yeah, with the three of us covering each other's strength and weakness, we should be able to provide decent leadership to the guild, Jeannie said. As long as we don't disagree on the general direction the guild is heading, John said. Problem with multiple leaders arrangement is that there might be a chance where we disagree, and that usually takes time to smooth over and will cause inefficiency during decision making. I think we work pretty well together, so that shouldn't be a problem, Jeannie said. I don't care how you organize the guild as long as I'm given free reign, Jack commented. John and Jeannie looked at Jack. John then said to Jeannie, if we are going with this. I have a feeling it will just be the two of us doing most of the leadership works. I think that should not be a problem, Jeannie said. If we have a difficult dungeon to conquer, or need some other guilds whacked, we can send him. John nodded, that sounds like a good arrangement. Hey, why did it sound like I am more of a lackey than a leader? Jack protested. In that way, you will be more free, ain't that what you like? John asked. Well, yes, but... Then it's settled. You will be our executioner. John proclaimed. Any monster or player we need vanquishing, we will call for you. Jeannie giggled, sound like we are really doing this. Of course, first thing first. We need to agree on a general direction for this planned guild first, John said. 
As I said, it will be a problem later if we have a disagreement. We need to set a common understanding of what we are trying to achieve by building this guild, a framework we can all adhere to. Like a tenet, Jeannie said. A tenet, a creed, a dogma, or whatever you call it. We will then revolve the guild's principles around this groundwork. I have seen many guilds failed halfway or veered too far away from what the founders had envisioned when the guild was started. If we are doing this, I don't want us to fall into the same blunder. If we do this, we do this right. All right. Then, what is our vision? What are we building this guild for? What do we wish to achieve? That's easy, Jack stood up, he took out his new storm breaker and pointed it to the sky. Our guild's tenet will be what we all gamers strive for. It's for fun. John and Jeannie gazed at him with that silly pose of his for a bit before turning away and said to each other. Forget about him. What do you propose? I think we should take some time to think about this. It will be the most important thing for our guild after all. Hey, hey, you two, I'm being serious, Jack interrupted their discussion. What's wrong with having fun as a purpose? Your head is the wrong one, Jeannie chided. How can fun be a purpose? Chapter 390, Returning to Their Wrath Well, the entire idea of a game is to have fun. We have ended in a game world. What's wrong with having fun? If you compare our... I just can't agree with such a shallow purpose, Jeannie objected. No, 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 let him finish. I think he is onto something here, John said. Why? Thank you. As I said, if you compare our life with the one before this world. How do you see these two separate lives? Can't you remember how boring it is before? We are getting confined by all those rules and routines, and that's all we know about how to live. We need to do a lot of stuff that most of the time we don't like to, just to get by. We might be doing one work at a time and thinking that things might get better but we are still doing the same things five years later. Or different job but basically the same thing. In that old world, the rules were pretty much decided, and the force in power was pretty much established. Those forces will pretty much remain in power while those powerless toiled endlessly just to manage. In this world, however, we are all new slates. Everyone is still learning the ropes here. Everyone has the same chance to make something of themselves. Even commoners like us have the chance to write our own rule in this new world. There are adventures everywhere. A lot of unknowns to be explored, and we are given the means, the power, to do these adventures and write these new rules. What else if it is not fun? Okay, we can ignore him now, John told Jeannie. Jack rolled his eyes at him, the fellow was still as annoying as ever. He said, come on, you two. There is no need to think too much about a purpose. The most simple thing is usually the best because it comes from our hearts. If we try to think up a complicated purpose, it will just end up making it difficult for everybody. It is very like you, giving advice to not think about something too much, John criticized. I like that saying that it comes from our hearts, though, Jeannie commented. Cheesy but nice. Come on, too much thinking is not always good, Jack insisted. Now, let's try this. The two of you say the first thing that comes to your mind for our guild purpose. No need for something grand, no need to be afraid that it sounds stupid as well. Just a simple thought, at this moment, now. Start with you first, John. You have three seconds, go. John touched his chin with a thought, while Jack made a gesture as if he was counting. Well, if you insist. Okay, well, then the first thing that comes to me is to make the guild the best ever in this world. Ha, always peg you for an ambitious one, Jeannie commented. Most thinkers are, my lady, John responded. Now, you, Jeannie. You have three seconds as well. Go. Jack said. Uh, you are becoming rather pushy with this now, aren't you? Jeannie said. Jack did not respond to her words, 
he continued to give her his hand sign of counting to three. Er, um. Friendship then. I want our guild to become the most harmonious and loyal community ever, Jeannie said quickly as Jack's fingers counted to three. Okay, then that's our guild's tenet. Jack proclaimed. Hey. John and Jeannie were muddled by his words. A fun guild composed of a collection of close-knit friends that was aiming for the top. Jack declared. What the hell, you just go and combine all our thoughts together. John commented. Hee hee, why not? We will be the three leaders, right? Then the guild's purpose should come equally from the three of us. I actually kind of like that, Jeannie said with a giggle. See, two against one. It's settled then. Jack exclaimed. What two against one? I never say I object it, John said. Great. Then we have reached a unanimous decision in our first guild's meeting. I would say that's not bad for a start, Jack uttered. Leave it to Storm to speed things along, Jeannie said. Yeah, he is the embodiment of that sportswear commercial, just do it, John added. Now we just need to find enough members to register. The rule said we will need at least 30 members to form a guild. They heard some footsteps. They turned and saw Peniel leading the others coming to them. So, the three of you are here, Bowler said as he approached them with the others. I was worried if something had happened. We are not in a safe zone, shouldn't wander around too much. Jack, John and Jeannie looked at each other and laughed. Ask and you shall receive, Jeannie commented. What are you laughing about? Bowler asked. Yeah, don't keep us out, man. Did something good happen? The man added. Jack then informed them about their plan to build a guild. He asked them if they were interested to join. All of them did. The man was in doubt for a bit, Jack told him he could still lead his own men of Solidarity's gang within the guild. They would just be a bigger family, that's all. He agreed then. There were only nine of them there. Another two had not survived the dungeon, weird trap and the last of the man's underlings. They had been killed by a trap when they failed to solve the puzzle in their private room during the last part of the dungeon. There were twenty-four of them at the start, if not counting sunrise. So they only need six more to reach the required number to form a guild. Easily solved, the man had said. He had more members that would follow his lead to join. It was only because they had not passed their advanced class test that they had not joined this expedition. But from his messaging with the rest of his members, all of them had managed to pass at this moment. Not that it mattered, Jack would accept them even if they were still basic class as long as the man trusted them. There were also more of Jeannie's friends. Some Jack had met, some were unfamiliar to him. She was currently in the process of recruiting them via messages. The most worthless was John. The people who agreed to join on his behalf were only Weird Trap and Pointy Tip. The guy had no other friends, or at least no other friends that were willing to follow him. Talk about a social. So, let us go back and register the guild right away, Jeannie said. Now. Jack asked. Yeah, we all have the town return scrolls, right? Why wait? She asked. Now who is being hasty? You are getting influenced by him too much, John said to her while pointing at Jack. Let's spend the night here first. We will say goodbye to the Duke and the rest before we leave. Otherwise, it will be rude if we just disappear without a word. You are right. Okay, let's have a pre-celebration of the forming of our guild. Jeannie said. Good idea. Bowler. Go to the army supply station and buy some wine to celebrate, John said. Why me? Bowler protested. Jack followed them back to the bonfire to do a second round of partying. He was actually not so into the idea of leaving immediately, because he was still expecting to exploit the massive experience gains from using the vanguard troops of the army. He still had one and a half million EXP points to feed his greedy new inherent skill, Lightning God Blessing after all. But he understood the expression of striking while it's hot. 
Everyone was so fired up to establish this guild. He was not going to kill the mood, so he followed along. Peniel did say he knew a way to level up fast, he would just depend on her method later after the guild's business was done. The next morning, they did just as they planned. They came to Duke Alfredo and Commander Quintus to let them know of their leavings. Since the expedition was completed, the Duke had no problem letting them leave as well. Jack went and said his goodbye to Prince Alonso as well. The Prince asked Jack to come to visit him again when he was back in the capital. Jack promised that he would. Regarding the quest of escorting Prince Alonso, he surmised that the quest's objective should have been achieved now that Prince Therabas Lackey, Ronnie, had been taken care of. The prince should be safe with the duke on their way home. Once everyone was ready, they took out the town return scroll at the same time and activated it. They appeared one by one on the teleport portal of their wrath. Ah, we are finally back. Bowler announced. Chapter 391, Registering the Guild Let's meet up with the others first before we go to the Guild's Association to register our guild, Jeannie said. Guild's Association was another neutral faction that dealt with most everything pertaining to guilds. It is where a newly formed guild go when they wanted to establish their guilds formally in this world. Also, the place where they could find postings about general guild quests. There were also counters inside that sold items that were useful only to a guild. Do you know where this guild's association is located? Jack asked. I do, Jeannie said. But we go to Raven's Den first, that's where everyone else is waiting. The eight of them, no, nine, as Peniel did not bother to hide any more, went in the direction of the capital's number one tavern. Peniel nested lazily on Jack's head as they walked. Can't you fly on your own? Jack protested. Teehee, it felt cozier this way, she replied. On their way, the eight of them did regular inspect on other players they passed by, and they felt extremely good about themselves. The reason was that most of the mass in the capital was still at level 24, with the minority being at level 25 or 23. Their group, on the other hand, were all at level 29 with the exception of Jack at level 28. Most of the mass was unaware of their group's level as they could not see Jack's group's levels, but there are several who had high-level inspect who managed to scan them, these people's eyes turned wide when their inspect came through. Bowler was especially pleased about all this. He even took the initiative to walk in the front with his chin lifted high, fully exhibiting his pride. Everyone was stupefied by his act the fellow could be said as the least skilled amongst those who had survived the Temple of Divine Squall's dungeon. Jack even wondered how the heck he had managed to survive while the others failed. His luck might be as potent as Jack's. When they entered Raven's Den, they met with all the ones that had joined them in the expedition, added with some new faces who were Jeannie's other friends and the man's remaining underlings. What's that on your head? Sweet Talk who was now a warrior, asked. Oh, how rude. It should be a who instead of a what, Peniel complained. It talks. Sweet talk said with a gasp. Damn right I talk, miss. Peniel flew down from Jack's head and approached sweet talk. My name is Peniel. You better make sure to remember that. This goes for all of you as well. All those apart from Jack's group of eight were in fascination as they stared at the little fairy in her bossy attitude. Yes, anyone who did not give Peniel the respect she deserves will have to face me. John announced. Jack turned to him and said, Stop sucking up to her. She will not give you any more knowledge just because of that. Everyone started to crowd around the little fairy and started to make conversation with her. Jeannie made a count on those presents in the meantime. They numbered 54 people. We are more than enough to fulfill the minimum member qualification. Jeannie said with a smile. All right, no point to delay then. Let's head to the Guild's Association, Jack suggested. Before Jeannie could reply, someone came over. Sister Jeannie. I was worried sick about you. Are you all right? Did that storm wind bully you? Jack had known the owner of that annoying voice before he turned to the guy. 
Swell Going was bombarding Genie with questions and displays of concern. As one of the leaders of the coming guild, can I employ my executive power to reject an applicant? Jack asked Genie. Swell Going who heard it, shot back fiercely, who would want to join a guild you lead? If not for Sister Genie here, no one would have been interested. Then he turned to Genie and said, Sister Genie, why do you even want to form a guild with this questionable character? If you want to be in a guild, there are plenty of top guilds that we can try to apply to. I have many friends in those guilds and they will be more than willing to put in good words for me to their top brass. Do not get cheated by someone with nefarious intention. Jack said to Genie, you see? He has no interest to join. Let's just ditch him and be on our way. Genie gave Swell going a serious look and asked, I am going to start our own guild with them. This matter is a done deal. Do you want to follow me or not? If Sister Genie is in, of course, I won't be anywhere else. You can count on me. Swell going replied. Jack rolled his eyes at him and said, Tisk, the guild is not even formed and already a thorn inside. You are the thorn. Swell going retorted. Do you want me to kick your ass again? Jack threatened. Try it. This is a safe zone, I will place a report to the authority and have you arrested. Dream on. I am a baron now, a small assault like that won't be considered as an offense, Jack said with a ridiculing tone as he showed off his nobility faction badge. Could you two stop acting like ten-year-old kids? Genie scolded the two. Now be quiet and follow. I don't want a word from the two of you anymore. Everyone started walking out of the tavern following Genie. Jack and Swell Going didn't say anything more to each other after the scolding, but Jack nudged at Swell Going when he passed by, causing him to almost double over. He stared at Jack in anger, but Jack ignored it as he dared him to push back. Swell Going didn't take the bait as he knew Jack's strength stat was way over his. Trinity Dawn who saw the two could only shake her head. Maybe she should rethink the decision of joining this guild? She thought. The building of the guild's association had a unique design with its center part going up high, like a sword that pierced the sky. Its total size appeared to be even larger than the Adventurers and Hunters Association which Jack considered was a pretty massive building complex already. When they entered, there were many players on the move around the hall. All of them had guild tags on their names. Crowd of Sins, White Scarfs, Death Associates, and the likes. Jeannie went and asked the receptionist about where to register for a guild and its process while the rest waited by the side. Storm Wind. Jack heard someone calling him. He turned and saw Blue Days and Dash Runner from White Scarfs. Hey. The Beauty and the Shorta from White Scarfs, how you doing? Jack greeted. Who the hell do you call a shorty? Dash Runner complained. Just joking, Jack chuckled. How goes your guild? How is Silverwing? Hope everything is fine. Everything just going okay, Blue Days replied. Really? You didn't get any problem from the coalition? Jack asked. They have been quiet for a while already, ever since your fight that time. So things have actually been peaceful around here. You don't know this? Have you been away? Rumors said that someone saw you leaving with that army three weeks ago. Was that true? Our leader had tried to message you but he said you didn't give him a clear answer. Silverwing did send him several messages, but Jack simply replied to him that he was on a quest outside of town. As a matter of fact, yes, I was indeed with that army, Jack replied. Really? Where had you gone to? The news was that the army went rather far away from the capital. Did you visit another city? How was it? Maybe we can talk about it another time. About the coalition, it was a bit odd. Shouldn't have taken them so long to recover, right? Why are there no movements? Not sure. Words are they are focusing their effort elsewhere. Rumors are they have a pretty big guild quest that required long and complete attention. Perhaps after their loss last time, they could no longer divert their attentions. Jack gave the matter a thought. 
should he change into unrivaled arcaner to gather some intelligence? But he dismissed it, he had many other things to do at the moment. No time to involve himself with the coalition. As long as they didn't cause him trouble, he would leave them alone as well. Everyone was entitled to doing quests. If they were focusing on their quests without causing a problem to others, then to Jack, that was the right way of gaming. How about we go to our base and have a talk? Blue Days offered. Our leader will be eager to have a chat with you. You just want to find out about the information of the outside world, right? Jack asked. But sorry. I'm truly busy right now. Busy? Come to think of it. Why are you here? Don't tell me. That's right. We are here to register a guild. Jack declared with a wide grin. Chapter 392, Guild Name All of you. Blue Days looked at the crowd that was with Jack. They looked like a bunch of ragtag, especially since the man's group was at the forefront. Why bother? Just join our guild, Dash Runner said. Save you the hassle. Our guild is developing fast. Your future will be bright if you join us. Thank you for the offer, but I have a good feeling about this group. We will make it, Jack said. I wish you luck then, Blue Days said. Please spare some time to visit us. I will let our leader knows of your return and about you forming your guild. All right, once I am free, I will pay him a visit, Jack promised. Jeannie came back at the time and told them about what she had learned. They then went together to the counter where they could make the registration. Not far away, a player came to another who was seemingly hiding behind a pillar. What do you learn? This hiding person was Earmouth. He had recognized Jack from a distance and sent two of his people closer to eavesdrop on Jack's group. One was still following them, while the other came back to report. Earmouth did not dare to go near them himself as he was afraid that Jack will notice him. He said he will be forming a guild. A guild. Earmouth was startled. But then again, what else is their purpose coming to this place if not that? He had to let Scarface and Red Death knew of this. That guy was already a problem alone. If his guild could prosper, it would cause them more headaches in the future. On the guild's association counter, the three supposed leaders, Jack, John, and Jeannie were listening to the staff's explanation, while the rest were standing at the back. Unbeknownst to them, their position had instead created a fence that prevented Earmouth's spy to approach. The spy was grumbling in his mind. Didn't they know they do not need these many persons to register? One needed at least 30 members to form a guild but it was not necessary to have all of them presented here. They simply needed those 30 to be on standby to receive an invitation message and simply click accept. Jack and the rest actually knew about this, but everyone still chose to come as they were all rather looking forward to forming this guild. So, the last thing I need now was a 20 gold fee in the name of your guild, the staff at the counter told Jack, Jeannie, and John. 20? Wasn't it 10 the last time? Jack protested. Twenty is the new fee, the staff informed nonchalantly. Guess there is also inflation in this world, John commented. That's right, you should not treat the price in the shops as fixed. Things might get more expensive now that more of you outworlders appeared and increased the acquisition of coins from the wilderness, Peniel explained. I don't like this. It reminded me of the headache from trying to follow our real world's finance, Jack complained. It is what it is, John said. Now go ahead and pay. The hell, why is it me? Aren't we supposed to share this between the three of us? You are the wealthiest here. Don't lie, Peniel told me how many gold coins you have. You did. Jack asked Peniel. I didn't, Peniel replied. Jack rolled his eyes at John and grumbled, You lying son of a b asterisk tch. But I still know you are the wealthiest, John said. Come on, it was just gold coins. Here, I will give ten gold coins, Jeannie took the initiative to stop the discourse. Jack held her hands. It's okay, Jack said, 
then took out twenty gold coins and gave them to the counter staff. Jeannie tried to insist, I'm fine really. As you said, this is three of us together. It won't be right if you fork out all of the registration fees. Here, take my coins. Jack waved him away. Don't worry about it. This amount is nothing to me. John, on the other hand, was just wearing a smug smile without any bad feeling at all. Now, all that left is the guild name. What will it be? The staff asked. The three of them were silent for a long time. That's right, they haven't talked about a name. They looked at each other and had wry smiles. They had been so passionate about this that they forgot to think up a name. It's just a name, just make one up, John said. Me? Jack asked. I have no idea. I leave the naming to you, Jeannie said. Yeah, you are the one that paid the registration fee, so you have the right to decide the name, John added. More like you didn't want the bother to think one up, Jack gave John a side eye. Jack gave the matter a brief thought, he then asked the staff, how do I input the name? Just type it here, the staff replied as something like a keyboard panel appeared on the desk's surface. Jack then went ahead and typed the name. After he was done, the staff looked at it for a bit, pressed something, and then said, All right. Now your guild, number one legends, is formally registered. Wait, wait, wait. Both John and Jeannie yelled out, then asked the counter staff, What's the guild's name again? Number one legends, Jack was the one who answered them. What kind of name is that? Jeannie uttered. Yeah, no class at all. John added, then to the staff he asked, can we change the name? Jack was speechless, what was that about them saying he had the right to decide the guild's name? You can change the name, since I have not input it into the main system. But still, I will need to charge you three gold coins for the change. Do you confirm to change? Three gold coins? Why so expensive just for a simple change? John complained, he then turned to Jack. Hey, if you want to change, you pay for it. I'm not spending more coins, Jack said before the guy asked. I will pay, Jeannie said and handed the coins. All right. Please re-input the name again. The keyboard panel appeared again. I'll do it, John took initiative now. He did some typing then uttered, done. Before the staff press anything, Jeannie asked first. What was written there? The staff read the words out, he typed, extreme undying reaching after heaven. That's even worse. Jeannie called out. Yeah, it's too long, Jack commented. You should shorten it. People will have a problem calling our guild's name if it's too long. That's not the problem. Jeannie uttered, then to the staff she said, please cancel that. You've not yet pressed enter, right? I don't need to pay another three gold coins, do I? The staff sighed, you don't need to. Okay, I've erased it. Please, put the correct one this time. As Jeannie was about to type. John said, perhaps you should tell us first the name you want to put in. Jeannie looked at them and said, Everlasting Rose. What the hell, no. For heaven's sake, stop. Both Jack and John reacted almost the same despite uttering different objection words. Jack added, Sister, that is too feminine. I can guarantee you if you use that name, we are going to lose almost half of our members immediately. The man there is surely not gonna stay inside a guild with such a name. Then what do you suggest? Jeannie asked, she was glum. Jack thought for a bit before saying, try to think of the first thing that comes into your mind. The hell? Are you going to try that stupid trick by combining three words that came into each of our minds again? John asked. It worked the last time, didn't it? Jack countered. You people are entertaining, Peniel commented with a chuckle as she perched on top of Jack's head. Hey. If you not gonna help, please don't ridicule, Jack told her. What's the matter, why take so long? 
Bowler came by and asked. Nothing. Please wait over there. We are discussing something, John told him. Bowler gave him an irritated look but he still went away. Why chased him away? Perhaps he can give a good idea for a name, Jack said. I seriously doubt that, John said. And too many opinions and ideas will just end up muddle things up. No, we three have to decide by ourselves. Ahem, they heard the staff made a sound and said, Can you people hurry up, please? I still have other things to do. John thought for a bit before finally saying, All right, let's try using your stupid trick. Each of us picks one word from the name we have given, then we combine them and see. I go first, heaven. Um, legends. Jack said. Everlasting then, Jeannie uttered. If I said Rose, you guys will say it's too feminine again. After hearing them, John said, Everlasting heavenly legends. Hum. I guess it's acceptable. It's cool. Go for it. Jack exclaimed. Chapter 393, Guild Headquarter. I don't know, sounds too arrogant, Jeannie said. Then we have to make our guild the best there is, so we can live up to its arrogant name, John said. Are you trying to put pressure on us to have us aim for the top as to how you like it even before we begin? Jeannie asked. Pressure is good. It helps us grow. I concur with this name, Jack expressed his support to the name again. Jeannie finally relented, okay, fine. Let me do the honor, John typed in the name. The staff read out the name, Everlasting Heavenly Legends. Is this confirmed already? No one going to ask for a change anymore, right? When he saw no objection from the three, he said. All right then. As of this moment, Everlasting Heavenly Legends is established. You will need 30 members to join within a day's time to formalize the guild. Also, who will be the main leader among the three of you? Main leader? Can't we three be leaders? Jack asked. I can make the other two CO leaders, which is also the limit for a beginning guild, but I still need one as the main. Please decide. Then make Jeannie the main leader, Jack told the staff without hesitation. Me? Are you sure? Jeannie was surprised. Yet. Yeah. You will be the main face of our guild, right? You will be the one out there to lead. John and I are supports with his planning and my fighting skill. I see, all right. I accept, Jeannie said. Okay, I will formalize it, the staff said. There will be perks and powers available to leader and CO leaders upon the management of the guild, but you will have to learn of them by yourself. Don't worry, I will guide them, Peniel chimed in. The staff didn't comment, whether these people did well or not managing their guild was not his concern. At that moment Jack, John and Jeannie heard a notification voice that their guild had been established, and that they could check and manage them via the guild interface inside their status window. The three went and checked it without delay. There was a new page labeled as Guild. Guild name, Everlasting Heavenly Legends. Guild level, 1, Reputation, 0 slash 100 comma 000. Guild members, 3 slash 500, Note, 30 members required before the time limit expired. Time limit, 23 hours 59 minutes. Gold coin, 0. Members. Main leader, Genie, Knight, level 29. CO leader, Stormwind, Warrior, level 28. CO leader, St. John, Mage, level 29. There were some tabs below the guild page invite, quest, and some that were still blank. They immediately went to work and sent out invites to each of their respective friends. Flame and the others soon received their invites and accepted accordingly. When Jack saw how John was relaxing he said, I know you have two friends who joined, but it's not like you don't know any of the rest. Help to send the invites as well. Out of the people here, only you two, Tip, and Trap who were in my friend list, John replied. 
They could only invite people who were on their friend list to join the guild. Why didn't you add them to your friend list? Jack asked. I have, they rejected, John answered. You really need to work on that attitude of yours, Jack commented. For the man's underlings, Jack promoted the man to an officer. There were five ranks below the rank of leader and CO leaders, which were counselor, officer, veteran, associate, and trainee. Every new recruit got the status of trainee. Peniel informed him the lowest rank who could initiate an invite on behalf of the guild was the rank of officer. But an invite by an officer still needed to be confirmed by the leaders, which Jack confirmed after the man sent the invites. This way, he did not have to put all of the man's underlings into his friend list. In their current guild level, they could only elect a limit of four counselors and ten officers. Peniel informed that these numbers would increase once their guild level increased. Guild level increased by gaining sufficient reputation by performing guild quests, which could be picked up from the Hall of Quests within this guild's association. Peniel also advised there might be special guild quests that were received via special circumstances, such a quest depended on fortunate encounters. So the Hall of Quests was not the only source of guild quests. If a guild's reputation was high enough, a native might even approach them to issue a guild quest. Or if someone with high enough influence skill was within the guild, such a circumstance could also occur. Hearing that, Jack thought that he should develop more relationships with the nobles to increase his influence skill. With all the invites completed, the guild now had a total of 54 members and was now an official guild in this world. They all then went to the Hall of Quests to pick up some quests to start building up their guild's reputation. Only one person was needed to apply for a quest, but everyone went over to check on the quests. Applied quest would appear inside the quest tab of each member's guild page. Any members could then perform or complete the quests by fulfilling the tasks instructed by the quests. There were a large number of quests in the Hall of Quests. Many of the quests required menial tasks such as cleaning monsters in an area, or mining for materials and submitting them, or gathering specific monsters' parts. A total of ten such quests could be picked up at a time, but the reputation points given were trivial. There were some that gave out decent reputation points but such quest fell under exclusive quest, which had a more difficult task with a time limit, and one guild could only accept one such quest at a time. Also, failure to fulfill the task within the time limit would instead reduce the guild's reputation points. They could not yet pick up such a quest yet because the requirement of applying for the quest was to have at least the same amount of reputation points as the penalty. So, a beginner guild could not abuse the fact that they still had no reputation points to lose by trying their luck on such exclusive guild quests. As the others were studying the available guild quests, Jack said to John and Jeannie, let's go purchase land to build our guild base. I heard there will be additional functions once we have a base. Ain't that right, Peniel? That is right, but rather than waste your time to get a guild base, I have a better proposition, Peniel answered. But first, I have to ask, do you really have the confidence to raid that bandit outpost? What Peniel referred to was the bandit outpost that they had encountered after Jack's duel with Red Death. Jack had mentioned to her once during the expedition that he planned to take on the outpost once they returned. Peniel had pointed out at the time that he must be kidding, but Jack said that he had a method that might work. He did not elaborate on what that method was though. Bandit outpost? What that got to do with our guild base? Jack asked. Bandit outpost. John was intrigued, he gestured for everyone to move with him to a quiet corner before asking Peniel to continue. Because the first guild that managed to raid a bandit outpost in a region, would have the option to reconstruct it into a guild headquarter. Guild headquarter? Will it give better benefits than a guild base? John asked. Oh, mister. Much more than you can expect, Peniel replied. A guild headquarter could be said the pinnacle which every guild could strive for. Only by having a guild headquarter can a guild truly start to pursue its fullest potential. Another thing was, one region could only support one guild headquarter, if another guild wishes to build one, 
they had to either raid a bandit outpost in another region or attack the current guild headquarter. So, while no guild was still aware of this yet, you could use this chance to seize the region closest to this capital. But, that of course, if you can really take on that outpost. Do you really have the confidence? In theory, should be possible, Jack replied. But I need to do some preparation first. How long? John asked. Around two days maybe, something I need to check and make sure first, Jack answered. Anything we can do to help? Jeannie asked. Yeah, describe your plan to me, John said. It's not something that any of you can help with. If it works, there is no need for a strategy, Jack replied. Well, if you say so. I will leave that to you then, John said. There is really nothing we can help with. Jeannie asked, her tone showed her worry. Don't worry about that outpost, leave that to me. Jack said confidently. You guys worked with these people on the guild quests. I will leave these guild quests to you all. Three days from now if you people want to follow me to take on that bandit outpost, you are welcomed. I will let you know then of the time. Chapter 394, Inflation Are you leaving now? John asked. Yeah, I need to go outside of town to find out about these things I said that need checking. It's better if I do this as soon as possible, Jack replied. Can you leave Peniel with me? There is much I want to ask about this guild business, John said. Well, I don't mind if it's only a day or two, Jack said. I'm not something that can be left behind, Mr. Peniel said as he flicked Jack's nose. I'm so linked to you. I can't leave your side too far. If you move too far away, I will simply get pulled away in whatever direction you are moving. If there is an obstacle, I will simply phase out before getting teleported directly to your side after a certain amount of time. Oh, sorry then. You heard her, Jack said to John. How about this, let's meet again later tonight at Ellie's restaurant. I will book two adjacent VIP rooms, you can stay in one of the rooms with Peniel discussing whatever you need to discuss. I will be in the other room with Silverwing. He had received Silverwing's message again not long after Blue Days left. He had agreed to meet later to have a chat. That's fine also. See you later then, John said. Earmouth's spy was dismayed as he watched the trio from a distance. He had been pretending to watch the list of quests as he eavesdropped on their conversation, but then they suddenly moved to a secluded corner. If he followed, they were sure to get suspicious. The last thing he had heard was something about a bandit outpost and guild base. He stayed there and silently watched. After some time had passed, one of the three, Stormwind, their guild's number one nemesis, split away and went to the exit. The other two came back and talked with their other members as they chose on the guild quests to take on. Seeing there was nothing he could learn more, he returned to Earmouth and reported everything he had heard. Everlasting Heavenly Legends? Such an absurd and pompous name, Earmouth commented. He reviewed all that his spy had reported. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary of a budding guild, but that bandit outpost thing mentioned by that small flying creature sounded important. Where did they find that creature anyway? Was that a pet? But why would the discussion of a guild base turn to bandit outpost? After compiling everything he had learned, he wrote a message and sent them to Scarface. Out of a hunch, he also sent a message to one of their people who was in charge of gathering information from the library. He asked them to pay attention in case they found any information pertaining to the bandit outpost. Before Jack left the capital, he went to restock on all the things he had lost during his expedition. Recovery potions, magic stones, lockpicks, disarm tools, and some magic scrolls. What he found out was the inflation had happened everywhere. The basic healing potion that was only 60 copper was now 1 silver and 20 copper coins. Lockpicks were now 30 copper coins each. The most ridiculous increase was magic scrolls, the arcane turbulence was now 2 gold coins, while the fireball was 5 gold coins. 
He still did not find any chain lightning scroll again, but he would expect the price of that scroll to go up to 10 gold coins if compared with the others. The town return scroll on the other hand did not increase as much, at 20 silver coins, only double from the original. He suspected these magic scrolls were adjusted by the system so as to not getting abused in their usage. Their cheap early prices were to help players get by as they were getting used to this world. A pity, if he had known, he would have stocked up more before the price increased. Peniel said he had no idea about such inflation, this was all random according to her so she had no way of knowing such events. Peniel also advised him to not get too dependent on those scrolls. Their effectiveness would decrease the more outworlders leveled up. After all, the scrolls mostly contained standard spells at the lowest level. The highest level of the spell in a scroll Jack had seen was at level 3, while if players had learned the spells, they could level them up to level 20. So the scrolls were only good for low-level players. But following the inflation, new things popped up in the store, such as the healing potion which they had bought from the army supply station. He also glanced at the equipment store and saw that many level 25 weapons and armors were on display as well, still only common grade though. After finished restocking, he went to the Hunters Association to cash in all his trophy loots he had collected during the expedition and submit his completed hunting quests. Even with all those hefty trophy loots, he still lost three gold coins after deducting the coins he spent for restockings, all due to the price inflation. He also received 381 Hunter points for it. Although these points were more than he usually received in one hunting trip due to all the quests were from high difficulty quests, but he had also only taken one hunting trip in the past three weeks, meaning his hunter points were more likely behind others already. Out of curiosity, he checked on the exclusive exchange item list. He was thinking to take that camouflage tent if it was still available. Turned out all the items in that exclusive list had been taken already by others. At this rate, others would more likely get to the gold rank hunter before him. He had gone ahead of others in level but fell behind in hunter points. Couldn't help it, Jack thought. You gain something, you likely lose something as well. Everyone had the same amount of time, he could only spend them at one thing at a time. The important thing was to spend the time efficiently. Hence he didn't lament too much about his hunting points falling behind, he picked up another ten hunting quests. He didn't plan another efficient hunting route this time, however. The ones he picked were monsters that were around the area where the bandit outpost was located. He had asked Peniel what monster in Silver Hall that were in that region. After finished picking up the hunting quests, he went over to the Adventurers Association next door. He didn't take any job from there, but any quest not associated with other faction quests could still be reported. So he went and reported the completed chain quest, Duchess Cure, and the Investigate the Strange Disease quest in Theswell. He didn't receive any coins nor experience for those as those rewards had already been granted when those quests were completed, but he received adventurers' points for them. The chain quest gave an especially abundance of points for being multiple quest lines and also for being of high grade, although it was not an actual SSS grade as Peniel mentioned it was not a low grade as well. He received 6238 adventurer points from those two quests. He checked on his badge after receiving those points. VIP Silver Adventurer Badge, Adventurer Points, 7854, Available Points, 6774. He needed 10,000 points to become a gold rank adventurer. Looking at his current points, he might still have the chance to become a gold rank first before others. He also checked on the Silver Hall's exclusive exchange list. All the remaining exclusive items had also been taken by others. The competition was truly tough, he thought. After finishing with those two neutral factions, he finally headed out of the city. He summoned his steed and went directly to the area where the bandit outpost was at. The density of monsters in the vicinity of the capital was not as crowded as the faraway regions he had seen during the expedition, also their levels were lower, hence his steed had no problem avoiding them during his travel. 
He arrived in the area where the outpost was located before long, but he didn't go near it. He went around searching for the thing he was looking for while killing the monsters that were on his hunting quest list. He spent the entire afternoon roaming around the place until sunset before he returned to the capital. He did not complete all his hunting quests on this trip. The quests were only secondary, he had another objective on that trip. During the time he spent in the wilderness, he also received a message from William of Wellington, congratulating him on establishing his guild. Word travels fast, he thought. He arrived in Ellie's restaurant a bit later than his appointment time with Silverwing. He had contacted Ellie this morning about his return and requested the VIP rooms. He went immediately upstairs. Before that though, he went to the next room where John and Jeannie were at. He left Peniel with them before he met with Silverwing. Blue Days and Sin Reaper were also in the room with him. Silverwing started their conversation by congratulating him for have formed a guild. He hoped that their two guilds could become allies and would benefit each other in the future. After he expressed courtesy, he went into the main topic. He was very interested in the outside world. Even until now, no guild had managed to send their teams to a different city by normal means. They had found out about the caravan function and had some of their people worked on their haggling skills to be accepted into the trade association. However, only the member of the association could use the caravan function and the towns available to them were small or medium-sized ones which they were not allowed to use the zone portal unless they were part of Themisphere Kingdom. To get to the large-sized city where they could use the zone portal to teleport, they needed to reach a certain rank within the trade association, and the points required were large and required a long amount of time and effort to accrue. Chapter 395, Upgrading Ellie's Restaurant Jack told him about their experience as Silverwing and his retinues listened with fascination. He didn't tell them about the experience gathering trick by utilizing NPCs though, but even if he did, there was nothing they could do. It was not like there was a way for them to gain command of an army even if they wanted to. They did express interest in how he managed to join the Kingdom faction though, which allowed him to go on that expedition. He simply said that he had done a quest for a duke which impressed him enough that he had received an invite to join the kingdom faction. Hearing that, Silverwing secretly sent messages to his questing teams to search for all quests pertaining to nobles and for them to perform those quests with merit. Jack also mentioned meeting another country's force which turned out to be a nation of orcs. He did not mention the other five countries though, as he had not seen those other races himself. He had only heard them from Peniel, so he kept that to himself. He also mentioned the existence of a player organization called World Maker which worked together with an NPC force called Cult of Phobos. He asked them to be wary of this organization and to give him the information if they ever met such a guild. Silverwing promised to do so. Jack didn't spend too long a time chatting with Silverwing, he excused himself once he thought was appropriate. Before he left, Silverwing asked another question, what is your level now? 28, Jack replied honestly. The three gasped. They were at level 25 and they had just gotten to that level not long ago, and they knew for a fact that most of the other players were still at level 24. What if I tell them the rest of the surviving expedition members were level 29? He thought. Though it would be entertaining to see their reactions, Jack decided against it. He left the room. After he left the room, he did not immediately go to the room next door that housed John and Jeannie. Instead, he went to another VIP room not far away. The reason was because he had gotten a message from Ellie about a guest. He went into the room and uttered, Hey uh. How are you doing, just Dylan? Dylan who heard him said, Can you please drop that? It's very childish. You know perfectly what I meant when I asked you to just call my name by Dylan. And then to Ellie, he said, what is he doing here anyway? Hey, hey, is that how you talk about your employer? And aren't you still a kid? What's wrong with being childish with you? Jack said and took a seat beside Ellie. There were three drinks on the table and three plates of peanuts as snacks for the three of them. You are the only kid here. And what employer? 
Aren't you just a middleman? Dylan replied with a scoff. Jack had told Ellie to keep his ownership of this restaurant a secret. All right, all right. Let's stop ridiculing each other. So, you brought the rosemary we asked for? Jack asked. He did, Ellie answered. How many? Enough to make around thirty dishes. So few. Few my ass. Diane spat out after hearing Jack's comment. Do you know how difficult it is to find that ingredient? I've roamed through two towns and only managed to find one at a corner shop. It only has a limited stock. I'm charging the maximum price here for that ingredient. Price is no problem. How soon can you get another batch? Jack asked. Maybe another week. The shop owner did say that he will try to procure a larger amount after I promise to buy them all again. It will probably be faster if I don't have to use a caravan and can teleport directly there using Zone Portal, but the promise of that duke doesn't come through. No invitation for me to join the Kingdom faction is yet to appear. No need to complain. He only said that he will try his best, he did not exactly give you his promise. Why are you defending him? Are you his good friend? As a matter of fact, I am. Jack replied with a grin, remembering when the Duke clapped his shoulder and expressed his appreciation. Stop boasting. Dylan said, then to Ellie he said, for this second rosemary batch, I want front payment. No problem, Jack said. Why are you the one answering? I ain't talking to you, Dylan replied curtly. No problem, Ellie answered. Dylan looked back and forth between Jack and Ellie, trying to figure out their relationship. Ellie added, since you have proven to be such a good procurer, I have several other ingredients that I needed. Here is the list. If you can get them, I don't mind paying for the maximum price as well. She then turned to Jack and asked, what do you think? I think that is a good arrangement, Jack replied. Dylan looked back and forth again between the two of them. He then decided to not think too much about it. Matters of the employer were not his business. All he needed was to procure the requested supplies. Kept the business strictly professional. He glanced at the list given by Ellie. There were a lot of ingredients inside, considering the restaurant's booming business, they must have afforded lots of unconventional recipes that needed many rare ingredients. He had been eating the peanuts while conversing, he now found out that his plate was empty. Out of the three, only Jack did not touch his plate. Dylan pointed at Jack's plate, do you mind? Go nuts, Jack said. Dylan chuckled, ha, that's a good one. Then he took the peanuts on Jack's plate and continued munching while reading Ellie's list. When his eyes arrived at one of the ingredients in the list, he couldn't help but blurt out, small poison gland. What's a restaurant needed this ingredient for? To poison a customer? Ellie simply shrugged and said, it's something a friend of mine asked for. By friend, of course, she meant Jack, who had sent him the request beforehand. He needed that ingredient to give to Pointy Tip to create the poison salve. The large poison gland that he gave Tip could only produce 20 doses. He would need to source the ingredient if he needed a stable supply. Dylan decided not to pry. As he thought before, kept it professional. He stored the list as Ellie handed the gold coins for him. After receiving the front payment, he stood up and headed for the door. Leaving already? No chat with your old pal? Jack asked. What old pal? I just met you twice including now, Dylan then looked at Ellie and said, I will let you know once I got the ingredients. After he went out the door, Ellie said to Jack, You really enjoy teasing that boy, don't you? Despite his all serious business manner, he is a fun kid, Jack replied. How long do you need to cook all that 30 dishes of well done steak? What's the hurry? If I don't have to cook for other customers' orders, I can cook them all within one day. Do you want to introduce this dish to the public immediately? Oh, they are not for selling. I want all those 30 dishes for myself, you can just deduct the cost from my share of profits, 
Jack replied. The well done stake gave a boost of 20% for EXP received within 6 hours. He needed it as he had to generate lots of EXP to satisfy the gluttonous lightning god blessing. Otherwise, he would not be able to level up at all. All right, but I can only cook during my off time if it is not for the customer. Might need several days for all 30 dishes. Don't worry, you won't be cooking for customers tomorrow. Why is that? Ellie was puzzled by Jack's statement. Jack gave him a wide grin before saying, We are going to upgrade the restaurant. After informing Ellie of his intention, he let her went to inform the employees about the coming upgrade. Considering the previous upgrade, it should take at least one day for the process. They would start the upgrade process once the restaurant closed, which was in half an hour time more. He decided to go to the room which John and Jeannie were at, as he waited for the restaurant to close. When he entered, he saw that the two were still discussing heatedly with Peniel. Since the guild's success would be tied to Jack's success as well, Peniel didn't have reservations to keep information from the two. The two didn't waste the chance as they asked everything they could think of. Seeing the three were so focused, Jack didn't disturb them and just sat at the corner and watched them. He soon lost interest as he was always not that into such technical stuff. He would leave much of the guild business to the two. A waiter soon came and informed them that the restaurant was closing. Jack was grinning as the two reluctantly stopped their questionings. He told them there would be more opportunities later, it's not like Peniel was going anywhere. Once they left, Jack went to the cashier and took away his profits. Three weeks had passed since he last took his profits, hence it had accumulated. Even after deducting Dylan's payment, he still received 59 gold coins. He had a total of 398 gold coins in his bag. He then activated the restaurant's upgrade interface. Time to upgrade the restaurant. Chapter 396, Becoming Viscount Once he paid the 150 gold coins fee, the upgrade system was activated. A notification was heard inside the restaurant that renovation would start in five minutes and would take two days to complete. Two days. So, higher upgrade requires a longer time to complete, Jack pondered. Once the five minutes was up, the entire restaurant was covered by the same opaque cloth that appeared the last time he upgraded Amy's bakery. Now, all he needed to do was wait. He gave some gold coins to Ellie for her to hire extra workers or for any other things that might be needed once the restaurant was done renovating, just in case if he was not available. He then took a rest in Amy's bakery. The girl bombarded her with questions once he showed up. He had been absent for three weeks after all. Entertaining the girl, he told her about his adventure during the expedition. He omitted the part about the scary encounter with the God of Fear though lest she would just worry about him. He told the girl and her mother, much to their joy, that he would upgrade the bakery tomorrow morning. He didn't do it immediately tonight as he wanted to spend a good night's rest in his room first. He also took the profit that had been saved up in the bakery since he went on the expedition. The total amount was 41 gold coins. The next morning, he was admiring the two buildings side by side being covered by opaque cloth. His wallet had taken a deep dip, but he didn't mind. He believed the eventual return was worth these investments. Before he went out to do his survey around the bandit outpost again, he took the time going to the noble district. He visited the Magic Association shop and saw that the inflation had also affected this store. The disruptive bomb was now three gold coins each. He still had a number of the bombs in his storage so he did not buy any extra. He might need the coins for something else later. But he bought one reset potion which now cost five gold coins. He went to Commander Quintus Tower afterward. An officer was manning the commander's desk. He reported his two kingdom factions quests, expedition to Temple of Divine Squall and escorting Prince Alonso. When he gave his Themisphere Nobility faction badge for the officer to check, the officer frowned at him and asked, Where are the Prince and the Duke? Oh. They are safe and are on their way back as we speak, Jack answered. 
he could roughly predict what's going to happen next. After the officer checked the quest report within the batch, Jack received some coins and experiences for them, as for the merit points, he received a standard reward of 150 merit points for the expedition quest and 100 merit points for the escorting quest. As for the variables. Obtain the All Curse Expulsion Potion, 500 merit points. Assist in repelling invading force during the expedition, 200 merit points. Complete the objective of the expedition in less than one month, 300 merit points. Leaving the expedition before its return to the capital, deduct 100 merit points. Save the prince during precarious situation, 600 merit points. Keep the prince safe during the latter half of the war with invading force, 100 points. Using the prince as bait during the war with invading force, deduct 100 points. Not by the prince's side most of the time, deduct 100 merit points. Leaving the prince before his return to the capital, deduct 300 merit points. A multitude of curse words was flashing in Jack's mind. But after a deep breath and a calm consideration, he did acknowledge that he was not the ideal bodyguard model. He should act like Bailey at least to be an acceptable standard of a bodyguard. So, it was correct to say that he did not perform well for the escorting Prince Alonzo quest. His only solace was that he had managed to save the Prince from certain death. Otherwise, this quest would have been totally minus points for him. The officer returned his badge, Jack checked and saw that his total merit points were 1,870 points. He was 130 points left from becoming Viscount. Just a little bit more, he lamented. He had no time for doing a faction quest now, he still had many things he needed to take care of. But out of curiosity, he asked the officer if there were any nobility faction quests available. The officer informed him there were three. Typical F asterisk re, Jack cursed in his mind. When he was looking for one, there was none. Now that he had no time to do the quest, there were even three of them available. The officer showed him the quests. He just browsed through them absent-mindedly as he did not intend to take the quest. They would just tantalize him. But as he pulled his gaze away, he suddenly turned it back again. One of the quests captured his attention. Deliver a parcel to Knight Captain Matthias. Isn't that the captain of? Jack grinned. Perhaps he could become a Viscount while not disrupting his current task after all. He proceeded to request for that quest. He was given a medium-sized package. When he tried to put it into his inventory, he was unable to. Perhaps this was like one of those trade items that Dylan mentioned could not be inserted into their storage bag. He took a rope and tied the parcel to his back. He then went out and hailed a carriage to take him to the city gate before summoning his steed and went off into the wilderness. He went to the area near the bandit outpost like yesterday and roamed around like yesterday, killing some monsters in the process. During his roaming, he found the night captain Matthias who were leading patrolling troops safeguarding the region around the capital. Such patrolling troops were the reason that not many high-level monsters were present in the vicinity of the city. After delivering the parcel, Jack continued his roaming until late afternoon before returning to the capital after sunset. He went back to Commander Quintus Tower at once to report the quest. He received 50 merit points as a standard reward, with a small sum of coins and experience. For completing the quest within the same day as when he received the quest, he was awarded additional 100 merit points. There was no minus point this time, luckily. The total points he received were 150 merit points. A small sum, but considering it was a simple delivery quest, such a number made sense. Of course, it was only simple because he had actually seen that night captain when he was roaming the area a day before. For anyone else, they might need to waste several days to find out about the captain's location. Not to mention due to the parcel could not be stored inside the storage bag there would be a risk of it getting damaged. The longer one holding onto it, the bigger such risk happening. Jack surmised that minus points would be awarded if the parcel was damaged or if he took too many days to deliver the parcel. 
Despite the small amount, the merit points awarded were just enough to elevate him into Viscount rank. He didn't get any perk for becoming a Viscount. However, he was now allowed to exchange his merit points. Perhaps this could be considered a perk as well. He asked for the exchange list. The officer showed the list but informed him that this was the list available to Viscount rank. As his rank increased, there would be more items added to the list. Jack thanked him as he started to review the exchange list. Standard training ground equals 20 merit slash 2 hours. Use bronze mining cave equals 20 merit slash 3 hours. Use training cave, level 1 to 20, equals 30 merit slash 5 hours. Use training cave, level 20 to 30, equals 50 merit slash 5 hours. It was a short list. So this was what they meant by the merit points were not to be exchanged for items. They were to be exchanged for the right to use kingdom-owned facilities. He had experienced the training ground. His points were better used in Commander Quintus' training ground in this regard. During his Kingdom Faction's initiation quest, he had gone into a mining quest with the cadets. Bailey had told him that he needed permission if he wanted to mine inside those caves. He guessed that permission was by using his merit points. As for the training caves, he had also gone to one with Lindsay when he was staying at Commander Quintus' residences. So he more or less was already familiar with the facilities provided in this exchange list. When you said you have a good place for me to gain EXP, did you mean this level 20 to 30 training cave? Jack asked Peniel who was floating by his side. Nope, Peniel replied. I suggest you don't use your merit points yet. You will need them later. Oh? I can use them for other things? Or do you mean when I become the next rank, Earl? Later, Peniel simply replied. Jack didn't push further. He gave his gratitude and left. He headed for his next destination. Time to ask Gruff for some compensation. Chapter 397, Monster Books what do you mean he is out? Jack asked. Which part of out don't you understand? Out is out. The man behind the receptionist counter uttered. Out my ass. You were still asking me what my business looking for him. Only when I mentioned my name that you said that he is out. He asked you to say that when it is me coming to look for him, didn't he? Kid, don't make me throw you out, the man behind the counter warned. Despite being a receptionist, the man was a level 40 elite human. Jack was in the League of Champions building, looking for Gruff. The receptionist that he was talking to was cordial until he mentioned his name. Looking at the situation, he had no doubt that Gruff fellow was avoiding him. Irresponsible old geezer, Jack cursed. Since he could not find that old F asterisker, he did not push the issue. He asked instead. Where can I submit a completed faction quest? The receptionist turned back to a warm and friendly personality with the biggest smile possible as he answered, You can submit a completed quest at the counter where you get your batch, honored member. A asterisk shoal. It was clear that this receptionist had been instructed by Gruff. Jack complained in his mind when he saw the change in the receptionist's treatment again. Jack went and reported the quest that was given by Gruff. He received a little EXP and coins and got 10 challenge points. He checked his League of Champions batch, it had 68 challenge points in them. The 58 points he had gotten out of performing the various tasks depicted on the steel that was shown by Gruff the last time he was here. Three weeks during the expedition had allowed him to net these points. With those points in hand, he went to the Colosseum-like circular courtyard with the panels of Roman numerals on its circular wall. Some natives were using those panels, same as he last visited. He observed them for a bit before going to the panel marked with a capital letter I, which was the lowest Roman numeral symbolizing number one. He stood in front of that panel and have his badge touched the large protruding number, imitating what the other natives did. He soon heard a notification asking him if he would like to take on the Stage 1 challenge. A holographic interface appeared in front of the protruding number. He clicked the Accept button on that holographic interface. 
As soon as the accept button was pressed, he felt himself getting sucked into the panel. He experienced similar things as when he went into a dungeon and soon came out into an empty space. The setup was awfully similar to the space where he had fought with Eldingar inside the dungeon of Temple of Divine Squall. Not long after, a level 10 Silver Wolf of basic grade materialized in front of him. Hey! The Silver Wolf lunged at him without any ceremony. Stormbreaker came out into Jack's hand as he used Flame Strike, killing the wolf with a single slash. Congratulations, you have passed stage 1. He soon found himself back again in front of panel number 1. It was as if he never left. Well, that was awfully easy, Jack thought. He then went to the next panel with two capital letters I, symbolizing the Roman numeral of 2. He did the same process and was sent to the same empty space again. The difference was, now there were two level 11 silver wolves. I see, so not only did the monster's level increase at higher stages, but their quantity was also added. He completed the second stage in an instant as well. He proceeded to the third stage without pause. And so he continued on in the same manner until he reached stage 11, where he fought 10 level 18 grey saber cats, 5 elite grades and 5 basic ones. The addition of level and quantity was not always fixed. The type of monster also changed after several stages, with the elite grade started to appear from stage 7. He imagined that the challenge would just get more difficult as he went to higher stages. One thing he found out when fighting in that space, he could not drink potions or use any tools. Apparently, one needed to rely on their own strength to pass these challenge tests. He wondered how high he could reach with his current strength. Even for high-level natives like Gruff, he was stuck at stage 79. Sadly, he could not find out at the moment, he had run out of challenge points. He only had two points left. He accumulated 66 glory points out of beating those 11 stages without failing. He went to the counter where he had been given the badge and asked if he could exchange those glory points. The staff on the counter showed him the list. Similar to Adventurers and Hunters Association, the list contained numerous items, weapons, armors, materials, and so on. There was no exclusive item list, but several ones were marked with the sign, Limit, 1. He deduced that it meant he could only exchange one time for those items. And almost all of these items marked by the Limit sign were monster books. Hey, where are the warrior skills I was promised? Jack complained. You are at the lowest rank, you think they will just give access to their special skills for any new recruit. Peniel said. But I remembered that Gruff said I can at least get basic or advanced skill at the lower rank. The lower rank he meant might not be the starter rank you have now. To him, the second rank is still considered low. Or he might just simply lie to you back then, like how he lied about that quest he gave you. That lying old geezer. Jack cursed. What stage do I have to beat to get to the next rank? Can you show him? Peniel said to the counter staff instead. The staff clicked on something and a display was shown. Principales equals beginning rank. Pilus equals beat stage 30. Centurion equals beat stage 50. Primus equals beat stage 60. Angusta Clavian equals beat stage 70. Prefectress equals beat stage 80. Lataclavian equals beat stage 90. Legatus equals beat stage 100. Stage 30, Jack mumbled and made some calculations. I will need at least 399 challenge points for that. That also considers if I beat all those challenges without failing once. Don't worry, you will accumulate them in time, Peniel encouraged. During the expedition, Mostly it was the soldiers who did the attacking and killing the monsters, that's why you didn't get as many points that last three weeks. You need to be the one doing the killing in order to get the points. The place where I will take you to accumulate EXP, you will do all the actions yourself, so you should be able to accumulate challenge points faster. Now, use your points to exchange for those monster books. Oh? Are they good? Jack asked. They will be in the long run, Peniel answered. But if I do that, 
when I rank up, I might not have enough points to exchange for new skills, Jack expressed his worry. These books do not lose to skills, just grab them already. Peniel insisted. Fine. Which ones should I get? Jack asked, deciding not to argue further. There were twelve of those books, marks with the names of undead, humanoid, reptile, draconic, beast, avian, insect, elemental, darkness, demon, magical, and outlaw. Each cost twenty glory points. So he could only get three books with his current available points. Take the humanoid, reptile, and beast first. You encountered them more for now. Jack processed the exchange. After he received them, he asked Peniel, So, are you going to tell me now what these books do exactly? It recorded all the monsters that you have killed in the wilderness. Try open one. Jack opened the beast book and saw the first page had an illustration of the silver wolf. There were texts below, illustrating the beast's strengths and weaknesses. The illustration suddenly moved, startling Jack. The wolf in the picture moved around as if it was attacking and avoiding an attack. You can read about any monsters of the type which you had killed before. When you kill a new monster of this book's type, it will appear on the next page. You can study the movement and attack patterns of the monster or read about its details in this book. You also receive a boost of 10% attack and defense when you are fighting a monster that has been recorded in the monster books that you owned. Ho, oh, they are indeed good stuff, Jack said. They are. Not all factions had them. League of Champions can be said as the one that can utilize these monster books to their fullest potential. Oh? How so? This faction had a special chamber that allowed you to fight the copy of any monster that was already recorded in this book, with a fee of course. Chapter 398, Order of Magi's Test Oh? What's good for me to fight a monster that I have already defeated before? Jack asked. If it is a common monster, of course, there is no point. But what if it is a rare monster that is difficult to find? And you happen to need a specific material that is only dropped by that exact rare monster? It will be a hassle to go around searching for that monster. But by using the monster chamber function in this guild, you can fight that monster unlimited times providing that you are willing to pay. Hence, Getting said rare materials will not be as difficult as gaining it via the normal means. I see, that was indeed good. Yes, go out there and record as many monsters as possible. And try to get all the rest of those monster books too. You said it like it is an easy task. I might need a long time to collect sufficient challenge points, Jack uttered. The next time you see Gruff, ask him to give you another quest that awarded more challenge points. Penile suggested. The next time I see him, I'm gonna give him a punch in the face first before anything, Jack remarked. Since he was done with that place, he left and decided to rest. Amy's bakery was not available for that night, so he went and rent a room in the inn. It was his first time sleeping in an inn. He thought it was not too shabby, not as good as his room in Amy's bakery but acceptable. Of course, there was a more expensive one available that provided a more spacious and luxurious room, but he saw no point in wasting the coins just for one night's sleep even if he had plenty of coins. The next morning before he went out again, he went to upgrade his equipment. He would be stuck in his current level for quite some time due to the lightning god blessing, so he decided to get into his top shape. As usual, he rented the blacksmith workshop with the rare tools. Before that, he purchased a large number of iron ores and steel ores. The inflation also affected these ores but not as much, iron ores now cost 40 copper while steel ore increased to 3 silver. Hence he purchased them in bulk. There were more stocks available now in the shops, probably because lots of players who did mining decided to sell their overstock ores to these shops. He worked in the blacksmith workshop and planned to upgrade all his equipment to level 38 since that was the maximum level he could equip in his current level of 28. As he continued to work, the probability dipped further down, causing him more failures with each upgrade. At level 34, 
if he did not use any buff from the workshop's rare tool or his runestone of probability, his success rate to upgrade the equipment was 0%, which meant no chance in hell he could upgrade any further. He was thankful now that his runestone of probability had increased to a rare grade. The workshop rare tool added a 30% success rate, while his rare grade runestone of probability added another 25% on average. Adding a total of 55%, he still failed one every two times with that kind of probability. And as the level increased more, the probability was lower. When he was at level 37 trying to upgrade to level 38, he only had an average of 35% success chance even with the two buffs. The material consumption also increased greatly as the equipment level increased. At level 35 above, he would need four iron ores, two steel ores, and one copper ore for one attempt. Combined with the multiple failures, his material consumption was significant. He ran out of the material halfway through his work and had to go out searching around the capital to buy more ores. His 21 copper ores in his storage bag were also insufficient. Luckily he already had the transformation prism which could fuse the ores into better grades, as copper ores were not available to buy. He bought iron ores and steel ores in bulk and then used the transformation prism to fuse several copper ores. Two good things happened though during the process. His blacksmith grade and runecraft grade increased, they were now advanced apprentice and intermediate apprentice respectively. The increase in his blacksmith grade naturally increased his success chance, while the increase in his rune crafting allowed better efficiency when he used his willpower on the rune stone. Normally even after concentrating all his will into the rune stone, the maximum added was roughly only 5%, with his rune crafting an intermediate apprentice, it now provided an extra 8-9% when he concentrated fully. There were two of his armors however that had a maximum of level 35, so he couldn't upgrade them any further. These two were the earliest rare armors he had acquired, Bloodguard Scale Armor and Shadow Bear Tacit. He would need to look for a replacement for these armors later. The rest and his magic staff were upgraded to level 38. He couldn't upgrade his Storm Breaker as he did not have a spare rare sword for consumption. He had consumed 374 iron ores, 138 steel ores, and 39 copper ores just for the upgrading process. If he added the amount he had used for creating the extra 18 copper ores, the number of spent iron ores and steel ores was even greater. He was a bit pessimistic about the future blacksmithing process for higher level equipment, the number of ores he needed would be astronomical. Luckily, he got a steady income of coins and also the transformation prism for support. At least his situation would be much better compared to the other players. He re-equipped all the upgraded armors. Both his physical and magical defense had increased by around 50% after the upgrade. He would be able to tank more damages. He then admired his magic staff. Rapid Dazing Staff, Level, 38 55ths, Super Rare Magic Weapon. Magical Damage, 267. Range, 15 meters. Attack Speed 1. Energy, 150. Intelligence plus 12. Standard attack has an 8% chance to cause confused status effect for 10 seconds, effect does not stack. Rapid attack, each standard attack shot out 3 projectiles, this ability can be turned on or off. This staff now had damage even surpassing his storm breaker. But considering this staff was a super rare grade, it did make sense. Its other abilities had also undergone increases after passing the level 30 threshold. He had spent almost the entire morning working for that upgrades. It was almost noon when he came out of the workshop. He had roughly checked out the things he needed to know in the last two days. But he still decided to go back out just to make sure that everything was as he had recorded. If something veered from what he had observed, tomorrow's operation might be a failure. He again spent the entire afternoon roaming around the area not far from the bandit outpost and only came back once the sun was set. After these three days of roaming, he had also completed all ten of his hunting quests. He submitted the completed quests and received some coins, EXP, 
and 194 hunter points. He sent a message to John and Jeannie, informing them that he was good to go for raiding the bandit outpost tomorrow. He informed them if they wanted to join, they could meet him at the city gate at noon. After sending the message, he just left one more thing to do in the capital. He went to the dilapidated hut he had visited before. He looked at the hut with amazement. Still as run down as the last time I was here. Such a pretentious bunch to use this kind of facade, he thought. He was about to open the door to the hut before he remembered something. He transformed into unrivaled arcaner then went inside. The same spacious, empty and clean space was displayed inside. Janice was still there sitting behind his desk. Jack walked over to him, with Peniel flying beside. Janice lifted his head and acknowledged him, Ah, Mr. Stormwind, good to see you again. I see that your fairy friend is no longer in hiding as well. It's good to meet you face to face, miss, he nodded at Peniel, who gave a symbolic curtsy in the air. Janice turned back to Jack, so, I imagine you have trained sufficiently to pass the test I gave you. That I have. Prepared to be impressed, Mr. Jack declared, still personifying that bombastic character of his disguise. He pointed his magic staff high. Runic lines starting to form rapidly. He had practiced till he could form Janus' five runes spell formation in around four seconds. Using multiple rune formations in two steps, three runes simultaneously in a bit over two seconds, and the remaining two runes simultaneously in almost two seconds. Considering he needed almost 15 minutes to form this spell formation when he first received it, this had been a large improvement. But such a speed was still far from the requirement to pass Janus' test. To rectify this, before he started casting, Jack used his Dragon's Eye active ability. It slowed down his surrounding by 500%, or in other words, his thought process was increased to five times the normal speed. The spell formation which under normal circumstances needed four seconds, now formed five times faster. The five runes were completed before one second. Jack looked at Janice with pride after he successfully did it. Janice returned his stare with a solemn expression. That was cheating, Janice said. Chapter 399, Mirror Factions F asterisk CK Jack cursed in his mind. Was this guy able to detect him using another ability to supplement his casting speed? Janice tapped his fingers on his desk repeatedly, while giving a contemplating expression. He then said, Well, I never did say you have to cast it normally, so you can say it was my own fault. Okay, I'll let it slide this time. You will. Considering we are old acquaintances, just consider it as me doing you a favor. Old acquaintance. We just met twice, pal. Jack uttered in his mind, but he was still grateful by this native's leniency. Janice stood up and gestured to him. Come, he said. Let's process you to join our order formally. Jack followed after him, a rectangular opening suddenly opened up on the wall. Jack could only see the void inside. Janice glanced at him and said, Don't change back into a warrior when you are inside. His figure then stepped and disappeared into the void. Mystical, Jack commented before following inside. He was expecting the same experience as when he entered a dungeon, but there was no interval in between he entering the opening to coming out the other side, he was already at a different place the moment he completed his step. He felt like he was in a city. Many crowds walking around strange-looking buildings. There was no ceiling above but there was also no sky. It was just infinite whiteness. Jack looked around in awe as he absorbed the view. It was like he was indoor but also outdoor at the same time. All the whiteness made him felt as if it was daytime again, while it was already night in the outside world. Was this whole place a separate dimension? He asked Peniel. It is a constructed dimension, it was Janice who answered. Please do not loiter, follow me. Jack followed the man while continued observing the surroundings. From their garbs, he guessed all the people walking around were magic users. There were even some people flying around in brooms, 
reminding him of that popular movie about school for wizards and witches. Is that broom riding a skill? Can I do that as well? Jack asked. Although in his opinion, riding on top of a broom was totally uncool, it would still be very convenient to be able to fly around, much more convenient than riding a mount. Not a skill, but you need to change to a certain class first in order to fly like that, it was again Janice who answered. Which elite class? Jack asked. Grand wizard if you are a man, master witch if you are a woman, Janice replied. Hey. Jack tried to remember something, he then turned to Peniel. Did you miss those two classes when you explained to me about the elite classes? I don't remember those two classes he mentioned. That's because they were not elite classes. They are special classes, Peniel explained. Special class? Wait, are you saying elite class is not the end? There is another class again after. Yes. However, not everyone will have a chance to get a special class. An elite class is the best standard class one can have. As long as one has enough capability, one can apply for elite class at the corresponding academy in any large city. So given time, everyone can be an elite class. But a special class is different, you can only encounter one by luck. In other words, if you are unlucky, you might not become a special class even if you are capable enough. Ah, I see. So, in other words, it is a hidden class, Jack uttered. What hidden class? I said special class. Why go and change the term as you like? Peniel said. Well, we outworlders usually called it hidden class, Jack explained. Well, you are not in your world. So, you call it by our name here. Special class. Hidden, special, it's just a name. I said special. Okay, okay. Special then. Why so riled up? Jack conceded. Peniel then added, also, you need to be an elite class first before you can have the chance to be a special class. Oh? Then that master wizard and master witch is a branch of an elite class. Yes, from the archmage class, Janice took the chance to answer. Are you interested to choose that elite class? I am still considering, Jack replied. You should, it is a good class. Is it? Every class is good, Peniel said. Sure, Janice replied, but his tone didn't signal his agreement. Jack noticed the fairy did not show her willful manner as usual with this guy. Considering this guy's bias, Jack surmised Janice was an archmage or a special class that branched from an archmage. Is there a level limit to become a special class? Jack asked. Or I will have the chance to get a special class once I become an elite class. You need to be level 50 to become one, Peniel answered. Wow, level 50. That was still a long way to go, Jack thought. Then to Peniel, he asked, you know everything, so you should know how to get this special class, right? Peniel rolled her eyes at him. I know all about the class, but I don't know how to get it. As I said, it is a fortunate encounter. It is totally random. If you are unlucky, you won't get the chance your entire life. It doesn't have anything to do with knowing or not knowing. Luck, consider that high luck stat of his, he should have no problem in this department then. He threw the special class matter out of his mind, it was still too long to consider. After a long walk, Janice finally stopped in a courtyard with a very large obelisk of black color. He was standing motionless in front of this obelisk. Jack was still wondering what he was doing standing still like that when the man turned around and asked him to stand beside him. Jack went over. He was about to ask what he should do when a voice entered his mind, stay still. Unrivaled Arcaner, male, age 23, mage, level 27. You are eligible to become a member of the Order of Magi. Do you wish to become one? He was unsure at first to answer using his thought or his mouth. In the end, he did both, I do. 
a blue light coalesced in front of him before solidified into a small blue flat object. Another batch, Jack thought as he accepted the object. Order of Magi Batch, Starter, Challenge Points, Zero, Knowledge Points, Zero. Challenge Points Why did it sound familiar? You can receive challenge points by performing the tasks written on this obelisk, Janice informed. Hearing his words, Jack looked at the obelisk. It had a clean black surface the last he saw, but now, glowing words were floating on its surface. Increase a level equals one challenge point. Level up skills from mage class and its branches five times equals one challenge point. Obtain one star for skills from mage class and its branches equals one challenge point. Defeat 100 elite monsters slash NPCs of the same level or above equals one challenge point. Defeat 10 special elite monsters slash NPCs of the same level or above equals one challenge point. Defeat one rare elite monsters slash NPCs of the same level or above equals one challenge point. Defeat one mythical monsters slash NPCs of the same level or above equals ten challenge points. Defeat one eternal monsters slash NPCs of the same level or above equals one hundred challenge points. Execute skills from mage class and its branches against hostile monsters slash NPC five hundred times equals one challenge point. Deliver a total of 10,000 points of damage to hostile monster slash NPC in a single combat equals one challenge point. This. He was speechless for a while before continuing, ain't this the same as the League of Champions? Only change the warrior into a mage. The last task was different, the League required one to receive damage, while this one required one to dish out damage. But it was still like a mirror from the other faction's tasks. You know the League of Champions? Janice asked. Stormwind is a member of the League of Champions, Jack told him. Ah, I see. Such a coincidence. You know, the founder of the League of Champions and Order of Magi were actually brothers. However, they took different paths. One became a mighty warrior while the other became a talented mage. When they decided to set up these two factions, they talked with each other and implemented the same system. You can consider the two as sibling factions. The difference was that one faction focused more on the physical classes while the other was magical. Interesting history. Now, I suppose once I got the challenge points, I used it to fight inside a separate arena to gain glory, oh, I mean, knowledge point. A rather hasty fellow, aren't you? Yes that pretty much covers the process. Chapter 400, Departing for the Bandit Outpost Where should I go to do those challenges? Jack asked. Right here, see all these smaller obelisks around. Janice replied. Now that he mentioned it, Jack realized there were lots of obelisks. Weird, before, this place was an empty field with only this large black obelisk. When did these other ones pop up? As if sensing his question, Janice said, You can only see those obelisks once you become a member of the Order. Like the Colosseum Courtyard in the League of Champions, these obelisks also sported numbers. Their numbers were high up on top floating above each obelisk. Jack could see number 1 till 100. Want to give it a try? Janice asked. Try? I do not have any challenge point yet, Jack replied. Here, I will give you some. Considered it an entrance gift. Jack checked his badge and found it to have ten challenge points. That was generous, Jack thought. That shitty gruff had to cheat him into performing a quest before he was awarded the same amount of challenge points. Come, Janice guided him to the obelisk marked with number one on its top. The process of activating the challenge was the same as in the League of Champions, the feeling when getting sucked into that separate dimension where the challenge took place was also the same. As he came out in that space, a level 10 basic goblin appeared. Oh, different monster, but same difficulty. Let's finish this by one hit as well, Jack thought as he summoned his storm breaker. However, his hand was empty. At. He tried again. Hey, 
why can't I summon my weapon? He asked. He looked around and realized he was alone with the goblin. He remembered now that when he entered the challenge of League of Champions, Peniel was also unavailable inside. The goblin was already coming at him while he was still confused. He ran away from the goblin to have some time to think. They are not asking him to fight using hands and feet, right? Oh, right. They are magic users. He then tried to summon his magic staff. This time it worked. The goblin had already arrived at him and jumped as it made its attack. Jack gave the small creature a kick. The poor critter tumbled back a distance away. Jack then shot a mana bullet. 1213 damage appeared as the spell disintegrated the goblin. Super rare staff truly is badass. Jack exclaimed. It was worth all the time and materials spent to upgrade its level. He whistled and twirled his staff in style before storing it back in his bag. He soon reappeared outside. That was slow, he heard Janice commented from behind him, ruining his current good mood. I would have expected you to finish this first stage with one hit. I did finish it in one hit. I just didn't expect that I can only use magic equipment here, Jack tried to defend himself. Not just magic equipment actually. You can only use magic spells as well, Janice said, and then added, ain't it the same with League of Champions? League of Champions. Jack was puzzled at first before he said, do you mean that I can only use physical skill and equipment in League of Champions challenges? Yet. Yeah. You haven't taken a challenge there yet. He had completed 11 stages actually, but because the monsters were too easy, he had never bothered to use his mage spell. He simply cut the monsters up with his martial arts and warrior skills. And here he thought the restriction was only for using tools, those challenges appeared much harder now. Want to continue? Janice asked. He still had nine challenge points left, so he decided to just use them all. He completed four stages in total, collecting ten knowledge points. In between the challenges, he asked Janice, by the way, why do you keep accompanying me? What if someone else comes to apply to join this order and found that no one is in that waiting room? He simply shrugged an answer, don't worry about it. Another me is on standby there already. Another you? Jack was confused but didn't pry further. It's not like he didn't enjoy such a VIP treatment anyway. This was completely different from the bureaucratic treatment he received in the League of Champions. He then asked to take a look at the exchange list. He knew his pitiful 10 points won't be sufficient to exchange for proper goods, but he was still interested in the list, just to get an idea of how many knowledge points he should aim for. The list was roughly the same as the ones in League of Champions, only that the items here were much more catered towards magic users' needs. Jack expected to see limited items like the monster books from the League of Champions list, but instead, he found items marked with monthly, and they were all recipes. Blacksmith recipe, blood-drenched axe, monthly, days left, three. Alchemist recipe, mind panacea, monthly, days left, three. Cooking recipe, Verimorian barbecue, monthly, days left, three. Scroll making recipe, eye of truth scroll, monthly, days left, three. Monthly. He turned to Janice. It means those items can only be exchangeable within this month, which left only three more days, Janice explained. Next month they will be replaced by different items. So if you missed this chance, you will have to wait until they appeared again some other month, or if ever. Jack looked at the list, all of these monthly recipes required 30 knowledge points to exchange for each. He only had 10 points on him. With only three days left, he had not much luck with these recipes. He closed the list. No new spell was available in this list, just like in the League of Champions. He asked Janice what challenge stage he needed to beat in order to get to the next rank, to which Janice replied by saying he had to beat stage 30 for that. Hearing that, he surmised then that the rank arrangement of this faction was also the same as for League of Champions. 
so the number of challenge points he needed to advance was roughly the same. After learning about the basic operation of this faction, Jack expressed his intention to leave. Janice told him that he only needed to say, Exit point reveals yourself in order to leave. He felt corny to have to say that. He would prefer open sesame or in this case, exit sesame, or something like that. Since there was no choice, he just had to oblige. Exit point reveals yourself. He yelled in an exaggerated manner while lifting his hand as if making an oration. When doing something, put all your heart into it, he said to himself. Janice and Peniel watched him with amusement. A rectangular opening abruptly appeared in front of him. It looked exactly like the same one that had taken him here, the opening showed the same void as before. Before stepping in, Jack turned back to Janice and said, Thank you for your time, I will be taking my leave now. To which Janice replied with a nod. He and Peniel went into the opening and find themselves in the large space of beige color inside the Order's hut. The opening shut behind him. He was just about to head to the door when he noticed that the desk in the middle of the space was not empty. Janice was sitting there smiling at him. Finish with your affair. He asked. I, didn't you, Jack was lost for words. Did you teleport here? He finally managed to ask. What do you mean? I have always been here. Jack turned to Peniel, who simply shrugged. He decided to just not think about this magic business, he said to this Janice, thank you for your time, I will be taking my leave now. And then realized, didn't he just said that to the other one before? This Janice also replied with the same nod. Jack ran out the door. Damn, this magic business is creepy. He said after he was outside from the hut and closed the door. I can still hear you. Janice's voice was heard from behind the door. On the next day, since he told John and Jeannie that he would depart at noon, his morning was free. He spent ten merit points to use Commander Quintus' training ground. His ice ring increased to the first star after the training. Its first star gave it an increase in radius of effect by half a meter, which meant an extra one meter in circumference, allowing him to hit more surrounding enemies. When the sun was high in the sky, he stood at the city gate waiting. John and Jeannie had expressed interest to join the raid. He saw the two of them coming not long after, with all the others in the guild trailing behind. Why do you all come? Jack asked. Bowler said, are you serious, bro? They said you will be going to fight a bandit outpost for our guild, which sounds dangerous. Do you think we will just stay behind? Well. I don't mind you all come, but you won't be doing any fighting, Jack told them.